that the, the people that get voted for the Board of Education are the ones who are responsible for the schools and that they try to do what they can. And uh, uh, those who are in charge of power and water, we're electing them again today. They get in, they better do what they can to make our power and water rates affordable. We checked out Jeff K. High, the home of the Islanders, where both candidates running to be the next governor of Guam cast in their ballots. Fantastic. I'm very, very happy. And um, just grateful, you know, to the good Lord for the journey that uh, he's taken me on together with Tony, of course, my wife, uh, Joanne and Annette, Tony's wife, and all the wonderful people that we've met um, throughout the campaign. So very happy. I just voted and I feel very uh, optimistic and I feel very confident and I feel very uh, satisfied that I've done my duty as a civic uh, citizen uh, for the people of Guam. Former Governor Felix Camacho, the challenger, and incumbent Governor Lou Leon Guerrero speaking to the media about the issues. We got to take it beyond just Guam. This is a, a regional and international problem for drugs. Is. So those involved in, in the drug trade right now, um, they're part of a large organization that is beyond the shores of Guam, and we're going to need federal assistance to tackle this. You can't be complaining if you're not there being part of the solution, and part of your solution is voicing your right to vote and select those candidates who you feel uh, will lead our island forward in the many challenges ahead of us. On the opposite end of the island, education, infrastructure, the military buildup, and more are just a few of the issues voters we spoke with at Ordan Chalampago share they want leaders to focus on. I'm making sure that, um, you know, the, the important things such as public safety, education, our hospitals, um, you know, are, are paramount and, you know, and that the uh, these candidates keep their promises, you know, with their platforms that they're going to make this a priority. Excited, kind of wondering where the future of Guam goes, but uh, very excited. And do you have anything you want to say to our candidates or any issues you want fixed? Yeah, I think both of them, are both parties, both uh, the governor and uh, Felix Camacho and uh, Lou Liangaro, both camps are passionate. They care about Guam. So I think uh, for me, there are certain things that, uh, that I would like to see. Uh, in our future and hopefully the best person wins. As you just saw, people are pretty vocal here in the central polling sites about the issues they want fixed here on Guam. In the meantime, we'll toss it over to you, Daniel, in the South. And good evening, everybody. I am Jason Salas here in the Harmon Studios. And if you didn't know, the polling sites closed about two hours prior and the ballot boxes should have arrived safe and sound over to Lexington Central at the UOG Calvo Fieldhouse in Mingila. And we go now to the home of the Tritons, where Nick Delgado is stationed there, as he will be all evening reporting on the tallying of the votes until the last ballot is counted. Nick, what can you tell us about the tempo so far at Election Central? Who will lead Guam after the new year next year? That all will be decided, and the votes will hear the numbers coming from here at the Guam Election Commission Election Return Center at the University of Guam Calvo Fieldhouse. Here in Manila, behind me, you don't see the Guam Election Commission at their table here. They recessed just moments ago before coming onto the air here behind me. But a more active scene happening at the tabulation machines, tabulations one, two, and three. Their names, Kin, Flynn, and Taha, now commissioners over there after recessing from a quick meeting to find out how today's voting went. Now zeroing out the tabulation machines, all three of them, getting them prepared and ready for those ballots, for your votes that you cast today and in the early voting in the past month, to be run through those machines. And each of them, as you see there, throughout the night for the next several hours, we'll see each of your votes being run through there. As we get those numbers, we'll have you, of course, bring it to you. Uh, and that's what it looks like here. And we're waiting also for more buses to bring uh, more of those ballot boxes as well from the po the polling sites, but uh, we'll keep you posted from here. All right, thanks so much, Nick. Reporting for Election Central, of course, we will be going to Nick throughout this evening and into uh, tomorrow morning, hopefully not too long, as Nick reports on the GEC, the various piece, uh, precinct registrars and how they are tabulating up all the votes. So expect a lot of uh, high velocity reports from Nick. Now we continue with our wrap up of what happened today with the Decision 22 general election. Thanks, Mitsuki. 
The southern part of Guam is no exception. One after another, voters are seen entering and leaving the polling site. We caught up with voters in Jotnia Rules, each sounding off on issues they want addressed by those running for office, like retired teacher Paz Padua. I know what is happening in the classroom, so we really need more materials and more uh, support for the teachers. Now they gave them the race, right? But we get, we need to support them, you know, construction of more classrooms. She knows it's been years since our island's public schools received any type of renovation. For Jotno voter Frank Ishizaki, a key topic he wants to address is the lack of community safety. Crime is high, drug abuse is very, very high, and uh, the economy sucks, so we got to do better. For crime and drugs, I think we've got to rethink how to do crime and drugs. And we, I think there's some things we need to do. Even the prison, recidivism is very high. We've got to find different ways to deal with convicts. And I, I'm, I'm into community corrections. I want more prisoners going home. I'm hiring more parole officers, more probation officers. And if they can't comply, then we lock them up. We saw a similar scene around the south, including over in Hoggett. Now let's toss it up to the Northern Marianas, where our regional correspondent, Tomas Maglonia, is checking in with voters there. Thank you, Daniel. Yes, it's been a super week of voting as early voting wrapped up yesterday. And today, NMI voters heading to the polls from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. A registered 19,000 voters making it a historic election. Because uh, people need to hear what they can do for us. A record number of registered voters making their voices heard. I need to exercise my vote and we need change. Dozens of supporters crowding the entrances to polling places across Saipan in a final push for their party slate. Voters telling KUAM the process was smooth this morning. It's always important to give your vote because if you have something that you want to fix in the community or you need help, that's why we vote them in so they can, they're there to help us. A third of registered voters cast their ballots in the past week. Voter turnout could reach a record high as well. A three-way gubernatorial race in their party slate, energizing voters across the NMI. I'm sick and tired of this corruption here on Saipan. It's very embarrassing for our commonwealth here. Voters marking their ballots with pride and passion for their candidates who they want to see sit in office next year. Tomas Manglonia for KUAM News, reporting on Saipan. And election experts think this year's midterm will set voter turnout records. What's driving the surge? Concerns over inflation and crime top the list for Republicans. For Democrats, restoring abortion rights may have lost its motivational punch. Christian Benavides talked to voters and breaks it down. When Tony Bergida, the chair of the Kansas Young Republicans, cast an early vote, he had one issue top of mind. Over the last two years, the, uh, our grocery bill has risen from $400 a month to uh, about $1,200 right now. Crime is another pressing issue for many Republicans. Peter Eith travels the country selling security systems. I do see a lot of crime increase since COVID, I feel like. People are just living in fear. People are scared. Republican leaders predict concerns over crime and inflation will lead to a massive red wave on Election Day. And while the economy is also a concern for Democrats, Atlanta resident Cynthia Jones says the reversal of Roe v. Wade is her main reason for voting. Before then, you had to go to back alleys. But Democrats fear fewer voters are focused on abortion rights, so their messaging is pivoting to Republican threats of dismantling Social Security and Medicare. For Portland student Brian Montes, he feels after the January 6th attack, democracy's on the ballot. We can't really fix climate change. We can't help the health care system. We can't bring relief to students across this country until we have faith in our democracy. Election experts say that when all the votes are counted, the most important issue will be buy-in from voters. For democracy to work, there has to be trust that election systems can produce accurate and honest outcomes. CBS News Elections and Surveys Director Anthony Salvanto says voters should expect election certification delays because vote counting takes time. Going slow doesn't mean it's wrong or doesn't yeah. mean there's any problems. Yeah. It's just patience. There could be many races that could take days to finalize. Cristian Benavides, CBS News, Tampa, Florida. And for your up-to-date national election night coverage, make sure to tune in 
to NBC TV 8 beginning at 11 in the morning on Wednesday for the very latest. Well, we have more local news to bring you in a moment. Keep it here. You're watching KUAM. Half a day. I'm Eddie Calvo, and I've had the good fortune of knowing and working with attorney Tom Fisher for several years. Tom is a highly intelligent man who knows the law, and he's very serious and mission driven. And he's focused on getting things done right, and he doesn't waste time. Smart, determined and efficient, and that's exactly what we need in the legislature. Please vote for Thomas Fisher for Senator. I'm Tom Fisher, and I approve this message. <laughs> All new Hyundai Tucson. This is a brand new thing. I want my streaming. I want my TV. Ooh, oh. streaming TV. Switch between live TV and your favorite streaming apps with DTV Plus from Docomo Pacific. Watch your shows and multiple devices all at the same time, all from your home Wi-Fi. No cable lines, no hassle, or savings for only $35 a month with your link bundle. DTV Plus, your cable TV on Wi-Fi. Ooh, streaming TV. My name is Lisa Tahaji. I'm from the village of Umatic. I lost my job during COVID. For one year, I was staying with a family member but I knew I had to find a place to stay. I was desperately looking for a home. I found out about the Relief Center from the Governor Lou and Lieutenant Governor Josh's Facebook page. I wasn't sure if they could help, but I thought I'd take a chance. I walked into the center and the staff were so understanding and compassionate, they helped me. Within a week, through their assistance, I was called to sign a lease agreement. My kids and I now have a roof over our heads and I'm grateful for the help of the administration and the Relief Center. For anyone who needs any government assistance, I encourage you to visit the Relief Center. They are there to help. Half a day, this is Amanda Shelton. It is an honor to serve you in the legislature. Since 2019, we've worked together on issues great and small to make our island more livable, more sustainable, and to facilitate opportunities for all. And in 2022, your vote matters more than ever. I urge you to vote on November 8th, and I humbly ask for the honor of one of your votes this election. Sidious Maasi. Paid for by the committee to elect Amanda Shelton, number six Democrat, Johnny Cool Torres Trey. What you need to know from the Northern Marianas. Follow KUAM Cinemai on Instagram for the latest regional headlines. Welcome back. Well, it's on your residence. We're on high alert after uh, this morning package containing an unknown white powdery substance was brought to the village fire station out of caution. Guam Fire Department spokesperson Nick Dorito says the package was picked up at the Guam main facility and brought to the station at 8 this morning. The package was secured while GFD Hazmat and Guam National Guard civil support team investigated. Turns out it was baking soda. A similar incident happened at Barragata Post Office last week. The all clear was given just after 12 this afternoon. And from knowing each other's operating capabilities to refining tactics when it comes to crisis response, Joe Nugan Charfers has more from Camp Laws, where recent training was held for federal and local fire departments. A vacant housing area in Marine Corps Camp Laws is where several firefighters from local and federal fire departments took part in training that focused on truck company operations and supporting functions. This type of training allows firefighters to work together and refine tactics, ultimately increasing their crisis response capabilities as emergency responders. Chris Connolly is a joint region Marianas fire chief. And really that's kind of the nexus of why we're here today is that we know each other's operating uh, capabilities. Training is paramount and we just need to keep doing reps as we call it uh, in training regardless of how many calls we, we run we still have to do the training reps. Four modules were set up throughout the area allowing firefighters to hone their skills in a controlled environment with the latest concepts. Guam Fire Department Battalion Chief and Training Operations Chief Dean Ugin. Utilizing 
uh, deploying uh, ground ladders. The next module is uh, the aerial ladder, uh, finding, locating, extricating uh, victims from an elevated platform. Uh, the third module will be forcible entry, conducting primary, secondary uh, search and rescue. And the final uh, module is vehicle uh, extrication. And overseeing the vehicle extrication was Sunny Kitutu, a firefighter and paramedic with Naval Base Guam. The main object here is to get, have tool familiarization so we can practice using our um, the tools we have on our apparatus to uh, uh, extricate a patient from a vehicle, stabilize the vehicle so that we're able to provide that solid patient care and uh, stay safe at the same time. For senior airman Jack Warner from Anderson Fire and Emergency Services, taking part in the tactical ground ladders module allowed him to see the lifting techniques from other fire departments and how they communicate. Everyone at Anderson loves to train. Uh, we love getting out here, meeting everyone, meeting new people, uh, networking. Uh, we really love coming out here and doing what we do best. This joint training event is just one of many set to take place. Jonagan Charfris, KUM News. Well, now for a look at your world at home. Here's a view captured today from our cameraman, Carlito Rezanski. He couldn't help himself but go down south today to capture this iconic heart display in Malesu, looking out into Coco's Lagoon. The beautiful sunny day down south is Super Tuesday. The Guam National Weather Service predicting Wednesday will be mostly cloudy with 20 to 50 percent chance of rain. My name is Lisa Tahaji. I'm from the village of Yamatic. I lost my job during COVID. For one year, I was staying with a family member, but I knew I had to find a place to stay. I was desperately looking for a home. I found out about the Relief Center from the Governor Lou and Lieutenant Governor Josh's Facebook page. I wasn't sure if they could help, but I thought I'd take a chance. I walked into the center and the staff were so understanding and compassionate, they helped me. Within a week, through their assistance, I was called to sign a lease agreement. My kids and I now have a roof over our heads, and I'm grateful for the help of the administration and the Relief Center. For anyone who needs any government assistance, I encourage you to visit the Relief Center. They are there to help. Introducing the new Choice Bundles from GTA. Choose from the services you want and save big when you bundle. Fast internet speeds, unlimited mobile data, digital TV that you can stream anywhere, and digital home phone for Guam's most reliable network. The more you choose, the more you save. Over $1,000 a year. And for a limited time, bundle internet 75 or higher and get a $100 account credit. Visit GTA.net and use our bundle calculator to see how much you can save. GTA, we start with you. Enjoy the deliciously saucy McRib. Only for a limited time and only at McDonald's. The legendary McRib is back. Pair it with fries and a drink for a limited time. My name is Lisa Tahaji. I'm from the village of Yamatic. I lost my job during COVID. For one year, I was staying with a family member. But I knew I had to find a place to stay. I was desperately looking for a home. I found out about the Relief Center from the Governor Lou and Lieutenant Governor Josh's Facebook page. I wasn't sure if they could help, but I thought I'd take a chance. I walked into the center and the staff were so understanding and compassionate, they helped me. Within a week, through their assistance, I was called to sign a lease agreement. My kids and I now have a roof over our heads, and I'm grateful for the help of the administration and the Relief Center. For anyone who needs any government assistance, I encourage you to visit the Relief Center. They are there to help. KUAM Sports is brought to you by Docomo Pacific. Better together. What's up, Guam? Dave Delgado here for KUAM Sports. Thanks for watching on the show tonight. Girls High School Basketball. The JFK Islanders travel to Jigo to face the Simon Sanchez Sharks. Check it out. 
Sanchez playing host to the Islanders in the East of Girls Basketball League. The Sharks came out knocking down some shots. Zyla Soriano hit four from the outside. She was the only player for the home team who hit a three-point shot. Ronafe Olette comes up with the loose ball and starts making her way down court. Olette with the layup. Sharks grab the early lead. Olette working on the defender. No-look pass to Soriano in the corner. Bang, bang. All net from long range. Jada Hahn with the heads up play on defense. Hahn with the steal going glass for the finish. Off the inbound, Ronafe finds Kana Kanemoto open after setting a screen. Kanemoto with the easy bucket baseline. She finished the game with seven points. Olette dropping dimes. Assist here to Brittany Gatme for the short range shot. Sanchez lighting up the scoreboard. Francesca Aguilar put up 10 points. In the first half is JFK trailed 27 to 20. JFK's Layla Smart with the pull up three. Swing up! Aguilar was whipping it up. Nice pass to Jody Halili who finishes it off with the short shot off the backboard. Olette returns the favor at the opposite end of the court. Nice dish to Paula Mikado for two points. The Islanders turn it up in the second half. Layla Smart to Halili. Back to Aguilar for the score. JFK with the win 61 to 44. Jada Han and Layla Smart both finished the game with 18. Jody Halili put up 11. Francesca Aguilar added 10. KUAM Sports is brought to you by Docomo Pacific. Better together. My name is Leonza Selvage and I have a four-year-old daughter who goes to lots of learning daycare. So with the rising cost of living, it helps tremendously with bills. I don't have to worry about paying for childcare services. Knowing that this program is offered to our people, most especially our children, I think something to definitely be grateful for. I learned about programming Panilin from the mayor's offices here. And uh, my initial reaction to the program, I was actually in disbelief that this program offered free childcare services to our people. I wanted to give my mom a break for a little bit. So when I found out about the program, I jumped right on it. I was relieved because childcare at no cost. I'm thankful for this program because I don't have to worry about an extra set of bills coming my way. I'm grateful to the governor, the lieutenant governor, everyone behind the scenes that made this happen. Need help paying for childcare? Guam families can receive financial support through Programan Pinilan. Learn more and apply at guamchildcare.com. Calvo Select Care's comprehensive medical provider network offers our members choice and access to quality facilities locally in Asia, Hawaii, and the continental United States. We provide our members several wellness programs and healthy options to improve their overall health status. Calvo Select Care, healthcare that's always there for you. Contact us today for more information. Howdy folks, nobody loves a Guam potluck more than I do. That's why I always bring my world famous chicken served any way you like it. Original recipe, extra crispy tenders, Kentucky Fried Wings and more. Hmm, all right. And nothing completes a meal like KFC's signature sides. Hot mashed potatoes with gravy, coleslaw, and a flaky biscuit. The world's favorite chicken, right here on the island, and only at KFC Guam. Whoops! Well, it is finger looking good. My name is Lisa Tahaji. I'm from the village of Umatic. I lost my job during COVID. For one year, I was staying with a family member. But I knew I had to find a place to stay. I was desperately looking for a home. I found out about the Relief Center from the Governor Lou and Lieutenant Governor Josh's Facebook page. I wasn't sure if they could help, but I thought I'd take a chance. I walked into the center and the staff were so understanding and compassionate, they helped me. Within a week, through their assistance, I was called to sign a lease agreement. My kids and I now have a roof over our heads, and I'm grateful for the help of the administration and the Relief Center. For anyone who needs any government assistance, I encourage you to visit the Relief Center. They are there to help. Finally tonight, your Cold Stone Creamery Birthday Club shoutouts you submitted on KUAM.com. First.
on Guam. KUAM News, winner of the 2022 Regional Edward R. Murrow Award for Excellence in Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the Culture Club. state of emergency that needs to be declared. It is with the Guam Police Department and it is with public safety to fight crimes, to fight drugs. The way to secure the safety of our people is to put more police officers on the ground. He wants you to forget that he lost half of his staff, so much so that they were dismissing cases. The last four years of this Attorney General's policies have not worked. If you don't want a repeat of this, then don't, don't. Uh, vote, believe it or don't. I can take all the criticism, but when I wake up, I want to be up there. There is a crisis of confidence in our government today. And it's important to have a government that reflects the diversity of, of the community. A rather rare sight of tonight's total lunar eclipse, the blood moon showing up in our skies every so often. Here's a view captured at the height of it in the, in the last hour. The occasional moment comes as we now focus on a race that comes every four years, the decision to pick our leaders. Half a day and good evening and welcome to KWM News live coverage of the 2022 general election. Can you feel it everybody? Throughout the night and until the last vote is tabulated, we will find out who the winners will be in the gubernatorial race, who will take seats in the 37th Guam legislature, who will be Guam's attorney general, as well as the island's next congressional delegate, and the spots on the Guam Education Board and the Consolidated Commission on Utilities. We will have wall-to-wall -wall coverage and we'll be covering the gubernatorial mayors of each island, Attorney General, Senate, House of Representatives, and Municipal Council of the CNMI. Our all-star team here at KAOAM will be providing live coverage all night over at Election Central at the UOG Calvo Field House is our veteran newsman, Nick Nelgado, our, our Hannah Devonzo and Matsuki Hirayama are over in Haganya at the Leon Guerrero Tenorio headquarters. Down the street, uh, not too far away, is our Daniel Perez at the Camacho Ad headquarters. And holding it down in the CNMI is our regional correspondent, Tomas Manglonia. That is our all-star team for tonight, wall-to-wall -to -wall coverage, ladies and gentlemen. We have also assembled a diverse group of analysts to give you their takes on how the results and outcome, including decision 2022 general election night political analysis, Ginger Cruz, Lou and Josh campaign advisor, Simon Sanchez, former Republican Senator, Sean Gumatato, Senior Advisor for the Camacho Ada Campaign, Juan Carlos Benitez, the Guam Republican Party Chairman, and Dr. Robert Underwood, former Demo Democrat Congressional Delegate, and Tony Babanta, the Guam Democratic Party Chairman. Also, Regine Bisco Lee, a former Democrat Senator, Dr. Ron McNinch, a U University of Guam professor, who will also be with us all night to show uh, the young, uh, also us later, the show will be in the young adults, Nicole Leon Guerrero and Mateo Mortera from Generation of Promise, and Lawrence J. Alcairo, Chair for Our Generation, and Al Edric Labang, Chair for Young Democrats of Guam. All of that, all of that tonight, so please stay with us throughout the night. We'll have wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Decision 2022 started at 7 o'clock this morning, and our team of reporters going went, went from top to bottom of the island and even up in the CNMI to bring you a look at what drew vo voters out this Super Tuesday. We begin with a look at the largest voting district in Guam, the North, where our Hannah Devonzo leads us off. The time has come for the voters to decide who they want as our next elected officials. I'm visiting a few of the northern polling sites where there's the largest amount of registered voters. Voters in Digo and Dededo at the ready. I decided to vote because I want good leaders. Here at FB Leon Guerrero Middle School, Jenalyn Abinales is a mother who shares why her vote matters. I want good leaders in 
there to really help us grow the economy and also be able to um, fight for our women's rights because I do have two daughters as well um, with everything that's been going on with Roe versus Wade but as well as um, supporting a more healthy economy so if we have the right leaders in office the better for us to grow and not stay stagnant especially with the pandemic where um, we were stagnant for so long where uh, we see that the tourism industry hasn't um, helped us as much as we wanted to where we thought it would be, but now we have to look for something that's different. Um, we can't do the same things we did before. Each one walking in and out with ease, deciding who will lead Guam. Just to try to make a difference. Anything, yeah. what qualities are you looking for in your next elected officials? Nothing last year. Hi, why did you decide to come and vote? I just want to. I need to vote, making sure our voices get heard. Yeah, what issues would you like to see politicians address? Gosh, uh, education more. They're promising the new hospital, maybe, and better um, school, um, like the Sanchez and uh, the rest. This wouldn't do the job, this all. Any issues you see in the community you'd like addressed? Nothing that I can do about anything about, but... Oh no, I will say one thing, all these dogs, that's all I'm going to say. All these dogs, get rid of them. And outside of the voting sites, supporters for the gubernatorial teams rally for All In and a new season. Well, they're the best choice for this election and they have a plan that they've achieved and they have a plan moving forward. And so we have a very prosperous, promising, encouraging four years to look forward to. And they're the best choice on the ballot for governor and lieutenant governor. Because they're very good people and they're honest. And that's what I like about them. So please come out and vote. Please vote Camacho Ada. Tonight we'll find out who the voters elected into office. In the meantime, we'll toss it over to Matsuki Hirayama, who's visiting the central polling sites. Thanks, Anna. I'm here at the central polling sites to speak with the people of Guam as they cast their ballots this general election. Let's take a look on how they're feeling this morning. The central part of the island brought a flurry of voters out this election day. I'm a, a long resident of Guam and I still see the same thing for the last eight years when I didn't vote the last time. So I voted today because it's our right, a privilege for us, but I really look forward to seeing some sort of changes because eight years to me has not much. We need to make sure that you know, the people that get voted for the Board of Education are the ones who are responsible for the schools and that they try to do what they can. and. Uh, uh, those who are in charge of power and water, we're electing them again today. They get in, they better do what they can to make our power and water rates affordable. We checked out Jeff K. High, the home of the Islanders, where both candidates running to be the next governor of Guam cast in their ballots. Fantastic. I'm very, very happy. And um, just grateful, you know, to the good Lord for the journey that uh, he's taken me on together with Tony, of course, my wife, uh, Joanne and Annette, Tony's wife, and all the wonderful people that we've met um, throughout the campaign. So, very happy. I just voted and I feel very uh, optimistic and I feel very confident and I feel very uh, satisfied that I've done my duty as a civic uh, citizen uh, for the people of Guam. Former Governor Felix Camacho, the challenger, and incumbent Governor Lou Leon Guerrero speaking to the media about the issues. We got to take it beyond just Guam. This is a, a regional and international problem for drugs. Is. So those involved in, in the drug trade right now, um, they're part of a large organization that is beyond the shores of Guam, and we're going to need federal assistance to tackle this. You can't be complaining if you're not there being part of the solution, and part of your solution is voicing your right to vote and select those candidates who you feel uh, will lead our island forward in the many challenges ahead of us. On the opposite end of the island, Education, infrastructure, the military buildup, and more are just a few of the issues voters we spoke with at Warden Chalim Pago share they want leaders to focus on. I'm making sure that, um, you know, the, the important things such as public safety, education, our hospitals, um, you know, are, are paramount and, you know, and that the, uh, these candidates keep their promises, you know, with their platforms that they're going to make this a priority. Excited. Yeah. Can, um, 
wondering where the future of Guam goes, but uh, very excited. And do you have anything you want to say to our candidates or any issues you want fixed? Yeah, I think both of them, uh, both parties, both uh, the governor and uh, Felix Camacho and uh, Luli Angaro, both camps are passionate. They care about Guam. So I think uh, for me, there are certain things that, uh, that I would like to see. Uh, in our future and hopefully the best person wins. As you just saw, people are pretty vocal here in the central polling sites about the issues they want fixed here on Guam. In the meantime, we'll toss it over to you, Daniel, in the south. Thanks, Mitsuki. The southern part of Guam is no exception. One after another, voters are seen entering and leaving the polling site. We caught up with voters in Jutnya rules, each sounding off on issues they want addressed by those running for office, like retired teacher Paz Padua. I know what is happening in the classroom, so we really need more materials and more uh, support for the teachers. Now they gave them the race, right? But we, get, we need to support them, you know, construction of more classrooms. She knows it's been years since our island's public schools received any type of renovation. For Jotno voter Frank Ishizaki, a key topic he wants to address is the lack of community safety. Crime is high, drug abuse is very, very high, and uh, the economy sucks, so we've got to do better. For crime and drugs, I think we've got to rethink how to do crime and drugs, and we, I, I think there's some things we need to do. Even the prison, recidivism is very high, we've got to find different ways to deal with convicts, and I, I'm, I'm into community corrections. I want more prisoners going home, I'm hiring more parole officers and more probation officers, and if they can't comply, then we lock them up. We saw a similar scene around the south, including over in Hoggett. Now let's toss it up to the Northern Marianas, where our regional correspondent, Tomas Maglonia, is checking in with voters there. Thank you, Daniel. Yes, it's been a super week of voting as early voting wrapped up yesterday. And today, NMI voters heading to the polls from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. A registered 19,000 voters making it a historic election. Because uh, people need to hear what they can do for us. A record number of registered voters making their voices heard. I need to exercise my vote and we need change. Dozens of supporters crowding the entrances to polling places across Saipan in a final push for their party slate. Voters telling KUAM the process was smooth this morning. It's always important to give your vote because if you have something that you want to fix in the community or you need help, that's why we vote them in so they can, they're there to help us. A third of registered voters cast their ballots in the past week. Voter turnout could reach a record high as well. A three-way gubernatorial race in their party slate, energizing voters across the NMI. I'm sick and tired of this corruption here on Saipan. It's very embarrassing for our commonwealth here. Voters marking their ballots with pride and passion for their candidates who they want to see sit in office next year. Tomas Manglonia for KUAM News reporting on Saipan. And with that, it's sure to be a long night, too, for the CNMI. And now joining us from Election Central over there is our Tomas Mangalonia. Tomas? Yes, Nestor, it's uh, been a long day. It's been a long week of early voting, and we finally made it here. Uh, polls closed just over three hours ago, and we're at the multi-purpose center in Susupi, where ballots were just being sorted out. And uh, we're waiting for the first update. The link to the election results is up but is blank uh, with a message they're saying that we're gonna have to wait a little longer to hear uh, from about the numbers uh, tonight everyone uh, having two major questions in mind perhaps the first being what will the voter turnout be given that the uh, early voting garnered over a third of registered voters again a historic number 19,275 and also will there be a runoff will one of the gubernatorial teams be able to capture more than 50 percent of the vote but before we get to the numbers uh, we do have uh, as is a custom here uh, on election night uh, an observer um, sir can you just introduce yourself to the public watching my name is James Adon Ada I'm the observer for the go to real governor tours right. and being so long all right, and so can you just tell us uh, what has been uh, your observation, not just tonight, but throughout the past week of early voting? Well, the, the early voting was a success. We've got a lot of older voters that are coming in, and this election is, it, this election is a well-rounded by the Republican Party, and we're behind the governor, 
and the government and no other way of party. All right, and, and indication of the early votes and uh, the uh, record number of registered voters, do you think that translates to Republican votes? I believe so because uh, we went out for the last uh, 15 months. All right, and is there, there, uh, what, uh, will you be here uh, all night and uh, what is I'm your role? I'm here to observe this election. I'm going to translate all, uh, transfer all the votes to our Republican and we're going to win this election. Right. And uh, do you have any uh, message? Uh, the polls have closed. Uh, now it's a waiting game. Uh, many people are talking about the possibility Shout, of them. Shouts out to my team. Shouts out to my team, to my poll workers. Shouts out to everybody that came along in this for the last 15 months. Biba Republican Party. Biba Tursun. Biba Republican Party. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Chairman. And uh, there you heard it, of course. Uh, we brought you a range of perspectives today from uh, the various precincts we visited, people marking their ballot with both pride and passion tonight. Uh, definitely, um, we're going to keep an eye on the numbers, uh, Nestor and Jason, and uh, we'll have more live reports uh, after this. We're going to be leaving Election Central and heading out to the Republican camp, the Democratic camp, and the Independent Palacios Apatang camp. And I uh, hear directly from the candidates. Uh, there are about 99 candidates running in this election and we want to be sure to also bring you some of their perspectives tonight as uh, they are waiting, anxiously waiting, one, one might assume, uh, for the results to come out just as we are. So uh, for now, I'm Tomas Munglan, you're reporting on Saipan and we'll see you throughout the night. Great. Uh, one quick question, Tomas, give us a sense of what the, the mood is there. Is it, it pretty festive? Is it pretty excited? Yes, it was very festive. If you got a chance to look at our hotspot update uh, that we did at 11 a.m., uh, we saw motorcycle clubs going through, revving their engines, barbecue pits, uh, in, in, you know, up in smoke, uh, people uh, blasting music. Uh, it seemed as though at one point uh, at one of the uh, camps uh, that they were competing against each other and who can play the loudest music. Um, people are out and energized and electrified for this election. Again, uh, we could be here uh, in two weeks once again. Uh, depending on how the gubernatorial race goes. Uh, if uh, our viewers in the region have been following us, uh, we know that it is a three-way gubernatorial race between Governor uh, Ralph Torres and Senator Vinny Sablon under the Republican ticket, Democrats from the House of Representatives, Tina Sablon and Leila Staffler, and Independence Lieutenant Governor uh, Arnold Palacios and David Apatang. And so uh, we're going to bring you uh, the big races. We're following, of course, also the AG race. Uh, Edward Manabusan is being challenged by former Judge Juan Lazama, who he served on the bench with. Uh, there were also three, uh, one justice and uh, two judges up for retention. And uh, of course, Congressman Kalili is running unopposed. Um, all of these races are important. Uh, we'll continue to bring you the updates. Right now, we've just seen that a uh, uh, majority of the poll workers have exited the multi-purpose building, which is an indicator that things are moving forward. So uh, we'll be going to the camps next, and we look forward to bringing you their perspectives late into this night. All right, our regional correspondent, Tomas Manglonia, reporting live from Saipan. One man wrecking crew over there. Thanks a lot, uh, Tomas. We'll be checking with you regularly back and forth throughout the night. All right, earlier we released exit poll results, joining us to further discuss how poll the poll was conducted and what it possibly means is with our Jason Salas and political analyst, Dr. Ron McNinch. Jason. All right, thanks so much, Nat. Nat, I was hoping for like one-man wrecking crew introduction, but you know, maybe, maybe as the night goes on. But uh, Ron McNinch, you know, uh, UOG political science professor, and uh, you know, these exit polls now have been, you know, uh, a statistical uh, point of interest in the past, and then they became, you know, um, something that was very strategic and tactical for the candidates, and now they've become, I would say, a critical institution of the full election process as a snapshot of the results that we are going to see as the night goes on. And when you released those results, they came out at 8 p.m. just as the polls were closing. Um, I would say some people had like jaws on the floor at the at not not just the way that the, specifically the gubernatorial race turned out, but the margin of victory that your poll again 500 people and change. Um, is expected to have with the Lou and Josh campaign about a two-thirds margin over um, Felix Camacho and Tony Atta. Right. If, if the numbers do hold out, and, and I have a feeling they, they may very well hold out, uh, this particular race is going to look a lot like the 2014 Guam race where uh, Governor Calvo, who was also the incumbent, had similar numbers. Mm. Uh, in, in similar outcomes. Mm. And so I think that uh, in, in general, uh, this was just a, a a very long election season, I think, because in part because of COVID. And I think that a lot of people probably voted today. And so I think we're going to see a lot of neat 
neat results come out of this election. Mm -hmm. Now, does this speak to to the power of incumbency? Because another race that you actually profiled was the attorney general's race. And, and, and to be sure, there's a plus minus 2% um, margin of error for this. And even though uh, the AG's race had leaving Camacho slightly above Doug Moylan, those margins could easily easily flip because again you you did your poll as of as of when you guys um, stopped right. collecting polls it, around 4 p.m. No, that's a great point. So most of the data collection for the exit poll that the students did uh, ended by three o'clock, mm -hmm. and so people who voted after three o'clock we didn't capture them. And, and with those kinds of differences for the Congress and for the AG's race, there can be more wobble, mm -hmm. and we need to watch out for that. And uh, my teaching assistant Eliza Chargaloff did most of the coordination. She did all the hard work. Uh, for collecting the data and uh, working with the students to collect the data. But in general, exit polls are pretty reliable methods. Uh, they're not a probability method, meaning we don't, we, you can't estimate like the, the plus and minus very well on a, on a exit poll because you never know who's gonna participate and, and we can only control for, and we did control for uh, uh, sex and age. So mm -hmm. we, we, only, we, we surveyed half men, half women. How about geography and region though? Like, um, oh, that's an absolute part of the sample. Polling pre so polling precinct was taking into consideration to have a, a, with, very, with, a very diverse spread with, too? With certain probability. So 22.7% okay. tw uh, of the voters are indebted though. We surveyed 23% of our sample is indebted of things like that. Okay, so um, I'd like to, for the guys in the back, if we can go ahead and try and bring up the uh, graphics of, uh, and there we go. So there we are around right now. Uh, the aforementioned Attorney General race, you see uh, leaving Camacho, of course, the incumbent. Um, interestingly enough, and I was mentioning this when we did the cut in at 8 p.m., is the Attorney General race itself. You know, you've got leaving Camacho, 271 votes, according to your exit poll, uh, 221 for Doug Moylan, of course, the island's first elected attorney general. They participated in, I want to say, what, a half dozen um, debates where, where those two gentlemen, you know, both accomplished lawyers, you know, practitioners and scholars of law, and, you know, for what it's worth, you know, Peter Santos was running, running a very aggressive writing, writing campaign. Uh, they did many of those debates. The gubernatorial race, you know, not so much. What, what, how did that play into, you know, like how this is shaped up to be? Well, I think in, in the AG's race, I think you had a former attorney general and then you had the current attorney general. So they were really matched mm -hmm. to have a good debate. I mean, they, they actually had some, if, I think of all the debates we saw this particular election season, those were the best. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they had a lot to say. They had a lot of ideas. They had a good contrast. Uh, Doug Moylan and, and Levin Camacho were very different they have very different approaches to both being the attorney general and how they responded to, to the questions that were asked. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that they, they had a lot of neat, uh, good uh, opportunities for the public to really see who they liked and didn't like. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we're talking about 50 out of 500 difference between those two early on the day. So there's no telling what will happen. We'll see where the exit poll goes on it. Uh, in these, you know, in, in this particular race where you have a fairly small number of difference between them. Right, and while we slide over to the other uh, race that um, your students were on very dutifully tracking, of course, the congressional delegate race, also want to mention again that, uh, that your students were gathering this data and uh, going up to Guamanians and constituents and voters and just, you know, honestly asking them, would you mind participating in this? The feedback rate um, was very, very positive, right? Oh, people are, I, one thing I love about the exit polls is just how willing the voters are to help students because they know students are doing it as part of a student project. Mm -hmm. And so it's part of their learning process and the community today that participate in the, uh, these exit polls helps students to learn. All right, and of course there, Dr. Judy Wampat, of course, uh, Guam's first female speaker in, in a seat that she held for five senatorial terms, trying to fill the uh, very capable shoes of her late father. Uh, um, Antonio Wantad, he of course was our congressional delegate uh, many, many years ago. She with a slight margin, according to your exit poll, over Senator Jim Moylan, uh, 285 to 221, um, if my eyesight uh, right. holds up, which it probably is not at this point in my so life. So that's about 60 out of 500. There and again, go. I'm very conservative about those closer, closer races, right. just because we were done by three o'clock. And mm -hmm. so we don't know who voted later in the afternoon. And some, some voting precincts, 
uh, people's ideas change a little bit. And that's we'll an see. important point to be made because um, with your students gathering data only up to like four o'clock, a lot of people on Guam, you know, do the eight to five shift. And you that's know, right. some people they're like, okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to work, and then I, or either I'm gonna make dinner for the kids, or I'm gonna pick up, you know, uh, my family at home, and then we're gonna vote. So that late afternoon, early evening voting can definitely make a difference. And you know, these these projections of these races with the exception of the gubernatorial race, probably can, can you know, easily flip, correct? And people can be influenced at work during the day. That's the other point. That's true. Okay, so you, we're, you're going to be here all night. Okay. We really, really appreciate that. We're going to have so much more analysis and so much more of a busy, busy day <laughs> on Guam and in the CMI as KUM's continuing coverage of the Decision 2022 general election continues on YouTube, on Facebook, on KUM TV 8. We will be back right after this. Decision 2022 coverage. Special thanks to... It's a tradition that began almost 70 years ago. A trusted legacy, a voice, an advocate, a resource for news you need to know. Through the years, the headlines have changed as many of those who have graced the screens, sat behind and in front of the cameras, and come into your homes every night. But our commitment to keeping you informed, engaged, and to represent the diverse voices in our community has never wavered. We are your news leader on every platform and every device. We've grown with the community to reflect the changing times. We are KUAM News, the voice of the Marianas. Year after year, this global day of giving has brought the KUAM Care Force and our community partners together, showcasing and sharing in acts of kindness and generosity. And this year, we're gonna take our show out on the road traveling all over the island to gather and drop off donations to beneficiaries as well as celebrate those organizations and individuals who are making a difference in our island community. Joining us for our ride will be our Giving Tuesday Spark Youth Ambassadors as well as some special guests too. We'll be live streaming and broadcasting the tour for a special edition of KUAM News Hotspot and we're calling on our community to come together and share in an act of kindness on Giving Tuesday as well. You can let us know what you're doing by sending us an email at promotions at KUAM.com. The bus stops for kindness on the Giving Tuesday bus tour on November 29th. To learn more about Giving Tuesday, you can visit givingtuesday.org or check out KUAM.com slash Get the latest updates and breaking news across the region by following KUAM CNMI on Instagram. Regional correspondent Tomas Maglotnia brings what you need to know from the Northern Marianas at the palm of your hand. Full stories, daily updates, and snapshots of the beauty across the Marianas. Follow KUAM CNMI now. Hello, I'm Gunnery Sergeant Ruben Tan from Marine Corps Base Camp Blas. Personally asking you to join me in supporting the Marine Corps Toys for Tots program by collecting new and unwrapped toys for children this year. The Toys for Tots program, now in its 13th year on island, has partnered with the Chamber of Commerce, Madsen Navigation Company, Catholic Social Services, and the Salvation Army to make this holiday season a time to remember for kids and teens throughout Guam. You may drop off your new and unwrapped toys between now and December 10th in any of our boxes throughout Guam or at the KOAM studio. We ask that when purchasing this year, please also remember gifts for older children and young teenagers. On behalf of the U.S. Marine Corps and the KUAM Care Force, we thank you for coming together and sharing the spirit of this holiday season. All right, welcome back everyone. The polls close at 8 p.m. and now we anxiously wait throughout our general election coverage. Our Nick Delgado is at Election Central live standing by. Nick, what you got for us? Hey guys, well a lot of action happening here in the past half hour since we were last on the air here at the OG Fieldhouse in Manila. But I want to bring your attention to where most of the activity unfolded again in the past 30 minutes. Right here on the right side of me, you'll see at least six of the ballot boxes there. We're seeing from the villages of Hagatnya, Tamuning, Orat Chalampago, uh, Momung Totu Maiti, Barragada, um, and Inalahan. At least six of those districts there. Again, if you're 
following exactly what districts and what numbers are being counted so far. We have a Ganya, that's District 1, uh, Timuring 17E, 17 Echo, Ordat Chalampago, 11B, 11 Bravo, Inalohan, 8A, 8 Alpha, uh, Mong Totsu Mighty, 14B, that's 14 Bravo, and Berugada uh, District uh, Precinct 15. Again, six of them now being counted after the successful uh, zeroing out of the tabulation machines. The three machines you'll see right here behind me where commissioners and the rest of the election com uh, commission officials have been at for the past now uh, more than 30 minutes just running those ballots through the machines there. And they're going through it pretty quickly. Um, I want to also bring your attention, Jake, if you can, to some of the members from each of the parties that are here as well to my right. Um, They've been monitoring the situation as well, looking at the numbers, speaking with both camps from here at the UOG Fieldhouse, and they'll be here throughout the night because they want to make sure that each camp and each party is represented here, of course, to see the numbers from the ground here, from ground zero, from where the results come in first, and we will bring you it here first once we get them in. For now, I'll send it back to you. All right, and as Nick mentioned, those those villages that he did mention are located around um, close to uh, the election central at uh, UG and Mangilao, and so those will t typically get there the first, and they start uh, counting those. So uh, we'll check back with uh, Nick periodically. Of course, the election commission also met about nine o'clock uh, this evening uh, to go through a final debriefing before they authorize the actual tabulation. So I believe they are tabulating now. So as soon as we get any results, we'll check back with Nick and he'll have those numbers for us. Okay, as we patiently wait for the results to start coming in, we should remind you that the 2022 gubernatorial showdown between incumbent uh, Governor Lou Leon Guerrero and former Governor Felix Camacho had plenty of critical issues to address from uh, crime to the soaring cost of living. But despite that, the two candidates only appeared together once for a debate. The first and only face-off was hosted by the Chamber of Commerce back in early September. All subsequent deba debates, including the traditional great debate organized by UOG, were scrubbed because of an escalating tit-for-tat in which they couldn't agree on any other venues to both appear at. So with that in mind, we take you back to September 7th for our recap of that lone face-to-face -face debate. The two governors shared the stage to answer randomly picked questions from chamber members. The first, what to do about the rise in crime, especially violent crime. The way to secure the safety of our people is to put more police officers on the ground. That is why Josh and I raised the salaries the first time in decades for our law enforcement. We saw our law enforcement going to other higher, job, higher paying jobs, and we saw attrition. We wanted to keep our public officers. We wanted to keep our public officers so that they can go out and protect businesses, protect homes, protect the schools. If there's ever a state of emergency that needs to be declared, it is with the Guam Police Department, and it was with public safety to fight crimes and to fight drugs. We have to get together a multi-agency approach towards this. And it's true, many police officers have been leaving for higher pay. They should receive premium pay above all other public safety officers because their lives are on the line every single day. Another question, why the continued state of emergency? The emergency declaration, no governor has ever had it for this long. They have not included the Guam legislature in this. You did not have a seat at the table. It is simply a matter of them being able to circumvent the procurement process. And you have to wonder, as the Democrats like to say, never let a good crisis go to waste. Who has benefited from this? And at the beginning of this virus, we, the whole world, did not know what to do with this virus, so I used science, data, advice, and by the way, I had an economic recovery team with me that were made up of chamber members, both from the Guam Chamber of Commerce and from the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce. Gita was part of that. So yes, I worked with the private sector because I know the importance and the impact it makes to you. They were also asked about how to help struggling families with a high cost of living. 
But the responses digressed and were more telling of the fundamental differences, perhaps, in their personal and political philosophies. It's so interesting that her pet response is, I'm going to give you more money. You see, what's happened is we have created, she has created a, a society now where people are dependent on big government. You comply with me, you listen to me, you give up your favor, your, your freedoms, and I will give you money. I will take care of you. I have pushed money out there. I pushed money to the businesses so they could keep their employees and operate and provide the services for our people. I pushed money the struggling families out there so they could buy food and put food on the table. I push money out to nonprofit organizations so they can continue helping government move forward and continue its operations. That's not big government, that's a humane government. The chamber-sponsored event was the first in what is expected to be several gubernatorial debates ahead of the November 8th general election. For KUAM News, I'm Nestor Leconto. And as it turned out, that was the lone debate uh, between the two gubernatorial candidates. Meanwhile, the ticket for the Attorney General of Guam had two candidates and one declared write-in. And unlike the gubernatorial race, the trio got multiple chances to speak on their platforms and duke it out over one another's experiences. Here's Nick Delgado with a look at the AG race. The Sunday after the final vote was counted, the Attorney General race pretty much almost dead even. It was the incumbent Attorney General Levin Camacho with 11,285 votes. The very first elected Attorney General, that was Douglas Moylan, the gentleman on the right, he had 10,967 votes. So that means that um, these two gentlemen, now this, isn't, this is a nonpartisan race, and this race was basically on the primary ballot uh, for posterity purposes. Basically, it doesn't matter who got in, um, the more votes in this race. Both gentlemen will advance to the uh, November general election. So you will see these two again. Those numbers were for real. A.G. Levin Camacho and challenger A.G. Douglas Moylan, the results in August coming in tight. The pair already a shoe in for November. And fresh off the primary, just days after, as a matter of fact, here they were already trading jabs at the Guam Chamber of Commerce Forum at the Hilton in Tumon. The AG decides what cases should be prosecuted, what cases shouldn't be prosecuted, assesses what your resource capability is. That's why they call him a general. They call him a general because he hires the troops, the deputies, in order to protect you. This man is not doing that. He is incompetent. Now one of the things that Attorney Mullen forgot to leave out in terms of an accomplishment or something notable, he was evicted from the judiciary for not failing to pay rent. So if we're going to talk about incompetence and management, he was held by the court, the Supreme Court, to have violated a court order, this is in a Supreme Court opinion, to not discuss or interfere in an ongoing criminal matter. No need to call order in this courtroom. It is our duty as members of the bar and practitioners before the courts of Guam, it is our obligation as lawyers to serve in educating the public as to who the candidates are who the members of the bar are, who wish to serve as the island's chief legal officer. 56-year-old Douglas Moylan was the youngest elected AG for Guam serving in that capacity from 2003 to 2007. During the 24th, 25th, and 26th Guam legislatures, he was legislative counsel. He was a member with the Guam Election Commission and even made a run for senator twice before. In an event before the Guam Bar Association, the AG candidates stood before the legal community. I remain the toughest attorney general on Guam. Let's get this out of the way. We have 13 full-time attorneys who are dedicated to keeping our community safe. 44-year-old Levin Camacho is the incumbent. He was elected to the current position, getting to work in 2019. He also worked in private practice and as a law clerk at the Supreme Court of Guam. He's the founder of a group that stopped hotel projects from being built down south. The group is named We Are Guahan. I agree with both Doug Moylan and Levin Camacho that each other should not be the next attorney general. So go ahead and just write me in. That's attorney Peter Santos. He decided to officially declare his candidacy for attorney general of Guam after the primaries as a writing candidate. The 48-year-old is a former prosecutor with the very office he is now trying to lead. He worked for the public defender's office and a judge advocate in the army. 
It's here Camacho, Moylan, and Santos make their case one on one on one, answering why they are the right choice. Crime is an issue, and that's why we have strengthened our relationship with Guam Customs. We've helped them beef up the canine unit. We are working with GPD to increase their presence as well. But the AG's office also has to be independent. And yes, we work with the governor, but we don't work for the governor. I do not believe that our current attorney general understands exactly what he's doing in there because during the pandemic, we saw our liberty rights being violated by this governor, in my opinion. The use of the military to stop vehicles should have been a declaration of martial law. This governor did it. Our attorney general did nothing. I believe at the last forum, he, des he described it as pandemic years. Problem with pandemic years are the criminals are still out there and they're still hurting us. They said they need competent prosecution because they've been given resources, but they're scrambling every time a case is dismissed and a criminal is let out without any conditions. And so all the resources that they give them is worthless if we can't prosecute and hold people accountable. So number one, first and foremost, the role of the AG is to prosecute crimes. October ended with round two for the trio, again called by the Guam Bar, this time answering questions on the growing drug addiction issue the island faces and what they think needs to be done to fix it. Part of the drug therapeutic drug court training that they have, they have to even make a class about this, is because the prosecutors are not being cooperative. They have this us against them attitude like Mr. Moynihan has. But you can't help solve the problem unless you work more collaboratively. The Attorney General puts people in jail as the Senator said they should be, and that sends the deterrent message. It hasn't worked, ladies and gentlemen. He keeps saying and digging his heels in deeper, let's just help these guys. That's not the way it's done. Buy, get more drug dogs. Have GPD open up, just not four dogs, get a dozen, two dozen dogs. We need to kill this up. In the we will continue to support drug interdiction, and I will tell you exactly what we're going to do. It's not a sound bite. And I believe that our job as the AG's office is to reduce crime, which again, includes incarceration. Violent offenders, repeat offenders, you need to go to jail. The campaign trail for these three had some tense times, each one leading them to this day where they find out who is one step closer to becoming the Attorney General of Guam. I served you 16 years ago. I am asking for your vote. I believe that I have the most to offer you as citizens of our island. I believe that I can make a big impact on stopping the crime out there. I am the toughest AG on crime. Um, my reputation is being tough, but as you being my client, I will guarantee you that every day that I am in office, I will work to make sure that you are protected in your homes and actually receive the benefits of a chief law enforcement officer. They're trying to choose who is the lesser of the two evils. Well, there's a third choice. There's me who has 30 years of public service, who rose through the ranks, who has served in the trenches with everybody. You know, I have literally bled for this island and for our country. So I want to step up to the plate because this is the time. At the end of the day, it, it comes down to what type of candidate do you want to represent to you? Someone who's going to fight for you, who's going to be honest, who's going to tell the truth, and really cares deeply about their home. Uh, I'm not here to offer you fear. What I'm here to offer you is the vision that I have is of an office that will work for the people so that we have safe communities, a clean environment, and a government that functions. All right, uh, we're joined now by uh, the uh, Democratic Party Chairman, uh, Mr. Tony Bobalton, and of course, uh, Dr. Ron McNinch is staying with us, and he'll probably stay with us the whole night, right, Ron? Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, Tony, first of all, let me get your reaction to uh, Ron's poll. Um, he has uh, Governor Leon Guerrero up uh, 60 to about 40 percent over uh, former Governor Felix Camacho, and he has uh, Speaker Juan Pat with uh, less of a lead over um, Republican Jim Moylan. Your reaction? I'd be very pleased with the exit poll. I, I think it's a reflection of all the work that, that, uh, uh, that Governor Leon Guerrero and Lieutenant Governor uh, Tenorio have put into the, in, into the campaign, as well as uh, former Speaker Wampat. Uh, all the volunteers that, are, that were out there, everyone working for the past uh, seven or eight months on, on this campaign, you know, from the primary and then kicking it up into the general. Um, 
I, I think there's a lot of uh, reasons for to be optimistic right now and to be hopeful that uh, the, the Democrats uh, have an extremely successful night. Yeah. Do, do you think that uh, the governor and the lieutenant governor were able to um, make their final arguments? And, and, and what was that? I, I think they were. I mean, the, the argument is to continue moving forward and not and not going backwards and, and uh, you know, uh, going back to, uh, to debt and regression uh, uh, with, with no clear vision on how to invest uh, into Guam's future. Uh, and that's really what I believe Governor Leon Guerrero and Lieutenant Governor Tenorio and the entire campaign and the, and the support structure in this administration is, is planning for. Uh, reducing the debt, clearly lifting wages in, in your earlier clips, making investments uh, in the Guam in the future. The governor still wants to build a, a brand new hospital. Uh, there's going to be a lot of work, I'm, I'm sure, on, on schools. The lieutenant governor is at the forefront of repairing roads and villages and uh, sprucing up all of our parks and making them uh, safe and usable for, for our children. I mean, that's really a, a, a vision of what you want Guam to be for the people of Guam. And I think that's really what resonated with, uh, with voters. Yeah. Your thoughts, Ron? I think that uh, both, both candidate teams had a strategy and, and they followed through with it. I think that this was just an odd election cycle overall. I think part of it was COVID because we're just crawling out of COVID just barely. And so it's really, uh, it's, it's tough to have a normal campaign cycle in conditions like that. That's a little bit of it. And so that's why it felt a little bit different probably for some people. And the candidates had to choose their communication strategies. And, and I think that's what we ended up seeing uh, in this election cycle. Yeah. Tony, Tony, you talked about the closing arguments. But do you think this um, campaign was also very much a referendum on how the Leon Guerrero Tenori administration handled uh, the pandemic? Because that's what pretty much, I mean, uh, dominated the, the last three terms, uh, three years of their term. Yeah, well, I mean, it, uh, you know, it's part of their record and, and how the governor handled uh, the pandemic from, from the beginning to where, to where we are now, how she um, kept our people safe, um, how she uh, it, uh, went out and, and ensured that, um, uh, that we had wide vaccination within, uh, within our community, and then how we're, how we're re recovering from that, from tourism uh, to, uh, to other issues that she really wanted to start from the beginning of her term investments into agriculture and aquaculture, uh, starting new uh, markets. There's going to be an opportunity with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act to possibly uh, do manufacturing here on Guam. I mean, those are those are turns out of the uh, out of COVID um, that this administration absolutely wants to capitalize on. Um, I was going to ask you about um, uh, Speaker Juan Pat and uh, Jim Moyle in that race. Um, it, it, it's um, Speaker Juan Pat in the lead, uh, mm -hmm. but not as substantial as, as the gubernatorial race. Does that surprise you, or is that what uh, is you essentially expected? Um, I, I, I think former Speaker Juan Pat is a, is a formidable um, a leader, and I think she did a great job getting out there and uh, talking about what she's going to fight for for Guam when she, when she becomes Guam's next delegate. Um, Mr. Moylan um, is no slack. Uh, during on the campaign trail, I mean, he was he was always out there. So, uh, you know, kudos to him for uh, for being able to go out and shake hands and try to get his message across. I think Judy Wampa had a had a stronger message. I think she's a more seasoned um, uh, leader, and I think uh, we will do well with her as our delegate, as our voice in Washington. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on that, Ron? Oh, I think it was, uh, they were a good contrast between the two candidates. So the public had a choice. You know, they definitely ha had uh, a, cho a strong choice between two very different candidates. Also, traditionally in, in elections, it's very hard for male candidates to run against female candidates. And so that's part of the equation. You've got to be really careful and not make any mistakes when, when, when you run against female candidates. That's a, a, a little, little, little bit of the riddle, too. But I think that in general terms, they, they both had uh, different strategies, and, and, and I think they both had very contrasting views. Yeah. I, I, I was going to say, if, if, if history has anything when it comes to a man running against a woman, I mean, Lulian Guerrero had three opponents in the primary uh, who were all male and, and then had two opponents in the general election. 
uh, a male during this primary and obviously uh, Felix Camacho. I wouldn't want to run against Lou Leon Guerrero if I was a man, let me tell you what. She's a formidable uh, opponent and, uh, and will continue to, I believe, to be the leader of our island. All right, and, and finally, uh, Governor Leon Guerrero also endorsed um, Speaker Juan Pat's mm -hmm. campaign. Um, is that a big help for her? I, absolutely. Um, I, I th uh, Ms. Wampat had uh, endorsements coming from, from Congress, and then she had obviously the, the governor's endorsement, with, uh, which she ran in the, in the past week. That's always helpful. Um, governor Leon Guerrero and, and the lieutenant governor are, are at the top of our ticket, and uh, I believe that as they did four years ago, they're going to uh, bring new candidates uh, into, into office. And, in this case, uh, the delegate, and then also I, uh, we're, we're hopeful that we're going to win some more seats in the Guam legislature. All right, so stand by because I'm told we have results. So we're going to go to we're going to go to uh, Nick at uh, UG Central for the first results of the night. Then we'll come back and have you guys respond to it. Go ahead, Nick. What do we have? Yeah, the first batch of results in right now. Who's set to be the next governor and lieutenant governor of Guam? Let's see the first batch of results, including only the first six precincts that we mentioned in the last live hit. Democrat candidates Leon Guerrero Sonorio coming in with 1,503 votes, or 54.6%. And Republican candidates Camacho Ada coming in with 1,000. 238 votes or 45 percent. Again, that's Leon Guerrero Tenorio, 1,503 votes or 54.6 percent, and Camacho at it at 1,238 votes or 45 percent. Still pretty close for only the first six precincts uh, that have been counted so far. In the delegate race, uh, Republican uh, delegate candidate James Moylan, 1,449 votes, or 53.3 percent, and Democrat uh, delegate candidate Judy Wampat, 1,245 votes, or 45.8 percent. This, of course, the first six uh, polling sites that have been counted so far puts Moylan in the lead. Uh, over to the uh, senatorial race, up top we have uh, Speaker Therese Terlahi with 1,822 votes, Daryl Christopher Barnett with 1,746 votes, Joe St. Augustine 1,412 votes, Amanda Shelton 1,409 votes, Tina uh, Munya Barnes 1,385 votes, Frank Blas Jr. 1,350 votes, Tom Fisher 1,263 votes, Chris Duenas, 1,203 votes. Roy Kanata, 1,128 votes. Uh, William Parkinson, 1,056 votes. Sabina Perez, 1,055. Joanne Brown, 1,036. Tello Taidugui, 1,031 votes. Jesse Lujan, 996 votes. Marianne Silva Tyron, 984 votes. Dwayne Sinicholas, 964 votes. Kelly Marsh Tights Note, 933 votes. 920 votes for Vincent Borja. 910 votes for Fred Berdalio Jr. Sarah Thomas Nendadoc, 909 votes. Jose Pito Trelahi, 884 votes. Michelle Hope Tights Note, 832. John Savares, 791. Joaquin Leon Guerrero, 776. Uh, Shirley Samabini Young, 770 votes. Angela Santos, 755 votes. 663 votes for Sandra. We have some uh, technical problems, and we'll get back to Nick as soon as we can. But uh, just from what he read out, Tony, let me get your reaction. Um, we have the gubernatorial race. Lulian Guerrero, Josh Chinorio, 1,503 or 55 percent. And... Um, Camacho Moylan, 1,230, 45%. Uh, in the congressional race, we have Jim Moylan, 53.3%, uh, and uh, Dr. Judy Wanpat, 45.8%. That's after six precincts. Your reaction first, Tony, to the gubernatorial race, is that kind of what you expected? 55, 45 at this point, after six precincts? I, I'm, I'm not surprised by it, um, but it's still early in the night. It's six sure. precincts. I, I think we want to uh, wait till more precincts come in, but uh, I, I don't think that any of those numbers would um, would quell any enthusiasm that's currently over at, uh, at headquarters for all of our candidates. Okay, um, I, I'm told we got Nick back, so we're going to go back live to the U UOG with uh, Nick Delgado. Go ahead, Nick. 
We're back on. All right, apologize for that brief interruption. Let's move on to the nonpartisan race. The incumbent attorney general candidate leaving Camacho 1,266 votes or 47.4 percent of the votes. And uh, attorney Douglas Moylan coming in at 1,100. 1,191 votes, or 44.6 percent. You got 213 write-in votes. Of course, we won't know how many writing, declared write-in candidate Peter Santos will get, at least for the next couple of weeks, until those write-in votes are confirmed. But again, it's leaving Camacho, 1,266 votes. Doug Moreland, 1,191 votes. In the Guam Education Board race, topping off uh, comes with Dr. Mary Okada, 1,757 votes. Peter Alexis Ada, 1,391 votes. Ron McNinch, 1,267 votes. Angel Sablon, 1,226 votes. Maria Gutierrez, 1,018 votes. Lourdes Benaventi, uh, 1,004 votes. Elaine Ujoa, 875 votes. 856 votes for Joseph Santos and 839 votes for Reynetti Camacho. In the CCU race, Simon Sanchez, 1,358 votes. Michael Limpiaco, 1,073 votes. Francis Santos, 1,008 votes. 925 votes for Melvin Duenas. Nonito Blas, 911 votes. And Ricardo Umpico, 802 votes. So again, for the main races that everyone's paying uh, close watch to, the AG race, leaving Camacho, 1,266. Doug Moylan, 1,191 votes, and there's also 213 write-in votes as well. This, of course, we're saying all coming out of the six polling sites that have been counted so far. It looks like of the 60,462 uh, registered voters, this includes 2,070. 2,788 of the votes with Leon Guerrero Tenorio inching at the top with 1,503, followed by Camacho Ada at 1,238. Real quick for the delegated race, James Moylan, 1,449, and Judy Wampat, 1,245. It looks like they're really stacking those boxes here behind me and getting those ballots through the machines. We'll bring you the latest and the results when we get them. For now, we'll send it back to you. All right. All right, thanks, Nick. Uh, great job, and uh, we're glad that this is coming out. Ron was just saying this is coming out pretty fast, so that's a good good sign for us. All right, uh, let's go back to the discussion. Um, we left off at the uh, delegate race. We have um, Tony uh, Jim Moylan, 1,449 votes, or 53.39 percent, to uh, Dr. Judy Wanpat, uh, 1,245, or 45.87 percent. So, um, what's your reaction to that? Still, still the same. We're we're we're, we're early in the night. Right. Um, okay. I think Democrats, because of of of, of how we've campaigned yeah. uh, over the past several months, um, uh, are willing to wait for for more results to come in, and and I, I believe that uh, that there'll be a strong showing for. You're not surprised by that at all, pet. though. I mean, he he pulls out to an early lead. Nah, I'm not surprised. That, you, Dr. McNinch? Depends on where these precincts are. Yeah. So there's well, some. Well, uh, Nick mentioned earlier it's, right. it's the, the Primarily the surrounding ones, okay. like Mangilao, MTM, okay. Aganya. Okay. Um, a smaller precincts, but you know, sure. still represents uh, what? It's seven precincts uh, representing about 4.61 percent of the of the vote. So, okay. I mean, yeah, it is still real early, but you yeah. know, I, I just to, from your poll, we had Judy kind of uh, ahead, sure. and, and it's actually the reverse on this one. Okay, let's go on to the legislative race. Um, so we have, um, no surprise, uh, Speaker Teresa Lahi in, uh, uh, in the top spot, which he's been in the last couple of elections. Uh, Chris uh, uh, Barnett, uh, we, uh, Chris showed very well in the, last, in the primary election. That's not a surprise either. We have uh, Joe St. Augustine, Amanda Shelton, Tina Barnes, and then the first Republican is uh, Frank Bloss Jr., followed by Tom Fisher, then Chris Duenas, uh, newcomer Democrat Roy, uh, uh, Roy Canata, and then... Um, uh, Will Parkinson, Sabina Paris, Joanne Brown, Teletitigui, Jesse Lujan, and Mon Tyron. So if that holds, um, we've got uh, what, um, is that nine to six or eight to seven? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight to seven right now would be, which is a current uh, makeup of the legislature. So uh, Tony, your reaction to that? Again, still so, early. <laughs> again, still. I mean, still, still early in the night. You know, I'm not going to overreact yeah. to six yeah. precincts, but um, I, we had a very strong slate of candidates uh, uh, for the Guam legislature, and um, you know, right, right past uh, at least what's showing now, right past uh, uh, Miss Tyron, 
you know, all Democrats, right? Uh, Dwayne St. Nicholas, uh, Kelly Marsh, Titano. There's a Vince Borja there, Fred Verde. I mean, I think Democrats are going to crowd up that uh, crowd up that bubble as well, and we'll see how everything plays out when more precincts come yeah. in. Yeah, Ron, you didn't do a, a, a specific poll on the legislature, but we uh, did. We did the district analysis. My surprise on on this list is to see that uh, Will Parkinson has done so well. Yeah, he uh, he's a bit of a surprise for up for me anyway. I mean, he had some really good ads in in like the PDN right at the end. He had a legacy ad with him and his father. Yeah. Did you I see think, his bush ad? Yeah, I know the the yeah. innovative, <laughs> he had the unusual yeah. ads. Yeah, so, him yeah. standing in, in the bush. Yeah, so which, I, I think which is barely was very effective because it, right. it made the rounds on social media, right? Yeah. And, well, you know, this is his second time running, right? He yeah. ran he ran four years ago, and so his name recognition, I think, is um, is greater now than it was uh, back then. And yeah. I've spoken to him. He's a smart fellow. You know, that's the other thing. Yeah, really good idea. How, how about Tom Fisher? Um, Tom Fisher, the top, the second highest getting voted getting um, Republican. Any surprise there? No, not at all. I, I think Tom Fisher ran a, a textbook campaign in terms of of how you go from the outside to the in, and 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 he he worked hard to do it. Obviously, he tried to keep his presence up in the community, and also he was a well known name already from previously working with the governor. A previous governor. Tony, of all the incumbent Democrats, only one is not in the top 15 right now, and that's um, uh, Jose Pito uh, Terlahi. Correct. Correct. But, you know, uh, there's a lot of strength uh, uh, from uh, from Senator Terlahi uh, that comes from other parts of the island. Uh, perhaps these districts aren't necessarily his strength. There's a lot of other uh, pockets of support out there for Senator Terlahi. Uh, he's the, you know, I've always called him kind of the heart and soul of the Democratic Party since he, since he came back and started serving the legislature and we will see how more results come in and how he how he climbs that ladder back yeah, in. When, once Jonia come in, comes in, right, <laughs> the former mayor of Jonia. Uh, let me ask you guys, do we have that um, the soundbite of uh, the President Biden? Yes, we do. Okay, um, so Tony, you, you and some other Democratic representatives mm -hmm. listened in this morning on a kind of a rah-rah speech from President Biden to all the Democrats in all the states and territories. Uh, let us um, run that um, sound and then uh, We'll get you to comment to, uh, on it on the other side. Sure. Uh, I can hear you. All now. right. Well, thank you very much, Jamie, for that introduction and for your leadership at DNC. Look, to all of you, thank you for leading our state parties. I've been all over the country as well. And I uh, tell you what, your heart and soul have been put into this effort. And uh, you can feel it. You can really feel it. I, 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 just, I just feel optimistic. I don't want to take too much of your time, but... We still got a lot of work to do to get out that boat. But no matter what happens tomorrow, I want to thank you and let you know how grateful I am to you. You helped get me and Kamala elected in 2020, and you're going to get a Democrat. We're going to surprise the living devil out of people because of all the work you've done. You've helped generate support for our agenda for the past 20 months, and then some of the most consequential things we've ever accomplished with the narrowest of margins. I used to, I kid with Kamala. Every time she voted, we win. We have 50 50 in the Senate. So, and we won a lot. We represent, you represent everything about our party. And the reason why I got into politics in the yeah, first no place. Okay. No to get us through the pandemic, to take the powerful, take on the powerful special interest and give working people and middle class a chance. We finally took on Big Pharma and beat them. I've been fighting for that for a long time. To protect climate with American jobs and ingenuity and to protect them fundamental rights and freedoms. Nobody, even even our mainstream Republicans are no longer talking about, is there a, a climate crisis? They've seen what's happened just in the last six, eight, 10 months around the country. And look, you also work like the devil to protect the climate. But beyond that, American jobs and American ingenuity protect the fundamental rights and freedoms we have as Americans, which are very much in jeopardy if, the, if these MAGA Republicans take over. You're bringing people in the political process, making sure that democracy delivers. That's what a Democrat is all about. Not the power for power's sake, but the power to do good for the country. That sounds self-serving about us, but it's true. The power to do good for the country. As I say, the super wealthy don't need us, need, but the but the working for folks need us, serious people who are we're doing God's work out there and need us. And what you've done with this midterm cycle, I think is literally incredible. Getting voters registered, getting the early vote out, getting them fully engaged, and it matters. It matters. We've got one of the most, you know, one more night. 
one more night, probably another 30 hours nationwide uh, between now and where we are, uh, you know, to the last vote is count, cast. But, you know, one more night to do everything we can to win and to keep it going. Look, if we're able to hold on, we're going to be in an incredible shape. Imagine what we can do in the second term if we gain control and we maintain control. So I know that sounds like a, a, a very high expectation, but I, I, I think anyway, <laughs> I'm optimistic. And I remind you, I want to remind you to remind your teams with so much at stake for a nation. Don't leave a thing that's put it all out there. Go full board to the last poll closes. Make that extra call. Not a joke. Knock on that extra door. Most of all, keep the faith. Remind the folks that the power is in their hands. This is not a referendum. This is a choice. And the more people we get out to vote, we win. We win. So let's go win. Let's get everybody we possibly can to vote. Get them to the polls. I want to thank you and God bless you all for all you've done because it truly matters. And may God protect our troops. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. President, for all that you have done for our, our party uh, and our nation. We are so grateful to you and your leadership and the, the vice president as well. So thank you. And give our best to Dr. Biden because she's been out here as well. well she, she, was, she was campaigning, I think, today in Virginia. I think she's been on the road the whole time. So anyway, thanks, Jamie. Keep thank you, careful, sir. Buddy. Thank you. All right. President Biden there as we speak. It's so at 11, 10, 9, 8, 30 on the East Coast. So the polls are open in the United States mainland. Tony, yeah. what was the president's message there? What was he trying to accomplish there? So that was a call with all the state party chairs around around the country. And it really was a, a, a reminder um, and a, a kind of a, a reminder and a pep rally for, for all the hard work that, uh, that all of us have been doing, all the state parties across the country have been doing to try and uh, make sure that the electorate understands how important um, this election is in, in particular and, can, and what's at stake and uh, the House is at stake, the Senate's at stake. Those are very powerful, obviously very powerful institutions. And it was the president's, I think, uh, effort to not only thank the party itself and, and its structure, but also just to remind that uh, that no hour or no minute is wasted. Uh, for us on Guam, Chirag and I were on the call. It happened just before the, uh, the polls opened, but I went around uh, today to remind our ground game and our phone bankers, you know, make sure that we're out there making those calls. I really didn't have to remind them. They're, they're doing it already, the incredible operation. Um, but it really was, was the pep rally. And for the, for the rest of my colleagues around the country, it really was the reminder the day before the election for them to continue, uh, continue the effort, continue the energy. These are the, the races, both on the national level and also in the state, state legislature, education boards, county commissioners, all very important when you're talking about um, uh, the leadership of the country and, and what's at stake. Yeah, and we want to thank uh, Shrug uh, Bojwani for providing us with that tape. Ron, um, the Democrats, um, you know, I have some stuff to worry about. I mean, most of the pundits are say that the uh, red wave, the Republicans are going to are going to flip the House and, and the, the Senate's this close. Uh, your thoughts on what the president had to say? Well, it's always good to see uh, Guam participating in these kinds of major uh, events within within the races. And I think that uh, uh, it was very good that, that Tony and, and our representatives were, were there. Uh, Juan Carlos on the Republican side has done a very good job to, to try to do the same thing. And I think that the more of these kinds of connections we have, the better. In terms of national politics, uh, yeah, the, the everyone's talking about the red wave and, and whether the red wave will happen. But again, that's a normal thing for a, uh, at, the, at the midpoint for the president. You know, the mm -hmm. presidents always have a tough time with the Congress. Yeah. You know, and so this is this is going to be his tough Congress, I think. Yeah, the mid the midterm, Tony. Sure. I think you'll agree is always a time when the the party in power, the president's party, always loses. It, loses it, it's suits, tough. Yeah. Mr. Obama, you know, lost in, mm -hmm. in midterms as well. We we lost the Congress uh, during his midterms as well. And yeah, yeah it's tough. If, if Governor Leon Guerrero is successful in her reelection bid, what kind of implications that, that does that have for Guam if their Congress turns red? You know. 
she works across the aisle. I mean, I've, I've been with her many times in Washington, D.C., and, and, and uh, uh, she represents us well. She speaks to the issues very well. Um, I mean, when we got into office, uh, uh, Trump was the, uh, Mr. Trump was the president. And uh, we actually went there before her inauguration in, in December when she was still governor-elect. And I remember the press release that came out of that is that she, uh, she said during the meeting, her first thing that she said to uh, President Trump was, I want uh, the earned income tax credit uh, reimbursed to Guam, and he said that he would he would support that. And you know, obviously, the Congress has to has to do something about it as well. But um, I think her being able to to do that, being able to work across the aisle um, and represent us well, and, and be able to speak to the issues that are important to Guam, uh, I don't think that she'll have a problem dealing with a uh, re with a Republican uh, Congress should it be one. All right. Uh, we're going to have to cut the Democratic Party chairman loose right now because, you know, it is an action day, so he does have other things to do besides be here to talk with us. But go down to headquarters. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tony. Appreciate your time. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks, we're going to go check in uh, on the uh, latest uh, results uh, provided to us uh, by Nick. Uh, as you see there, the uh, gubernatorial race, uh, Leon Guerrero, Tenorio, 1,503, Camacho Ada, 1,238. Uh, next uh, picture, please. Um, the congressional race, uh, Jim Moylan, 1,449, the Republican, uh, against uh, Democrat uh, Speaker Judy Wonpat, 1,245. Over in the uh, legis uh, the attorney general race, very close race, uh, tight uh, 1,266 for incumbent uh, attorney general Levin Camacho, 1,191 for um, Doug Moylan, the former attorney general, actually the first elected attorney general. We should mention that there is a third candidate, a write-in, um, but we won't know who that write-in, uh, who those write-in votes go to, but we do know that uh, Peter Santos, attorney Peter Santos, is uh, running a uh, write-in campaign. So we've only got the two up there because those are um, uh, votes that are, uh, that we know of at, at this particular point. Okay, turning to the legislative race. If we've got that, all right, the, the top 10, uh, Speaker Therese Turlahi, our former colleague, Chris Malafunction Barnett, uh, Joe St. Augustine, uh, Amanda Shelton, uh, Tina, Vice Speaker Tina Rose Munoz Barnes, the top Republican vote getter, uh, Frank Bloss Jr., followed by newcomer, Attorney Tom Fisher, uh, and uh, Minority Leader Chris Duenas, another newcomer, uh, newcomer uh, Roy Kinata. And another newcomer who's, uh, I guess, as Tony was mentioning, his second time to run is uh, Will Parkinson, the son of former speaker Don Parkinson. Next page, we have uh, Sabina Perez, an incumbent, Joanne Brown, another incumbent, Tello Tidegui, yet another incumbent, and Jesse Luhan at number 14, a former senator, followed in the uh, 15th uh, place by another former senator, Mana Silva Tyron, and uh, Dwayne Sinicholas coming in 16th, uh, former senator. Uh, Dr. Kelly Marsh Titano, 17, Vince Borja, uh, former police chief Fred uh, Bordalio, and uh, another Democrat, uh, Sarah Thomas Nedido, rounds out uh, the top 20. Okay, uh, 21, as I mentioned earlier, is incumbent Jose Pito Turlahi, uh, 22, Michelle Titano, 23, Jonathan Savaris, uh, Ken Leon Guerrero, 24, Dr. Sam Abini Young, former senator, 25, Angela Santos, 26, Sandra Seo, David Chrysostomo, Bistra Mendiola and rounding out uh, the, all of the candidates, uh, Ian Catling. Okay. So that's uh, the latest uh, of seven uh, precincts uh, counted, and uh, we have our uh, Nick Delgado up at Election Central, and we will be uh, cutting back to him as soon as we have uh, some new numbers. And we're going to take a quick break, uh, and um, we'll be back with more of our election coverage. Please don't go away, anybody. Decision 2022 coverage. Special thanks to... With the rising cost of living and more struggling to make ends meet, it's so important for us to reach out and do what we can to help those in need. You never know how a small gesture of kindness can provide someone with comfort and nourishment. That's why we're asking you, our beloved island community, to consider donating canned food items, non-perishable items, or toiletries to the KUN Care Force annual food drive. We'll be collecting items here at our studios in Harmon from now until Friday, November 25th. All donations will be distributed to Salvation Army and Catholic Social Services on Giving Tuesday. 
So donate today. Every little bit counts and together we can make a difference. Half a day, I'm Gunnery Sergeant Ribbon Tan from Marine Corps Base Camp Blas, personally asking you to join me in supporting the Marine Corps Toys for Tots program by collecting new and unwrapped toys for children this year. The Toys for Tots program, now in its eighth year in the CNMI, has partnered with the Saipan Chamber of Commerce, Lady Diane Tours Foundation, and the associated students of NMC to make this holiday season a time to remember for kids and teens throughout the Commonwealth. You may drop off your new and unwrapped toys today through December 10th at any of the 30 businesses who are cur currently participating in our campaign throughout Saipan, the Lady Diane Tours Foundation, Commonwealth Bureau of Military Affairs, and CNMI Women's Affairs offices. We kindly ask that when purchasing this year, to please remember gifts for older children and young teenagers. On behalf of the United States Marine Corps and the KUAM Care Force, we thank you for coming together and sharing the spirit of the season. It's coming. The time of year we've all been waiting for. Prepare yourself. Because on November 25th, 2022, Breeze 93.9 FM goes strictly Christmas all day, every day through January 1st. So get ready for Christmas music 24-7 on the stations playing the soundtrack of your life. Watch Mariana's artists, activists, and visionaries and their quest to protect, preserve, and promote Archimoto culture on The Culture Club, a weekly feature on KUAM News Digital Platform and the KUAM News Weekend Edition. Culture Club is brought to you by Tropical Ice, the purest, cleanest ice in Guam. The Culture Club, winner of the 2022 Regional Edward R. Murrow Award for Excellence in Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Custom Fitness Guam, in partnership with ITE, present Barbells in Paradise Guam Weightlifting Competition, Friday, December 2nd at Custom Fitness in Ogutnyan. $12 entry fee includes a complimentary beverage. To register, visit guamtime.net. Special thanks to ERC Trading Company, Killcliffe, Boca Box, KUM Sports, and Custom Fitness Physical Therapy and The Bottle Shack. And to satisfy your hunger, Laddie Grub Food Truck will be on site. All right, everybody, uh, new results. We're going to go straight to Nick Delgado, who's standing by over at Election Central in Mangilao. Go ahead, Nick. The second batch of results here. Um, let's take a look at first the gubernatorial race. Governor uh, 
and Lieutenant Governor candidates Leon Guerrero Tenorio with 3,195 votes or 53.9 percent, Camacho Ada 2,698 votes or 45.5 percent. Again, that's Leon Guerrero Tenorio 3,195 or 53.9 percent, and Camacho Ada with 2,698 votes or 45.5 percent. For the delegate race. It is James Moylan, 3,133 votes. That's still in the lead with 53.5% of the votes. And former Speaker Judy Wampat with 2,671 votes or 45.6%. Over in the Guam legislative race, it's still in the lead with Speaker Therese Terlahi, 3,830 votes. Daryl Chris Barnett, 3,717 votes. Amanda Shelton, 3,039 votes. Joe St. Augustine, 3,008. Tina Rose Munoz Barnes, 2,977. Frank Blas Jr., 2,918. Tom Fisher, 2,671. Chris Duanius, 2,536. Roy Kanata, 2,369. 2,272 for William Parkinson. Tello Tidegui, 2,203. Joanne Brown, 2,179. Jesse Lujan, 2,176. Sabina Paris, 2,139. Marianne Tyron, 2,085. Dwayne Sinicholas, 2,040. Kelly Marsh Titano, 2,014. 2,012 for Vincent Borja. Sarah Thomas Nettedog, 1,956. Fred Bertalio Jr., 1,927 votes. 1,873 for Jose Pito Terlahi. Michelle Titano, 1,827 votes. Shirley Mabini Young, 1,714 votes. 1,707 for Jonathan Savares. Joaquin Leon Guerrero, 1,662. Angela Santos, 1,619. Sandra Sal, 1,435 votes. Bistro Mandiolo, 1,370, 1,314 for David Grisostomo and Ian Catling, 675 votes. Uh, moving over now to the nonpartisan race for the Attorney General, we have incumbent Levin Camacho with 2,693 votes, that's 46.7 percent of the votes, and Doug Moylan. 2,591 votes, really tight race there with 44.9% of the votes. Total number of write-ins so far, 478 votes. I'm just going to give you a list of the rundown here in order from top to bottom for the Guam Education Board. It's coming with Dr. Mary Okada, 3,835, Peter Alexis Adda, 3,050, Angel Sablon, 2612, Maria Gutierrez, 2287, Loris Benaventi, 2225, Elaine Ujoa, 1,877, Rainetti Camacho, 1830, Joseph Santos, 1806. And for the CCU, Simon Sanchez, 2957, Michael Limtiaco, 2371, Francis Santos, 2139, Nonito Blas, 2006, Melvin Duenas, 1990, Ricardo Ampinko, 1,740. Seven votes. Again, let me just take you off top here. What we're looking at, just about a dozen of the precincts that we're told from commissioners here have been counted thus far. Uh, 6,000 out of the 6,000, 60,462 registered voters. This includes 6,009 of the votes cast uh, that were counted so far. But again, in the lead for the major races, uh, real quick, it's going to be the Angarel Tenorio, 3,195, and Camacho Ada with. 2,698 votes. So this is only the second batch that we're seeing so far, but again, the uh, ballot boxes we're seeing right here behind us stacking up pretty quickly, so we're bringing the results and let you know as soon as we get more of the numbers. For now, we'll send it on back to you. All right, All right. thanks, uh, thanks, Nick. Uh, and as you can hear, as you can see, 19 of 67 precincts already reporting. The numbers are coming in uh, hot and heavy. Thank you, uh, Maria uh, Pangalinen. As you promised, we're done by 2:30. Just kidding, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they are coming in a lot faster than than the primary. And um, as soon as we get more numbers, we'll bring them to you. We're compiling those right now, putting them on some charts so that you, you'll be able to 
to go through them as we speak. Um, 19 of 67 precincts, 6,009 ballots cast. Um, we have um, Leon Guerrero Tenorio, 53.97% or 3,195 votes to Camacho Ada, 45.57%, 2,698 votes. Um, in the uh, delegate race, uh, Jim Moylan, 3,133, 53.56% uh, to uh, Judy Wanpats, 2,671 or 45.67%. As I said, we're gonna compile these numbers, put them on some charts so it'll be easier for you to see. But right now, we're gonna go live to uh, Cross the Pond to t check in with uh, Tomas uh, Maglonia, see how uh, they're doing over in Saipan, and he's got some uh, Democratic candidates with him. Go ahead, Tomas. Hi, Nestor. Yes, uh, it's late here, and uh, last we heard from the Commonwealth Election Commission is that they're tabulating those early votes. Uh, we're going to head over there, of course. This is the election night rush. Uh, there's no shortage of uh, rushing to get you the information you need to know. And uh, tonight, of course, uh, one of the biggest stories in this election is the historic ticket uh, that the Democrats are putting forward with uh, Christina Sablon and Leila Staffler uh, running for governor and lieutenant governor. Uh, it's at the end of the night. We have yet to see... Uh, uh, the f first full batch of election results, but how are you feeling at this moment? I'm feeling really good. Uh, it's been a long day, so we're, I think we're both a little bit tired. Maybe you can hear it in my voice. <laughs> um, but it's been a really fruitful and happy day, and uh, we are just looking forward to seeing the results, hopefully soon. And Leila? I, I feel the same way. We're really exhausted. It was a long day of going around to all the different polling stations, visiting with all the different supporters and just people who, you know, really wanted to show their support. Um, and now we're ready to see the results and see what happens next. And if, if I could ask you, what was your strategy moving forward with er, early voting? Uh, we know you've spent time on Rhoda and Tinian. Uh, what was your ground game uh, this election? Uh, we really did a lot of um, like grassroots organizing, I mean, a lot of door-to-door -door canvassing, a lot of uh, fo our focus was on social media and, and then also relying on more traditional media to, you know, through op-eds and press releases and so forth. But, but uh, I think our social media uh, approach was uh, maybe we, we put a lot more energy into that, partly because we know that uh, a huge portion of our voting population is younger, is on social media, and gets a lot of their news online. Um, so we, we focused a lot on that. And uh, we were seeing a record number of uh, registered voters, 19,275. Uh, a third of voters voted early in just seven days. Uh, do you think that works in advantage of Democrats? We think so. Um, yeah, we're, we're very hopeful. I mean, I think I mentioned, as I mentioned, a lot of our voters are younger. Um, they're between the ages of 18 and 40. And, um, and then we also have a lot of new voters, people that we've met along the campaign trail who are voting for the first time ever, either because they just became citizens or because they, they finally feel like they have something to vote for, right? And um, that's been very encouraging. And so we are very hopeful. And uh, Leila, your, your takeaway from uh, the turnout so far? Definitely, it's very exciting to see so many people who are interested in exercising their civic right. Um, I've met so many people who told me that, you know, they didn't vote for so many years, but they really wanted to vote this time because they actually feel like their vote will actually go towards, a, uh, will count. And so that's what we hope for, and we look forward to the results. All right, uh, there you have it. I, I know uh, uh, things are just wrapping up here and uh, people are waiting for the results just before it hits midnight. And we know that at least the early voting is being tabulated on the machines at this moment. So Nestor and Jason, uh, I'm going to rush over back to the Commonwealth Election Commission and uh, pass the election uh, hot potato back to you over there in Guam. <laughs> All right, I, I, I caught it, Tomas. Thanks, thanks. All right. All right, so let me, let me just go quickly over uh, the, uh, the latest results uh, from Election Central. Uh, 19 of 67 precincts, that's about 28% uh, of the vote already. Um, Democrats, Leon Guerrero, Tenorio, 3,195 votes. Republicans, Camacho, Ada, 2,698. That's 53.97 to 45.57%. Uh, in the uh, delegate race, uh, Jim Moylan, 3,133, 53.56%. Uh, Speaker Judy Wanpat, uh, Democrat, 2,671 votes, 45.67%. Uh, um, 
in the uh, legislative race, if we've got that, um, still holding down the uh, top spot is uh, Speaker Therese Terlahi, 3,830, followed by uh, Chris Barnett, 3,717, Amanda Shelton, then uh, Joe St. Augustine, by Speaker Tina Rose Munoz Barnes, 2,977. The top Republican vote getter is uh, Frank Bloss Jr., 2,918. He's followed by two more Republicans, Tom Fisher and Minority, Le Minority Leader Chris Duenas. Uh, Democrat uh, newcomer Roy Kinata, 2,369 votes. Will Parkinson, another newcomer, 2,272. Incumbent Republican Tello Tidegui, 2,223. She's followed by incumbent uh, Joanne Brown, former Republican Senator Jesse Anderson, and uh, Democratic incumbent Sabina Paris. And then rounding out the top 15, that it would be uh, Mana, uh, Marianne Mana Silva Tyron uh, with 2,000. 85 votes. Uh, continuing on, uh, Democrat uh, Dwayne uh, St. Nicholas, Democrat and former Senator Kelly Marsh Titano, uh, uh, Republican Vince Borja, uh, Democrat Sarah uh, Netadog, former Police Chief uh, Fred Bordalio, incumbent Democrat uh, Jose Pito Terlahi, um, Republican Michelle Titano, former Senator Shirley uh, Mabidi Young, uh, Jonathan Sav Savaris, uh, Ken Leon Guerrero. Angela Santos, uh, Sandra Sea, Bistro Mandiola, David Chrysostomo, and rounding out the 30 is Ian uh, Catling. So that's the uh, latest uh, results that we have from the Election Commission. As I said, 19 out of 67 uh, precincts reporting, about 10% uh, of the uh, voter turnout with 6,009 um, votes cast. All right. Um, so, uh, do we want to turn over to uh, Jason in the studio? Where do you want to go now? Okay, we're going to take a short break, and then when we come back, uh, Jason Salas will have some special guests, the young folks. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, their uh, interests and uh, what uh, concerns them and the issues that uh, motivate them. Uh, we're going to take a short break and be right back. Don't go anywhere. It's a tradition that began almost 70 years ago. A trusted legacy, a voice, an advocate, a resource for news you need to know. Through the years, the headlines have changed, as many of those who have graced the screens, sat behind and in front of the cameras, and come into your homes every night. But our commitment to keeping you informed, engaged, and to represent the diverse voices in our community has never wavered. We are your news leader on every platform and every device. We've grown with the community to reflect the changing times. We are KUAM News, the voice of the Marianas. With the rising cost of living and more struggling to make ends meet, it's so important for us to reach out and do what we can to help those in need. You never know how a small gesture of kindness can provide someone with comfort and nourishment. That's why we're asking you, our beloved island community, to consider donating canned food items, non-perishable items, or toiletries to the KUN Care Force annual food drive. We'll be collecting items here at our studios in Harmon from now until Friday, November 25th. All donations will be distributed to Salvation Army and Catholic Social Services on Giving Tuesday. So, donate today. Every little bit counts, and together, we can make a difference. A monthly love letter to all the amazing things happening on this island we call home. From adventures to hidden treasures. To the familiar things we know and love. Love for Guam. It's your monthly ticket to the best Guam has to offer. So, LFG. Watch LFG on the last Thursday of every month. Presented by Pepsi. That's what I like. Get the latest updates and breaking news across the region by following KUAM CNMI on Instagram. Regional correspondent Tomas Maglonia brings what you need to know from the Northern Marianas at the palm of your hand. Full stories, daily updates, and snapshots of the beauty across the Marianas. Follow KUAM CNMI now.
Thanksgiving is a special time of year, a time to share a delicious, delectable feast with family and friends. But you can't cook. Leave it to the pros and let Uno go deliver to your door. Check our app or website for Thanksgiving specials from participating restaurant partners, plus party platters, pies, and more. Have a happy Thanksgiving from all of us at Uno Go. Guam on demand. Get all your beverages delivered from the Bottle Shack on the Unago app and website. Whether you're watching the big game, celebrating a milestone, or just want to unwind at home, we got you. Delivering spirits, soft drinks, beer, ice, and more right to your front door. Check out our Instagram page for monthly specials and giveaways. The Bottle Shack on Unago. The fast, safe, and responsible way to enjoy life. Must be 21 and older to order. Delivery is limited to certain villages. Visit uno-go.com or download the app today. Drink responsibly. Fitness Guam in partnership with ITE present Barbells in Paradise Guam Weightlifting Competition Friday, December 2nd at Custom Fitness in Ogutnyan. $12 entry fee includes a complimentary beverage. To register, visit guamtime.net. Special thanks to ERC Trading Company, Killcliff, Boca Box, KUM Sports, and Custom Fitness Physical Therapy and the Bottle Shack. And to satisfy your hunger, Laddie Grub Food Truck will be on site. All right, everybody, welcome back to KUM's continuing coverage of the general election for Decision 2022. I'm Jason Salas. And you know what? Super Tuesday has now become Big Wednesday because it is six minutes past the hour of midnight here. It is now November 9th, and we are glad to have you along for the ride. And I am glad to welcome the four gentlemen who now are squeezed into the KUM couch because four, four young Guamanians, four learned, experienced gentlemen, four um, young guys who are really, really passionate about politics, and four wonderful members of our community who are going to share their election experience and kind of like what we think from their generation. Uh, we have Matteo Mortera. He is here from the Generation of Promise, also from that uh, organization. Silas Dorr, gentlemen, thank you. Welcome. Thank you for having us, Jace. All right, very well. Uh, Al Labang, who I was talking with Al, we interviewed him a bunch of times on, on the link on Zoom over the years. It's the first time I've actually seen you in person, so very nice to have you here. All right, welcome. And then Lawrence Alcairo is someone who I've come to know very, very well from our interviews over the years. So Lawrence, all the way over there on the other side. So uh, glad to have you here. So, um, you know, we'll start here since, Mar since uh, Mateo has the mic and everything. Uh, what was your election experience uh, like today? You know, from not necessarily from the, from the perspective of your generation, but, you know, just going around and being able to cast your vote and, you know, seeing the way that, you know, Guam got involved with and then responded to the election process. Right. Well, I'll, I'll tell you right now. Day started very early for me, so I have been needing a nap since 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but um, I'm very green to this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And seeing the energy that campaigns put into these things and 
seeing the voter turnout just even in the morning and all of the honking i mean it was ecstatic man and mm -hmm. and um yeah like i said i need a nap it's no, been you're... a really good day well you also yeah. gig like late at night too so like uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, kind of used to it. There you go. <laughs> okay, let's go to Silas now, because Silas, uh, you're yeah. twenty, you're twenty six, right? Correct, so, yeah. so you're kind of on the, the elder, the elder Gen Z side, maybe like a, um, you know, not younger millennial, I guess. Correct. I'm, I'm, I'm up there. Yeah. There you go. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you, so you actually represent like a very broad, very diverse uh, generation of people, right. but obviously your your generation has a puts a premium on information, on knowledge. Um, what was the experience of you going around the island today like? Like you said, it was, it was a lot of good energy, right? We saw mm -hmm. the, the campaigns are very motivated, both on the Lou and Josh side and the Camacho Ada side, and we felt a lot of good energy from the Camacho Ada side, right? This is the first time, just like Matteo was saying, I'm, I'm fairly green to this, first mm -hmm. time I've really been invested in politics. Mm -hmm. and, and we're invested in it because we, we see the, the crisis that the island is going through now. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of good, a lot of good energy, and, and I, I'm excited to see the results as they're coming in. Now you probably noticed um, going around, Silas, that you know the election process is Guam's. For years we called it, you know, Guam's favorite pastime is baseball. Would be like in the states. I mean, people really, really right. get into yep. it here, yep. and it's a very participatory activity. So it is. It's, it's not just you know drive by and you know honk your horn and wave and everything like yep. that. I mean, it's a social um, function. You know, yes. like it's obviously you want to share thoughts about politics. So what was that like? You know, I noticed that on Guam, people are, are very passionate about politics. And, mm -hmm. and one thing that I appreciate about Guam is it's not like the states where you see the partisan politics and everyone's at each other's throats, right? Your red team and blue team. On Guam, I've noticed that people, we really care about this island and we're all in this together, right? And that's something I appreciate about it. Mm -hmm. So as you're sharing your ideas, you're not getting that kind of hostility that you may see in the mainland. You're seeing a lot of people that are just passionate. And even though we may disagree on which politicians are going to get us to the end goal, we want to get to the same goal, right? We want to see Guam succeed. And so sharing ideas and hearing feedback has been a great experience here. Very nice. Okay, and if you, if you would hand the, uh, ha the uh, microphone over to Al. I got to say, the Young Democrats of Guam, you guys got really good taste in shirts, man. Both, both, <laughs> both Al and Lawrence, those are yeah. very, very nice island print shirts. Thank you. But, but you know, it's, it's not just about appearance for the Democrats. Mm -hmm. It's also about uh, the beliefs of your party and, you know, and making sure that that message um, and that ideology persist through the generations of the people that yeah. came before you. So, you know, what was it like to interact with maybe some of the some of the older Democrats today and, and be able to celebrate as one? To be honest, like, um, I voted early. So, um, I voted, like, last month in Weston. And to be honest today, I just, like, went around the island and see, like, um, the line of cars that we could do. Because, like, I mostly visited the northern um, polling sites. And you can see, like, how diverse the group of people are in every hospitality tent that we have, mm -hmm. both sides. And, you know, like, another thing is, like, seeing candidates from both sides of the party reach out to the other side. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that is great here on our island. It's, like, reaching out to, our, um, to those who don't have the same beliefs as ours. Mm -hmm. Did you get a sense out of, like, of leadership, you know, uh, you know, you, you, you go around and you see some very, very tenured, very, very experienced politicians, and then you see families who always host, uh, you know, parties. And then, like you said, you mm -hmm. go to the West and you see places very well organized yes. and everything like that. What sense do you get of, uh, of the values, again, like of your, of your party and, you know, making sure that, you know, like that those, those ideals stay strong? I think it's a sense of hospitality is one thing I've noticed. Very nice. Yeah. Okay, and I know Lawrence is chomping at the bit to ask it because Lawrence, Lawrence, I got to tell you, bro, you've been you've been in this game like a long time. When you said you, when you you, when you you were telling me like you're 29, you're like the elder statesman of the, of this group here and everything. But your experience, you know, like procedure, you you've been involved with this and you've been very very passionate about about politics and wanting change and wanting leadership uh, for quite a while. So uh, you know, now with some years under your belt and everything like that, what about this particular election like stands out to you as significant? Uh, for me personally, as a Democrat, you know, this is the first time that we've had Adeloupe for as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. um, I know uh, Governor uh, Gutierrez was um, on the way out when I was starting to go to elementary school, so I don't really recall much. Um, but I've definitely seen a lot of uh, younger Democrats stepping up to the plate. Me personally, for my election day, I was at uh, the GIGO FBLG polling site before the sun came up and left after the sun came down. <laughs> and part of that is because I was helping to you know, lead the charge for Democrats. And there's a lot of younger Democrats that are 
at that higher level already of being maybe village co-chiefs or or leading uh, data teams, leading logistics teams. So I'm, I'm really glad to see, you know, Democrats starting to get that um, chance to mentor the next generation of what I hope to be our young Democrats in the legislature. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, according to uh, Dr. McNinch's, you know, that exit poll that came out earlier, uh, very, very wide margin for your candidate for the Lou and Josh team. Um, he was also projecting that uh, Dr. Judy Wanpat will take uh, the congressional race as it stands right now. Uh, we'll bring the, you saw the graphics um, flying up there with the results so far, I believe, on uh, 19 out of the 67 village precincts having been reported now. Um, Jim Moylan has a slight lead right now. Of course, you know, that, that can change. How do you perceive, you know, the performance of the party so far? Because you could say, you know, like we're sitting pretty or, do, you know, do you stay like, you know, cautiously optimistic? Uh, we're definitely cautiously optimistic. The party definitely worked hard. I have to give kudos to, to all the village chiefs on the Democratic side that really uh, pushed hard and poll watched, phone banked, put out the food, come in and set up before and after polling sites closed and open. Um, so we, we know that we did all that we could. And we're just glad that, you know, the people of Guam came out um, and will vote and will let us know who their voice will be um, at the loop in Congress and in the legislature um, in a few hours. All right. Well done. Oh, I'll tell you what. Uh, why don't we hike the mic all the way back? We're going to do like the old school, like the typewriter where it goes all the way across. So uh, let's go back to Mateo because, uh, Mateo, I've been privileged to interview most of the candidates mm -hmm. um, here. I had a whole group of members from uh, the GOP, a lot of them returning senators, you know, Jesse Lujan among them, uh, Joanne Brown, of course, an incumbent. Mm -hmm. But they were saying they really wanted to speak with a unified voice to get the Republican Party back as the majority for the first time in 14 years. Um, mm -hmm. What was it like in those meetings and those planning sessions to say, like, you know, this is how we can get this done? And, you know, Guam has been, you know, as your contemporary said here, you know, such a... Uh, Democrat heavy community uh, for such a long time. So how do you actually go about, you know, taking the majority? Well, you know, um, on those meetings, I can't actually speak on because mm -hmm. I've been more tunnel vision, focusing on the Generation of Promise movement, mm -hmm. getting the young voters to come out, young Republicans, or even young Democrats who align with our solutions mm -hmm. that we have okay. to offer, right, that our candidates have to offer. So um, all I've seen all around, though, is a very passionate effort. And this this comes back to values that everybody holds. This comes back to, um, you know, aligning with the candidates' solutions and, and feeling strongly and, and pushing very hard for those things. So everybody all around in this campaigns have done a very, very, I would say, impactful effort. That's right. a good word. Yes. And very, very, very fitting. Okay, so yes. Silas now, um, you know, it's so much has been said in this election season that, you know, there's been either a sense of apathy from your generation or disinterest or um, distrust or, you know, like um, some people are like, I can do so many other things. You know, the, the monoculture is, is no such thing. When I was a kid, you know, everybody watched the Who Shot JR episode of like Dallas, right? Everybody right. did the same thing. Right. Now, you know, everybody's got a kajillion different things to do. How difficult was that to you know to you know do this kind of work and tell young people that you know our voice has as right. much holds as much weight as you know the older guys? Right, it wasn't very difficult at all because I think the young generation sees the the, the issues that are facing the island, right, and they're passionate about it. They see the crime wave. We're, we're experiencing a crime wave on Guam like we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And growing up on Guam, we never saw gang-style homicides and decapitations. We never saw theft and, and home invasions on the rise like it is happening today, right? So no one, wants, no one wants to be a victim of crime, right? They don't want their family members and their mom or sister to be a victim of crime. So th it was very easy to engage uh, the, the voter base around my age group, where we all want, want what is best for the island. And so I think that they're, they're very passionate about this. They, they, they want to see Guam succeed, and, and that's going to get them out to the polls. All right, very yeah. well. Okay, and let's go to... Uh, Alan, we'll wrap up with you, Al, because I know you were taking like copious notes when you were back there in our green room <laughs> as we were reading the first batch of results. So, so when you're doing this analysis and, and looking at you know how uh, the various races are shaping up, even in these early stages, what are you looking at? What trends and what what patterns are you, I was what just are you looking out looking for? Looking at like um the like the voter data that is coming out and like analyzing how the trend will go. Um, I'm a math major, so like I was ah. analyzing the numbers and seeing how would it go towards the, you know, the trend of the election. And another thing is like, I wanna talk on how you need to vote. And I'm just excited on what the youth voter turnout is. And to be honest, I think this election is exciting because um, it's been a while since we have 
um, someone who's 25 years old. 25 is the age, the minimum age for someone to become a senator. And it's ironically that Roy Kanata, the one of our Democratic candidates, is 25 right now. Mm -hmm. So he's I a think, peer of yours. Yeah. yeah. Um, looking at how this legislature would shape, um, how it would look, how would it end? I think now that we have a representative demographic on the legislature side, because you have someone who looked like us, someone who's our age. Very well. Yeah. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you for sharing some of your time, some of your wisdom and some of your insight. I know um, all four of you are going to go to your respective uh, party headquarters. And I mean, it, it is going to be a party from what I understand. Yes. Uh, there's, some, there's some very uh, festive uh, times going down there. Uh, we wish the four of you the best of luck and uh, please continue to work because the the inspiration that you're giving to your generation and everything like that is very much appreciated and uh, very necessary in our community. Yeah. And, and Al, we're going to let you get back to like your derivatives <laughs> and you, you know all of your all all of your fancy calculus as you do that yeah, math math major. I'm like, okay, we, that's a smart one, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank all right, you. And please stay tuned because KUM's continuing coverage of the Decision 2022 general election will continue after this. We'll bring you some more results when we come back. Year after year, this global day of giving has brought the KUM Care Force and our community partners together, showcasing and sharing in acts of kindness and generosity. And this year, we're gonna take our show out on the road, traveling all over the island to gather and drop off donations to beneficiaries, as well as celebrate those organizations and individuals who are making a difference in our island community. Joining us for our ride will be our Giving Tuesday Spark Youth Ambassadors, as well as some special guests too. We'll be live streaming and broadcasting the tour for a special edition of KUM News Hotspot, and we're calling on our community to come together and share in an act of kindness on Giving Tuesday as well. You can let us know what you're doing by sending us an email at promotions at KUAM.com. The bus stops for kindness on the Giving Tuesday bus tour on November 29th. To learn more about Giving Tuesday, you can visit givingtuesday.org or check out kuam.com slash careforce. Hello, I'm Gunnery Sergeant Ruben Tan from Marine Corps Base Camp Blas. Personally asking you to join me in supporting the Marine Corps Toys for Tots program by collecting new and unwrapped toys for children this year. The Toys for Tots program, now in its 13th year on island, has partnered with the Chamber of Commerce, Madsen Navigation Company, Catholic Social Services, and the Salvation Army to make this holiday season a time to remember for kids and teens throughout Guam. You may drop off your new and unwrapped toys between now and December 10th in any of our boxes throughout Guam or at the KOAM studio. We ask that when purchasing this year, Please also remember gifts for older children and young teenagers. On behalf of the U.S. Marine Corps and the KUIM Care Force, we thank you for coming together and sharing the spirit of this holiday season. Half a day, I'm Gunnery Sergeant Ribbon Tan from Marine Corps Base Camp Blas, personally asking you to join me in supporting the Marine Corps Toys for Tots program by collecting new and unwrapped toys for children this year. The Toys for Tots program, now in its eighth year in the CNMI, has partnered with the Saipan Chamber of Commerce, Lady Diane Tours Foundation, and the associated students of NMC to make this holiday season a time to remember for kids and teens throughout the Commonwealth. You may drop off your new and unwrapped toys today through December 10th at any of the 30 businesses who are cur currently participating in our campaign throughout Saipan. The Lady Diane Torres Foundation, Commonwealth Bureau of Military Affairs, and CNMI Women's Affairs offices. We kindly ask that when purchasing this year, to please remember gifts for older children and young teenagers. On behalf of the United States Marine Corps and the KUAM Care Force, we thank you for coming together and sharing the spirit of the season. It's coming. The time of year we've all been waiting for. Prepare yourself, because on November 25th, 2022,
Breeze 93.9 FM goes strictly Christmas. All day, every day through January 1st. So get ready for Christmas music 24-7 on the stations playing the soundtrack of your life. The Edward M. Calvo Cancer Foundation presents a special screening of Wakanda Forever on Sunday, November 13th at 2.20 p.m. at the Tango Micronesia Mall Stadium Theaters. Tickets are $25 and includes giveaways, raffle prizes, and a souvenir photo. Doors open at 1.30 p.m. for this much-anticipated sequel to Marvel's Black Panther. All proceeds benefit the Edward M. Calvo Cancer Foundation in their efforts to provide financial assistance to cancer patients in Guam and the CNMI. Purchase tickets at the EMC Cancer Foundation office in Helgutnia on weekdays or email emccancerfoundation at gmail.com to arrange your online purchase. Visit our Facebook page to learn how you can pay special tribute to a loved one during the screening. Wakanda Forever, a benefit for the Edward M. Calvo Cancer Foundation, is presented by Payless Supermarkets, Bank of Guam, Cars Plus Guam, Calvo Enterprises Inc., ITD, Uno Go Guam, Custom Fitness, Global Food Services, Docomo Pacific, EC Developments, IBD Guam, and the KUAM Care Force. And also brought to you by Steel Athletics and Today's Realty. Call 472-6223 or visit our Facebook and Instagram pages for more information. I'm here at the headquarters for Governor Lou Leon Guerrero and Lieutenant Governor Joshua Tenorio. Joining me is the campaign spokesperson, Ginger Cruz. What's your take on the latest batch of numbers sent out? We're pretty excited about it. Um, if you look at the history of governor's elections in Guam from 1970 until now, uh, the historic average has been around 52 to 55 percent and uh, from the get-go we've been polling right about there or a little bit ahead of that so we could be looking at a history making night tonight and we're pretty excited all right and I know you guys are quite a bit ahead but are you feeling confident these numbers will kind of remain well, I'll tell you, I mean, there was the exit poll that KOM covered today. Um, we've been doing our own bit of tracking. Um, and, you know, the best thing is the excitement out at the precincts. All of our folks were out today and they felt the energy and they saw, you know, the village organizations and all the work that's been put in. So, I mean, we always have to see what the people want to say when they cast their votes. But at this point, we're feeling very confident. All right. And you kind of touched on this when you came on Hot Spot. But how would you describe this gubernatorial race against Camacho Ada? Well, it's, it's really been a race about optimism and about resiliency and about understanding the realities of Guam and, and really seeing the hard work that's been put in by Lou and Josh in the last four years despite incredible adversity. And you sort of contrast that with a Republican campaign, which was pretty much a copy paste from the United States, which was a little bit odd because, you know, that's a it's a very extreme Republican Party that you've got sort of driving the message in the states. And a little bit of that spilled over in Guam. So you saw a lot of negativity. You saw a lot of attack ads. You saw a lot of dark money coming in. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting to see, did that play out? Did that affect the polls? Um, I think you can see a tiny bit of an effect on people uh, because, you know, you they say people don't like negative ads, but it does have a little bit of an effect. Uh, but the thing that I'm most excited about is we have this commanding lead anyways, despite the fact that, you know, we stayed on the high road, we kept our message going strong, and I think we it looks like we got that message out effectively. All right. Thank you, Ginger. We'll go ahead and send it back to you, Nestor, but keep it here to KUM News, where we'll be bringing you live coverage throughout the night. All right. Thanks, Hannah and Ginger. All right. We're back in the studio, and I'm pleased to welcome as our guest the Republican Party Chairman, Juan Carlos Benitez. Hello. And, of course, Dr. Robert Underwood, former congressman for the Democrats. Thanks uh, for joining us. Yeah, I'm, right. I'm chairman at my house. Chairman of your house. <laughs> well, you know, your wife will have uh, some. Well, I don't know. No, no, I take it back. I take it back. Uh, Co-chair. <laughs> All right. Uh, let, me, let, me go through, let me go through the numbers that we have so far. We have uh, 19 precincts uh, reporting so far, uh, 6,009 6, votes or about 10%. Uh, in the gubernatorial race, we have uh, Democrats Leon Guerrero Tenorio, 3,195 votes to... Um, Camacho Ada, 2,698. In the uh, congressional race, 
we have um, Jim Moylan, 3,133 votes to former Speaker Judy Wanpat for the Democrats, uh, 2,671. And uh, moving to the Attorney General race, 2,693 for incumbent uh, Levin Camacho, and 2,591 for former Attorney General uh, to, uh, Doug Moylan, 2,591, as I said. In the, senatorial, in the senatorial race, uh, Speaker Therese Terlahi in the top spot, 3,830. Chris Malafunction Barnett, 3,717 in the second place. Amanda Shelton, another Democrat, 3,039 in third place. Uh, Ways and Means or uh, Finance uh, Committee Chairman Joe San Augustine, 3,008. Rounding out the top five, Vice Speaker Tina Rose Munya Barnes, 2,977 votes. In the sixth spot, the top Republican vote getter is uh, Frank Bloss Jr., 2,918. He's followed by newcomer attorney Tom Fisher, 2,671. Another Republican, Minority Leader Chris Duenas, 2,536. In the ninth spot is a newcomer, Democrat Roy Kanata, 2,369. In 10th place is another newcomer, Will Parkinson, 2,272. He is the son of former Speaker Don Parkinson. On the next page, in the 11th spot, uh, incumbent uh, Republican Senator Tello Tidegui, followed in the number 12 spot by uh, another Republican, Joanne Brown. 2,179 votes. In the 13th spot is a former Senator, Republican Jesse Lujan, 2,176. He's followed by incumbent Democrat, Sabina Paris. And rounding out the top 15 is a Republican and former Senator, Mana Silva Tyron, with 2,085 votes. If I, let me go quickly through the rest of the, the field. In 16th is Dwayne St. Nicholas, followed by former Senator Kelly Marsh Titano. 18th, Vince Borja, and 19th, Sarah Thomas Nedadog, and 20th, former Police Chief Fred Bordalio. In the 21st slot, we have uh, Jose Pito Terlahi, an incumbent Democrat. He's followed by Michelle Hope Titano, former Senator uh, Dr. Sam Abini Young, uh, Jonathan Savaris, uh, Ken Leon Guerrero, Angela Santos. 27th is Sandra, Sandra Seau. Uh, 28th is uh, Bistro Mendiola. 29th, David Chrysostomo. And 30th is Ian Catling. So that are that's uh, the results. Uh, okay, let's go to the Guam mm -hmm. Education Board. We haven't uh, done that yet. Uh, Dr. Mary Okada, 3,835. Dr. Okada, of course, is the president of the Guam Community College. We have longtime uh, Education Board member Peter Alexis Ada. Dr. Ron McNinch, one of our um, favorite uh, analysts, uh, 2,760 votes. Angel Sablon, the um, Executive Director of the Mayor's Council, 2,612. Maria Gutierrez, who just won an award for the Guam uh, Education Board with the uh, Western Association of uh, Colleges, Schools and Colleges, I believe it was. Um, sorry if I got that wrong, Maria. Uh, Lourdes Beneventi, Lou Beneventi, 2,225. We have Elaine Ujoa, 1,877. Renati Camacho, 1,830. And Joseph Santos, 1,806. That's the Guam Education Board. And do we have the CCU? Yes, the CCU, <laughs> uh, Simon Sanchez in the lead, uh, at the top rather, uh, 2,957, an incumbent board member, longtime board member. Uh, number two is another uh, current board member, Mike Limtiaco, former senator. Uh, Francis Santos, the current uh, interim uh, superintendent of education, Francis Santos. Uh, Nonito Blas, former mayor of Jonia. We have Melvin Duenas uh, with 1,990. And uh, Rick and Pinko, who used to be the uh, general manager of the Guam Power Authority, 1,747 votes. That's the CCU. All right, anything else? All right, let's get some reaction now from our panelists. Um, Dr. Underwood, well, let me start with you. Your reaction to the uh, results, first of all, in the uh, gubernatorial race, uh, well, the under our early. Obviously, I'm uh, quite happy to see that the uh, governor looks like she's uh, on, uh, the lieutenant governor looks like they're on their way to getting reelected. Of course, we don't know for sure, but it certainly looks that way, and I think they ran a very uh, uh, straightforward, uh, feel-good kind of campaign, and uh, I think it, uh, it uh, served them well in the end. I, it, the, 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 the thing is, is that, uh, and people ask me, and you know, I just say, uh, I don't think there has been any governor in the island history that had to make those kinds of decisions on a daily basis that she had to make. And, uh, 
I think it, it served her well, and more importantly, it served us well. So um, we'll, see, we'll see what the final results are, uh, but uh, I think she's on her way. Yeah, and you're speaking, of course, about how she, her handling of the pandemic, and, and a lot of people thought that um, this, um, this particular uh, campaign would be based on her, her uh, action uh, in response to the pandemic. Um, and um, yes. uh, well, I, I, I think it served her well. Obviously, there are people who, who think otherwise and, uh, you know, who uh, want to question uh, the decisions she made. But I think the intensity of having to make those calls on a daily basis and having to make those announcements and having to receive that information, uh, that's a pretty weighty responsibility. And uh, I, th I think she handled it well and uh, she saved lives in the process. And, uh, you know, obviously we're looking forward to uh, a little bit more opportunity to recover and engage in some of the projects uh, that she had originally hoped to engage in. But we're delayed by the pandemic. All right, Juan Carlos, you have a different opinion. Um, well, well, the question about her record is, is a different. She didn't run on that campaign, but if we want to, you know, say that that's what she ran on, it's okay. Uh, but it's, it's uh, when, I, when, I, when I look at the results so far, it's obviously not exactly what I would love to see, but the numbers are very early. This is just 10% of the votes out. Uh, Gigo and Dere, though, for us are, are, are very crucial. Uh, Haggett, it's also important for us. Uh, you're gonna start seeing the, those votes come in. We hope to see those issues narrow uh, among each other. But it's, you know, at the end of the day, what we hope is for a larger turnout. Uh, the bigger the turnout, we thought is bigger, is better for us, and it's better for Guam. I think it's important that we get the voter out and participate on our democratic process. Uh, we're seeing an interesting legislature. It looks seven eight right now. We feel that that might flip a little bit up and down, but I think it'll end up around seven eight, uh, hopefully on our side. Uh, and and uh, it looks like after thirty years, we're getting our first pick in Congress. We're finally going to have another Republican congressman as part of our red wave. Okay. Before we get to those other races, let me just ask you. Do, do you think uh, that uh, the Camacho Adam made uh, the, uh, an effective closing argument, and, and what was it? Yeah, I, I think we, we, we run a great campaign. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to run against, you know, $1.5 million that they've been collected over the last year, plus all the funding that they use in advertising on all those federal campaigns, uh, and top of that, so I estimate $2.5 million. We, we were nowhere near compared to those, and we, we ran a strong race. We ran on, our, on a our record and what we stand in on our issues. And uh, at the end of the day, the people of Guam must decide to choose who they want to have as governor for the next four years. D Dr. Arnold, we don't know specifically what all of the precincts that came in mm -hmm. are, but are there certain strongholds that, that uh, Lou and Josh have that have not come in, you think? Yeah, all the remaining villages. <laughs> <laughs> all the remaining villages are for Lou and Josh. Yeah. And so I can, I, I, I'll just tell you that right now. And, uh, and uh, moreover, you know, uh, one of the ways that you can see how the level of grassroots support is, is that you'll notice that a couple of Republican mayors are over with Lou and Josh. Mm. And so that's a, that's a good sign, I think. Uh, certainly Agat and Tamuning, uh, although Tamuning is both the hometown of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Governor Lou and uh, former Governor uh, Felix. Uh, but, uh, you know, and it's traditionally uh, a Republican stronghold. So we'll see how it plays out. But I think the, the, uh, the, the basis for this is that uh, you're going to see a lot of grassroots support I think it's uh, probably, uh, you know, every campaign believes that the greater the turnout, uh, uh, the greater it is for them. But no, no, I agree with Juan Carlos. It's better for the island if you have a higher turnout. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I agree with that. But I think a higher turnout would even increase the uh, margin of victory. Yeah. I, I teed that up really well for you. Well done, sir. <laughs> let's move on to let's move on to the uh, the delegate race. We have a uh, Jim Moylan uh, leading uh, Speaker Juan Pat, uh, fifty three point five percent to forty five point sixty seven percent. Let me start with you, uh, Dr. Underwood. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm I'm uh, disappointed, obviously, and uh, I think it it doesn't uh, serve the island well, but. Uh, uh, Jim Moylan has run uh, an interesting campaign, and so we'll see how it turns out. Uh, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, we don't know what the remaining uh, votes are. We really don't. And we don't know how uh, it plays out, because sometimes the congressional race is 
sort of decoupled from the gubernatorial race, as is the legislative race. So we'll see how all of that works out. Uh, Juan Carlos, what do you think uh, is responsible for this early lead that um, Jim Moylan has jumped out to? Well, I, I think his message, uh, I think he had, he had a message of working with the United States and with the Department of Defense into uh, finding ways, ways to benefit Guam through the buildup and as we move forward. Uh, strong message about getting Chamorro companies to be recognized and put at the same level as Hawaiian and uh, Alaskan Native corporations. So he, he had a very strong message of what he's going to do in D.C. For the last two years, he's been going to D.C. We've been meeting with members of Congress, have a good relationship with the uh, Republican legislature. So uh, I, I think you, you can tell it. He dominated the issues, understood them well. I think Judy uh, Wompat, the former speaker, uh, it came, came across uh, as, as not as knowledgeable understanding on how to deal with D.C. And she did one trip to D.C. at the end to try to get photo ops with a, a number of members of Congress. I'm sure you helped her get a couple of those. And, uh, but, you know, the, the, there was not the, the real understanding of how Congress works. Well, she actually got real photo ops with members who actually endorsed her. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to say that I, I found Jim uh, Moylan's uh, uh, advertisement and claimed that uh, a deceased congressman was going to mentor him. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, the passing of Don Young. So uh, I think in uh, Jim Moylan's, uh, despite how many trips he took there, uh, he was never able to engage a large number of members of Congress to endorse him. And his uh, parting shot was to say that Don Young, uh, who I met with a couple, uh, about a week before he passed away, mm -hmm. uh, that Don Young was going to mentor him. I thought that was interesting. But uh, nevertheless, we'll see how it turns out. Uh, Guam needs an advocate in Washington, D.C. Guam needs an advocate. Yes, you have to cooperate. Yes, you have to collaborate. But Guam needs advocacy. And I think uh, that, that's a stronger yeah. message. But we'll see how it turns yeah. out. Do you know, you know in, 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 a, in addition to what's going on, in, uh, everybody in the United States is in agreement that the House is turning Republican. And it gives a great no, opportunity. I'm not in agreement it, with that. Yeah, it gives a great <laughs> opportunity. Uh, for Guam, because uh, seats will be open in, in important committees, so it, it'll, it'll, Jim's going to have a great opportunity into uh, start dating, uh, getting into committees that normally would be extremely hard to get to, just because we have now new openings and we're part of the majority. Yeah. Since, since I got you both here, uh, I want to get after in a little bit uh, talk a little bit about the national mm -hmm. the national election. But let's, let's turn to the legislature. We've got so sure. far. If it holds, and it's, of course, still very early, it looks like it will remain uh, in Democratic hands uh, 8 to 7. Yeah, uh, I think it's too early to sell. Yeah, too early to sell. But uh, I can tell you. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's good. Obviously, the Democrats will maintain the majority. I think uh, it's a fairly uh, uh, good chance that the Republicans will pick up seats, six seats, maybe seven, uh, but we'll see how it turns out. Of course, I have to say that, uh, you know, some of those, uh, uh, it, it's kind of like testimony to uh, how to get attention. And I have to say that uh, uh, Roy Kanata did a really great job of doing that. Uh, Roy Kanata started early. Uh, Will Parkinson uh, did uh, also a, a pretty good job. Uh, so some, we'll, we'll see how it turns out. Um, again, but this is decoupled. Always fascinating to figure out how the an at-large election works in a, when you have two parties that are going against each mm -hmm. other, but in actuality, you have 30 candidates that are running, all kind of running against each other, even though they're two teams, they're mm -hmm. not running directly. Uh, in, in, and so it's always, uh, it's a, it's a, that's an, uh, a healthy lesson in a democracy, yeah. I would yeah. say. One, one of the things that sticks out to me is of the newcomers, because you know there was I think about five seats that were vacated by incumbents. So um, and they were replaced by five newcomers, all coming from the uh, Democratic Party. It suggests that maybe the Republicans need to. Well, Tom Fisher. Well, except for Tom Fisher, you're right. Um, to build up the base. I, th I think bench, rather. I, I think we have a, a good bench. We have a, a large number of uh, senatorial candidates the first time running for them and uh, in, for elected office, and I think they, they're performing very well. We'll see how this moves up across the day. Uh, I, I've always said it's going to be a, a seven, eight. It's going to depend on how the other races come, but uh, but uh, I, I I don't see 
a nine six. I, I, it, this is going to probably be seven eighty, the Democrat or Republican. And uh, for me, also very interesting, the number one, the number two vote getters. You know, openly, people that have been uh, having concerns and problems with uh, Governor Lulu and Guerrero, been critical of her positions and issues to the past. Uh, I think uh, Chris Barnett uh, even refused to endorse the, her in the process. So it, you look at that, you and uh, and then you it's uh, then you look at the Republican candidates that are up there. There, it's it's a it's an interesting legislature that's going to be formed. I think there'll be a, a very independent voice, and I, and I think the governor was very smart in saying that she's going to end the pandemic. I have a good feeling that you could see a coalition uh, later. What do you think about on. that, Dr. Underwood? Well, at the end of the day, they're still Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> that's the point. That, that's the point. And if they, if they wanted to be really in opposition to the governor, they would have ran yeah. on the other side. So uh, Therese Derlahi comes from a strong Democratic tradition. Chris Barnett, of course, very popular man, and he's also a Democrat. So at the end of the day, they're going to follow Democrat policies. Are they going to fight? Hell yeah, they're going to fight. Are they going to have arguments? Hell yeah, they're going to have arguments. But at the end of the day, they're still Democrats. And, and you're, um, you're absolutely correct. The, the Democratic Party has a reach into young people that I believe that the Republican Party needs to kind of work on. Because I think that the, uh, the, the, the bench, the farm team, who's coming up, who's coming up next? is really is important because, you know, the governor, of course, uh, and assuming that Governor uh, Leon Guerrero uh, prevails, then she'll have the opportunity to cultivate others who may be interested in those seats, and we'll see how the, the mayor's races turn out as well. All right. Uh, let's move on to the, to the national elections. Uh, those are underway right now very early on the, on the East Coast. Um, um, Congressman Underwood, uh, you came into uh, office uh, as delegate for Guam in 1993. Right. You had a speaker who was a Democrat, uh, Speaker Foley, and then you got Gingrich uh, a couple yeah, of ter terms yeah, later. Yeah. Tell, tell us, first got of all, wiped out. <laughs> yeah, tell us, first of all, uh, uh, about that situation and how that transpired, because it was, again, in a um, midterm where the um, uh, kind of a rebuff of the president who was Clinton right. at the time, yeah. right? So, you know, historically, uh, this, this is, uh, you know, everyone is predicting and, and the polls seem to sustain that, that historically there's always a switch in the first two years. It happened under Trump. It happened under uh, all previous presidents except uh, George Bush because of the, uh, I, I think in large part because of 9-11. 9-11, yeah. But, uh, 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 we'll see how it turns out because we don't the national politics now is like in a sense like local politics here it's so shaped by uh, things that are not traditionally media driven that are not traditionally part of a common conversation it's like everybody's having a conversation on their own and they're kind of springing it on each other so we'll see how that turns out uh, you know uh, the role of early voting. We've had 42 million people vote early. Uh, that's a lot of people. We don't know how that's uh, going to end up, uh, how, uh, you know, presumably, but in some states, I think in, in one state, uh, the Republicans did better in early voting. I think it was in Florida. But in the other states, the Democrats did fairly well. So we'll see how it turns out. What happens is that in this instance, I believe that. Uh, even if the Republicans take the House, then it will depend on what they do in power with that House. If they uh, spend a lot of time uh, going after uh, Biden and the administration, it's to be expected at some level. Uh, but if they, uh, if they empower someone like Marjorie uh, Green, you know, uh, Lauren Boebert, if they empower those people, uh, then, uh, then the next election might uh, see a consequence for that. So, so, Carlos, so is, is, is so, if the Republicans take over and if McCarthy becomes Speaker, is he going to allow what uh, the, the Congressman has said, uh, well, the, the far right elements like uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene to have yeah, their, their, so, their voice? So, in so, for, so for all, first of all, I'm in, in, in regular conversations with uh, uh, Minority Leader McCarthy and who has met with Jim Moylan and has a very good relationship with him. And uh, unfortunately, he was, he was extremely busy and couldn't do a radio call. He was uh, scheduled to do a call here and endorse him in the process. Right, but I'll more. tell you, I'll tell you <laughs> just very, very simple. You're going to have a leadership in the House that cares about the territories, that's going to really look at making a difference, working with the first 
Republican congressman for Guam in over 30 years in addressing our biggest concerns and, uh, and getting our economy going in the right direction. So we're excited about that uh, moving forward. When you look in the House, every prognosticator in, in, in D.C. is saying at least a 31 vote, pick, 30 my member pickup. They need five members to take over the majority. So it's absolutely happening. It could go up to 56, depending on how good tonight is. Uh, so to, to say that we don't know, it's, 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 in, it's, it's unrealistic. The other part of the Democratic Party, the other problem the Democratic Party has is they had around 35 of the senior members of the House retired. <coughs> so now they're getting this new voices of right, AOC and the radical left of the party who's going to take control of the minority. And it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how they act and how they interact as, as they finally find themselves on, 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 the, on being a minority, not the majority of, of, of Congress. On the Senate side, uh, it looks like 53 Republican votes. I think if, if it, uh, definitely will be do over 51. So it'll be interesting to see us take both, both houses. It's, it's interesting. Um, like, like Congressman Underwood brings up uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and, and you bring up AOC. What about what happened to uh, governing from the middle here? <laughs> well, here, here's what's going on. It's, we already, we've already seen the high water mark of someone like AOC. They're in the majority. And, and, and you've so, seen, so when and she you said seen, that and you've seen, you've seen leadership like Nancy Pelosi manage that in a way that benefits the country. We haven't seen Marjorie Taylor Greene empowered under a Speaker McCarthy or Lauren Boebert or any of these uh, characters. And it's important to note that of all the kind of uh, 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 language that normalizes violence, that normalizes uh, 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 stigmatizing the other side, it's in it, the, the Republicans are the ones that are normalizing this violent language. And that's the, that's the problem. So Stop what's, going to happen, what's going to happen is that, uh, is that it looks like the House will go that way. It, the, the Senate, of course, is still open to question. Uh, I, I hate to say this, but uh, we might be here uh, on December 6th trying to figure out the uh, runoff in Georgia, and, uh, and that might decide uh, who has the Senate. But, but I, I think, you know, stick to the Democratic side and don't keep trying to gaslight the Republican side. You know, if, if you want to go, go there, AOC said sec sex work is work and that it should be legalized and exp expressed around the United States. That's the type of yeah, business well, that yeah, go on your side no, and you no, say no, that you, that was You, you have, was you have allowed? candidates for Congress on the Republican side that want to set up rape panels, mm -hmm. that want to set up rape panels to decide whether a woman should have be entitled to an abortion or not, or can make that decision on her own. Now, tell me, what kind of party would allow that to go on? Mm -hmm. Do, do, you, do you think that issue, the, the, the decision by um, the, the Supreme Court to overturn raid, uh, to row rather, mm -hmm. um, will that bring out more votes um, for, the, for, for the Democrats? Well, it would have. It, I think it did initially. I think it energized them. But of course, we don't know now. It seems to have dissipated somewhat. But every time you have a, a candidate, a Republican candidate, say, let's have a rape panel or let's convene a panel to help a woman decide. Or when uh, uh, Oz says, uh, you know, a decision about abortion should be between uh, the doctor, the woman, and local politicians. Anytime you have that, you know, it scares people. And so the, the, the sentiment that's pretty strong out there is that women feel that they have to protect their daughters from rights that their grandmothers had. So, so, so we, basically, the, we, the we do have we do have um, some national coverage uh, that after after of course the, the local coverage. We're going to bring that up, but go ahead and, and respond to that. Yeah. So the Democratic Party tried to demonize the the, the ruling on the United States Supreme Court, and what happened was that all that ruling said it was left to the state legislatures to decide how the abortion rights issue was going to be managed on their state, and as state legislatures across the United States ended up with rational and natural issues. They said, you know what, it, 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 didn't, it wasn't this huge uh, over, overturn and big issue going on, so it, it waited. What really came across was the economy. The Democrats bet the farm, 
part of the reason they're losing today is because they, they overhype and they over centralized what it was going on, which is with Lin the with the which Congressman Underwood is doing right now. No, bring Lindsey, it again. Lin Lindsey Graham introduced <laughs> legislation to ban abortion nationally. Yeah. He didn't. He, he at first he said states should be allowed to do this, but now he wants to move nationally. Now imagine that you turn over the reins of power to people mm. like this. Well, that's well, not that's not demonizing. And then you have Rick Scott who says who wants to put a five year time limit on Social Security and Medicare. And those of you who who are entitled to those benefits, you don't ha you don't have to be demonized. These people, you just have to be afraid of your future so, and concerned so, about so, your future. So McCarthy will be the, the majority leader in the Speaker of the House. And we'll have the next two years, and we'll see what you're saying is true or not. Is it, and then we can sit there. But the All election's right. going on today. All right. I love it when you both are here. Great conversation. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but we will, as I mentioned earlier, have uh, more on, on the national coverage of the national elections uh, after our local coverage. But thank you very much, Dr. Underwood and thank you. Juan, Juan Carlos. Appreciate your time. Uh, we're going to take a short break Appreciate and be back. I think we've got some, some new results. We're going to go up to Maguila and, and uh, give those to you. Uh, Right after this break, stay with us. It's a 55. Mariana's artists, activists, and visionaries, and their quest to protect, preserve, and promote our Chimoto culture on The Culture Club, a weekly feature on KYMU's digital platform and the KYMU's Weekend Edition. Culture Club is brought to you by Tropical Ice, the purest, cleanest ice in Guam. The Culture Club, winner of the 2022 Regional Edward R. Murrow Award for Excellence in Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. It's coming. The time of year we've all been waiting for. Prepare yourself. Because on November 25th, 2022. Breeze 93.9 FM goes strictly Christmas. All day, every day through January 1st. So get ready for Christmas music 24-7 on the stations playing the soundtrack of your life. Today I'm Nick Delgado here at the University of Guam's Cowboy Fieldhouse in Manila with the third batch of results, 21 of 67 precincts now in. We're almost a third of the way of uh, third of the way there, uh, and with the results for the gubernatorial race, Leon Guerrero Sonorio, 5,854 votes or 55.2 percent. Camacho at 4,687 votes or 44. percent 2%. Again, Leon Guerrero Tenorio, 5,854. Camacho Ada, 4,687. Again, that's 54 compared to 44%. Still a pretty close race, about a third of the way again for the uh, ballots counted so far. For the non delegate race, we have 
James Moylan with 5,497 votes or 52.5 percent and Judy Wampat 4,876 votes or 46.6 percent. In the senatorial race we still have a similar lineup for the senatorial candidates here with uh, Speaker Teresa Lahi at 6,953 votes, Daryl Chris Barnett 6,830 votes, Amanda Shelton 5,468 votes, Joe St. Augustine with 5,341 votes, Tina Munya Barnes 5,288 votes, Frank Blas Jr. 4,981 votes, 4,678 votes for Tom Fisher, 4,404. 4,411 rather votes for Roy Kanata, Chris Duenas 4,406, William Parkinson 4,123, Tello Taitagui 4,915, Sabina Perez 3,857, Joanne Brown 3,828, Monosilva Tyron 3,726, Dwayne St. Nicholas 3,711, Jesse Lujan 3,701, Kelly Marsh Tights Snow, 3,604. Sarah Thomas Nettedog, 3,543. 3,506 for Vince Borja. Jose Pito Terlahi, 3,480 votes. Fred Berdalio Jr., 3,434 votes. Michelle Tights Snow, 3,172 votes. 3,131 votes for John Savares. Shirley Mabini Young with 2,909 votes. Angela Santos, 2,878 votes. Joaquin Leon Guerrero, 2,874 votes. Sandra Sal, 2,559 votes. Nisha Mendiola, 2,443 votes. David Crisosimo, 2,283 votes. And Ian Catling with 1,181 votes. For the nonpartisan race in the Attorney General candidates, leaving Camacho, the incumbent still leading, uh, not by that much, though, 4,825 votes or 46.8% of the votes there. And Doug Moylan coming up behind him at 4,601 votes or 44.6%. Total number of write-ins so far, 874 votes for that race. The Guam Education Board, Dr. Mario Okada with 6,743 votes. Peter Lexisada, 5308. Ron McNinch, 4,872. Angel Sablon, 4,663. Maria Gutierrez, 4,077. Alordis Benevente, 3,930. Elaine Ujoa, 3,380. Uh, Rainet, uh, Rainetti Camacho at 3,231 and Joseph Santos at 3,147. In the CCU race, we have Simon Sanchez at 5,202 votes, 4,171 for Michael Limtiago, Francis Santos 3,870 votes, Michael, uh, Melvin Duenas 3,580, Nonito Blas 3,507, Ricardo Ampinko. 3,176. Again, this is 21 of 67 of the precincts counted so far. The voter turnout total about 17 percent, and this is some of the larger villages that we're seeing coming out of these first third of ballots that have been counted and ran through the tabulation machines. The bigger villages we're hearing come from Barragada, Tomining, the rest smaller villages like we see uh, MTM, Orach, Halampago as well, but dead it out. The largest number of registered voters there out of the 60,462 still has yet to be finalized and that of course this is all coming after the third batch of results that we're seeing thus far but again the main ticket race that everyone's watching is for the gubernatorial race the young Tenorial team with 5,854 uh, votes Camacho Ada with 4,687 votes I want to see if I can get some of those because we do see that while we're uh, seeing the ballot boxes being stacked up here. We also have some of the representatives uh, from the uh, different camps here. So uh, you see a lot of the counting going on here. Chris, cool. I can have you. Real quick, uh, we have the Democratic uh, Party of Guam, Chris Carrillo. Thank you for joining us at moment's notice. Uh, taking a look at the numbers so far, what are you, what are you thinking? It's very encouraging. Uh, we think that, the, we think that uh, the governor is actually doing real well. She widened her margin this time. And the legislature, we are up to a 9-6 majority for the Democrats, so we feel that that's positive. Judy Wampat is still in striking distance. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the South hasn't come in yet, and we know that the Democrats are going to perform well down there. 
So we're very encouraged. We know that the governor and her messages got out, and the legislature, all of the candidates, are looking very well. Um, we're, 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 we're looking forward to a, a clean sweep uh, and trying to get a supermajority in the legislature. A supermajority, clean sweep, of course, no matter what party side you're on. That's the hopeful outcome, but it's looking pretty tight for all the races, and especially for the senatorial candidates and the number of those that are in the top 15 on both sides. Correct. But if you look at if you look at the villages that came out, we have a lot of Barragada, we have a lot of Timuning, we have a lot of we have some Ongmong Totumaiti, we have some very Republican rich villages that came out. The Democrat villages still haven't come out yet, so I think that we have a good shot. Aganya Heights hasn't come out in force yet. We don't have all of Jotnia, we don't have any of Talafufu. So we'll see Umatic. There's a lot of villages, a lot of, the night's still young and we think yeah. We're really confident that, uh, you know, it's going to be difficult for the, the gubernatorial candidates to make it up. I think that it's pretty, it's, it's a pretty clear race and it's widened every time. So yeah. if that follows that trend, then we'll have a Democrat back in Adeloup and we'll hold the majority and we'll send the Democrat over to Washington, D.C. Only the first couple of hours, of course, in. And Chris Carrillo with the Democratic Party of Guam, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And again, I want to remind you to recap real quick the numbers for the gubernatorial race. The Yonga Royal Tenorio, 5,854. Camacho Adat, 4,687. I want to bring in now uh, the man who's been behind the Camacho Adat campaign for the past month and along the campaign trail, Shango Matauto half a day. Hey, uh, good uh, if it is morning, morning. now. Yes, good morning. What are you thinking about the numbers we're seeing thus far? As, as we look at the numbers, uh, there's still... Uh, I, actually, let me go backwards a little bit. I think the um, biggest thing that we had talked about uh, on the Hub for the last couple of weeks was voter turnout. Mm -hmm. And right now, uh, the biggest concern I think this whole community should be looking at is this turnout. It hasn't... Uh, we had all anticipated it to be a bit bigger uh, than the primary, but we're almost on a collision course for what could be uh, a, an outcome similar to the primary. And, I think every single one of us that, uh, that voted today and those who didn't vote today uh, should be absolutely concerned about the voter turnout uh, for this uh, 2022 general election. I think what the GC appears or what they claimed what they were hopeful for was the early voters, more than 7,000 they saw. Uh, for them, that seemed pretty high. Well, you know, um, I'll put my, put my neck on the line, but I think that it, getting back to basics would probably be, would be best. I know we, we were coming off of the pandemic, but when we think about these opportunities, um, we've seen it only progress lower and lower. Um, and I, I think for most of us who've been around for a couple of big cycles, um, getting back to basics might might have to be the next uh, uh, part of the agenda for the GEC because something has happened and uh, voter uh, apathy, voter turnout, yeah. it's, uh, it's as different and it's... Uh, it, it's we're seeing it now at, at work. Yeah. And Sean, help me bring it on home here real quick for the third batch. Camacho at it, not too far behind. Four thousand six hundred eighty-seven votes behind uh, Leongaro Tenorio with their five thousand eight hundred fifty-four votes. The Camacho at it team over at the camp are Daniel Perez there as well. We're hearing war. They're waiting to speak with the with the media, with the public until after the final votes come in. But what's the uh, feeling that you're getting from them? Uh, back there. I think we're, we're all watching the numbers. I think that the biggest thing for us is, again, Tumuning has already came through uh, Barragata for the most part, but now uh, all eyes now are on Derido and Jigo. Uh, those are the two, uh, the big uh, voter or, you know, uh, ballot rich, uh, you know, districts are left, yeah. but we cannot rule out Agate. We cannot rule Santa Rita out. Uh, yes, there, the southern villages are, are out there still to, in play, but uh, Derido Jigo still, uh, still hasn't uh, come in yet. So, uh, we'll just have to keep keep watching it until uh, you know it, see what see, see what happens from those two villages. Yeah, Shango Tato, thank you so much for your time, and we'll be speaking with you later in the night. Again, a uh, tight race still for the Angulo Tenorio, 5,854 votes or 55.2 percent. Camacho out of 4,687 votes or 44. 0.2%. And while you heard from both camps, both both party representatives here, that they're waiting for the bigger uh, districts to come in from Jigo and Dededo. Still, it's anybody's race. The, the numbers and the votes from all of the other polling sites, they matter too. We'll send it back to you for now until we get the next batch of results.
All right. Thanks a lot, Nick. Nick uh, Delgado reporting live from uh, the Mangila Election Central. And joining us now in studio, we have uh, Ginger Cruz, Senior Advisor to the uh, Leon Guerrero uh, Tenorio campaign and former Republican Senator and longtime CCU member and probably, well, you will be in, in the next <laughs> are, CCU are you as well. According, <laughs> according to the numbers, <laughs> uh, Simon Sanchez. Thanks for joining us, guys. And as, as Sean Gumatato was saying there, but he's uh, watching the numbers and Two of my favorite number crunchers are sitting right here next to me. So, Ginger, uh, let's uh, start with you. Uh, uh, take a look at the uh, demo, uh, the uh, gubernatorial race first, and yes. what what do the what do the numbers tell you right now? So we see this, this, this is the latest results right there. Five All eight right, five so, four to four six eight seven. Yep. So if you're looking at those numbers, it's a uh, fifty five forty four. So. That is an extremely solid uh, lead. So if you look at all of the gubernatorial elections since 1970, the average that the winner has taken the, the seat is 53.38%. So we're above the average, which is great. Um, so that is a very strong, solid lead for the Leon Guerrero Tenorio camp. They are the incumbent team. There were a lot of wild cards this time because, of course, COVID caused such incredible changes on the island. I mean, nobody could have forecast that we would go down to zero tourists and shut everything down and have people have to wear masks. I mean, it's, it's unprecedented in recent his, in, in history, really, in, in modern history. Um, so this was really a bit of a referendum, I think, on how Lou and Josh handled the pandemic and I think that the Camacho Ada team really wanted to make that also a referendum. I mean they, they put that out there like what do people think about how they handled it um, and, and I think as you look at the numbers you can see that people generally felt that they they did what they needed to do and I think we got our base. I think we've gotten a couple of crossover votes. I think right now the way it's trending um, we're extremely pleased with the way things are looking. Simon, I saw you there nodding your head. Uh, what do you, in, how do you interpret these uh, numbers in the gubernatorial race? So, um, from what I've seen, and assuming that they're accurate, uh, you know, there's two war rooms going on right now uh, at Governor Camacho's uh, area of headquarters and, and at Lou and Josh's headquarters. And what they're really looking at is the precincts, right? Uh, because um, th there's a game you play where if I won by 2,000 votes in 2018 and I won precinct seven, right by 100 votes but i only win it by 50 votes this time oh my 2000 is now 1950 and, and you begin to because that's all you can do when you only have partial results right. i think the concerns if i was in the uh, camacho uh, war room is that if if this information is correct all of tamuning has has come in and and all but one of barragata has come in and they've generally leaned uh, republican right um and uh, we can talk about it later. I'll look it up now that I see some of these villages. But that's probably why some expected. I, I think Dr. McNich's poll shows a bigger gap. And and you know pre-polling is hard. Uh, exit polling is a little usually a little more mm -hmm. accurate. Um, but it could be at this point since they've counted villages and precincts that are lean more Republican. Maybe that's why the gap isn't 60-40. It's 55-45. Uh, but of course, if you're uh, Governor Camacho, you're 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 still you know worried, right? And if you're Governor Liu, you're encouraged. And uh, one of the things that Governor Liu, Governor Liu uh, destroyed two myths in 2018. She was the first governor to be elected governor and lose Dededo. Now, if you're Governor Felix, who didn't lose Dededo in 2006 and 2002, he's saying to himself, okay, maybe Dededo is going to close that gap because she lost it four years ago. So I'm, he, he's really going to be interested in what Dededo does, because I think as Dr. Underwood alluded to, there's a lot of Democrat, traditionally Democratic precincts that, that haven't been counted yet. Mm -hmm. So uh, if there's any hope for Governor Camacho at this point, I think he would be looking at Dededo as one huge key village, and it's the largest village in terms of, of voter voters. And, uh, and yet he's battling an, an incumbent Governor Liu, who lost Dededo had a huge split in the party, which was another rule. If, if your party split, you lose, right? Well, Frank Elgin and Alicia Limtiaco ran a huge campaign in 2018, even a write-in campaign. And when you put the numbers together, Governor Liu only won 51 to 49 in 2018. She only won by, I think, 1,700 votes, right? So if everyone does exactly what they did in 2018 today, then she's only going to win 51-49. You know, and, and that's kind of the, the art of the game. You start watching, well, where did... Where did all the Frank Elgin supporters go, right? Um, and did Governor Lou keep her 12,000 from the primary? 
did all 7,000 uh, Mike's and Nicholas votes go over to, to Felix, and then it would be 12,000 12, to 10,000, rough, you know, summarizing it, right? Mm -hmm. Which is still 55, 45. And then what was turnout today? And we've talked about this. The average turnout since 2010, and I'm fortunate to run with every gubernatorial election, so I get to see these numbers. It's still been 72%, right? And we've been lamenting that the decline over time when Ginger and I and you were much younger, and Guam would vote in the 70s and 80s, but now we've had a, a couple of dips in the high 60s, low 70s, right? And so we're going to see what, what was the turnout today. And it's hard to tell. It's, it's a little misleading sometimes, uh, and you're forced to do it this way, when it says only 9% turnout, you yeah. know, because what you really want to look at is what was the turnout in each Overall, precinct, yeah. in, right. in each of these precincts. And how many and, have reported? 20, 20 20, precincts? We got 21. And that's okay. a fascinating point, yeah. Ginger, that uh, Simon brought up. You can lose Dedido and still win the election? She's the first one, Governor Lou. So it's it's really interesting. I mean, everybody knows that Dedido is the largest village, right? So you look at it demographically, and it's really one of the largest. But when you look at the number of voters um, and you look at how they registered in 2022 versus, let's say, four years ago or eight years ago, there's been a slight decline in the south, a slight uptick in the number of people in the north, but the interesting thing that balances that out and pushes it in the other direction is turnout. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the turnout in the north, the turnout is historically very low, mm -hmm. 30 to 40 percent. Mm -hmm. If you look at turnout in the south, it's extremely high, mm -hmm. 70 percent, in some cases, 80 percent. But a smaller so, population. But yeah, a but smaller population, is, right. It's not small exactly. enough to overcome. So, right. Yeah, right. But no, but it is. So it shifts it. So I actually ran the numbers. And when you just take the raw numbers of voters and you see the increased voter turnout in the south versus the smaller population and you compare it against the lower turnout in the north you actually find that there is more strength coming from the south than the north i mean in just in in pure numbers it's a small it's a so small it, it, percentage and ginger's right it will depend if, if dedito turns out right then, then they're going to have a greater <laughs> influence but you know, I've been in a number of war rooms, win winning war rooms and losing war rooms, and, and I would still say that Dedido, Jigo, Tamuning, uh, you know, those are the largest blocks of votes, so you, you want to watch them. Mm -hmm. And, and Dedido, Dedido's challenge, and, and God bless the Guam Election Commission, because it's, it's a tough challenge, is I think now they have three polling sites. Mm -hmm. There was one time we went from 67 precincts down to 53 precincts, right? Mm -hmm. But they, then they couldn't get the vote out in Dedito fast enough because people would pull in to League One Terrace or Wedding Gale, and the line was the so lines. long and they would get discouraged. So they, they added more precincts to try to make it easier to vote. Today you could go to Ukudu, right? And that helps Dedito come to the polls. But Dedito is just this big, huge block of voters that, and many of them work, uh, and they get off at three or four, and do they make it by eight o'clock? And if they pull up the wedding gale and the line's back to Marine Drive, they're gonna go, I'm gonna go eat, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so that, so Ginger's, I think, captured a, a reality of life that the voters of Dededo are challenged because one, there's so many of them, uh, and uh, you know, how many polling places can you get to so that people can get through quickly? But I will say, and again, it's anecdotal, right? I, I was able to do the, the island tour today. It was beautiful weather, which was good, right? Uh, beautiful for golf. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful for golf. For golf yeah. That's tomorrow at noon, right? If, if I make it, wake up. Uh, but the, um, and two dynamic candidates, right? You got a two-time governor uh, and a, and a one-time governor. And, and, you know, they've governed 12 of the last 20 years on, on Guam, and I've been in the CCU 20 years now, and so I, I, I've watched, you know, we know Governor Felix, we know Governor Lou, you know, I, I joked with Patty Arroyo this morning, I said, here's my one prediction, the governor's going to come from Tamuni, right, because they both live in Tamuni, right? <laughs> and they both voted at JFK <laughs> at the same, same time. time. Yeah. And I, I think they did that on purpose, right, you know, because you're also listening to, so what, what did my opponent say over there to KUAM and, you know, and, 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 and vice versa, right? But two dynamic candidates that have won before and lost before. Yeah. Governor Lou has lost before as a lieutenant governor candidate. Governor Felix has lost before as a lieutenant governor candidate. He ran for Congress. I forgot. He ran for Congress. He's a vet. He's won. He's lost. He, he understands this game, right? And, and being governor is the hardest job on Guam. And, and I try to caution folks that, you know, the demonizing of, of, of the elected official, right? Felix and Lou love Guam. They've busted their butt for this island. They have sacrificed tremendously. It's, it's so hard to, to run for public office, much less run for governor, right? And yet they've both done it. 
They've both won. They've experienced loss. And here they are. It's Frazier versus Ali, right? <laughs> Seven, right? The, the, the thriller in Barragata, right? And uh, they're going at it again, right? The, 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 the blocks of interest groups, the Republicans versus the Democrats, with strong leaders. So there was a lot of activity in the, at the poll sites. Both Everybody had tents. Food was good. God bless the North, but I still eat down South. I'm sorry. It's, it's, just, they just, it's just got a little more zing to it, right? But they were energized, and, and we had great weather. And hopefully that produces turnout, because we really want turnout. We want to know what the people of Guam, you know, whom do you wish to lead you uh, as a governor to serve you in the legislature uh, to hopefully lower that damn power bill in, in the CCU? Right. Hold, hold that thought, because I think, I think we've got results. We've got so much more to, to, to talk oh. about, though. But I think uh, oh, we're going we to go to Nick in a, in a, in a few. Yeah. Okay, we're okay. going to process those numbers, but we do have some new numbers. Uh, Ginger, um, you had something to say. So I actually do have those numbers. So I went back through and I looked at Dededo and Gigo. So if you look at okay. Dededo and Gigo, they are 35% of the registered voters, but 29% of the votes cast in the last election. If you look at the South, they have 26% of the registered voters, but are 31% of the votes cast in the election. So, I mean, th there's actual numbers. And again, you're, you're talking- the 29 trumps the 26, right? The, the, in absolute the, numbers, even. Right? Well, no, so it means the South has more of, so the South has 31 and the North has 29 in terms of votes cast. Mm -hmm. Even though there is an 11, no, a nine-point spread in terms of registered voters. Anyways, too many numbers. But okay. just to say, when the South comes rolling in, I think you're going to see more strength for the Democrat side because they tend to do really well in the okay, South. Okay, hold, hold those thoughts, and uh, we're going to check in with, with Nick now with, with the latest numbers. All right, Nick, all yours. Hey, yeah, the uh, latest results now. Batch number four, this is 30 of 67 of the precincts that have been counted thus far. And Leon Guerrero Tenorio a leading, a, taking a further step away from the Camacho Ada team now with 8,358 votes. Leon Guerrero Tenorio, 8,358 votes or 55.4%. Camacho Ada with 6,653 votes or 44.12%. Uh, the non-delegate uh, Candidates at James Moylan, 7,769 over Judy Wampat at 7,011. Uh, in the senatorial race, similar numbers, uh, similar lineup that we're seeing here with uh, Therese Terlahi, 9,922 votes. Daryl Chris Barnett, 9,668. Amanda Shelton, 7,896. Joe St. Augustine, 7,797. Tina Munya Barnes, 7,535. Frank Blas Jr., 7,022. 6,560 for Tom Fisher. Roy Kanata, 6,152. 6,020 for William Parkinson. Dwayne Siniklis, 5,558. Sabina Perez, 5,548. Tello Tidegui, 5,537. Joanne Brown, 5,462. Uh, Jesse Lujan, 5,379, 5,238 for Kelly Marsh Titano, Marianne Silva Tyron, 5,232, Sarah Thomas Nedadog, 5,158, 4,900 for Fred Berdalio Jr., Vincent Borja, 4,888, Jose Terlahi, 4,877, John Savaris, 4,738, Michelle Titano, 4,563. Shirley Mavini Young, 4,325. 4,055 for Angela Santos. 3,984 votes for Joaquin Leon Guerrero. Sandra Sao, 3,535 votes. Vishra Mendiola, 3,436 votes. David Chrysostomo, 3,126 votes. And Ian Catling, 1,600 and 78 votes and a total of 267 ridings for the legislative race there. Now, over to the nonpartisan race, the attorney general candidates, starting with Levin Camacho, 6,862 votes, Doug Moylan, 6,606 votes, 
and a total write-in number of 1,236 votes. That's for the nonpartisan race for AG. Again, Camacho, 6,862. Moylan, 6,606. The Guam Education Board, Mary Okada, 9,558. Peter Adat, 7,639. Ron McNinch, 6,839. 6,771 for Angel Sablon, Maria Gutierrez, 5,965, Lourdes Benaventi, 5,757, Elaine Ujoa, 4,876, Renati Camacho, 4,585, and Joseph Santos, 4,529. For the CCU race, Simon Sanchez, 7,420, 5,905 for Mike Limpiaco, Francis Santos, 5,530. Melvin Duenas, 5,115. Nonito Blas, 5,052. And Ricardo Umpinko, 4,535 votes. Again, this is 30 of the 67 precincts that have come in so far. About 25% of the voter turnout that we've uh, been tallied thus far. But again, the race to look for the Don Guerrero Tenorio team at 8,358 votes or 55 Point forty two per cent at Camacho Attic, six thousand six hundred and fifty three votes or forty four point twelve percent our next batch of results coming up soon and we'll bring it to you as soon as we get them. I'll send it back to you in the studio. All right, thanks Nick. Uh, we'll check in with you as soon as we got some new numbers, but uh, I got my number crunchers working on this <laughs> feverishly right now. Thirty uh, precincts uh, reporting out of a uh, 67, uh, let me just recap the numbers real quick before we discuss them. Um, Leon Guerrero Tenorio, 8,358 or 55.42% of the vote. Camacho Ada, 6,653, 44.1%. That's the gubernatorial race, of course. In the uh, non-voting delegate to the House of Representatives, uh, uh, Senator uh, Jim Moylan, Republican, 7,769 or 52.19%. A Democrat, former Speaker Judy Wanpat, 7,011 votes or 47.09%. Um, not going to read all of the numbers, but um, let me go through the top 15 on the legislative race. Um, Teresa Lai, the Speaker, uh, in the first place. Second place, uh, Chris Barnett, followed by Amanda Shelton, Joseph Augustine, and Tina Barnes. That's the top five all Democrats. The top Republican, Frank Bloss Jr., number six. Uh, Attorney Tom Fisher, number seven, both Republicans. Uh, Democrat newcomer Roy Kinata, number, uh, followed by uh, Republican Chris Duenas, Democrat Don Parkinson, Democrat uh, Dwayne Sinicholas, cracking into the top 15. Uh, incumbent Sabina Perez, uh, Democrat, and then uh, rounding out the bottom three of the 15 are uh, incumbent Tella Tidegui, incumbent uh, Joanne Brown, and in former Senator uh, Republican uh, Jesse Lujan. Okay, uh, Ginger, let me start with you. Um, the latest numbers uh, show uh, 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 the, the lead widening a bit. Um, what, what's your thoughts on that? Again, the lead is widening. It's interesting to see how the numbers are coming in. They're not necessarily geographically you know, situated. So there is a bit of skewing, uh, but I think it is really hardening. And again, what we're seeing is 55 to 44 is a very, very solid showing. Um, if you look at the whole history of, of Guam's elections, I mean, that is a mandate. That says that you did your job right, and the people of Guam want you to come back. They want to give you the eight years. They want to see what you can do. And in this case, you know, two years was stolen by COVID, so it will be uh, a good thing to be able to really see how the Lou and Josh team can, can take that and move with it. Um, on the on the non-voting delegate to the House of Reps, I mean, that was a little bit of a surprise. I think all of the tracking polls and all of the exit polls that were looked at had Judy Wampat up over Jim Moylan. Um, and I sort of look at that and I say that the massive amount of spending um, on a rash of negative ads towards the last two to three weeks um, could be responsible for what we're seeing in the numbers because, I mean, usually those those tracking polls are, are not always perfectly accurate, but they do give you a good indication. Mm -hmm. And we were actually seeing those numbers come down a little bit as we were progressing through the week. So I think that's what you see there. Yeah. Um, and then you see a strong Democrat showing in the legislature, nine to six. Yeah, we have the congressional race up there right now, seventy-seven, sixty-nine to seven thousand eleven. Simon, how do you interpret that? 
So, I mean, it, it's, it's close, um, but uh, one of the things I note is look at how many votes the governor has. So governor Lou, 83, 58, and uh, former Speaker Judy has only 7,000. So we talked, uh, Ginger and I talked a little bit about the coattail effect afterwards. And actually, when you look, when we go to the legislature, you're going to see that the strong turnout for Governor Lou is helping the Democrats go to 9-6 at this point with, what, 45% of the precincts have reported in the aggregate, right? Like Ginger said, we're still kind of sorting out where, but, yeah. but you know, we're almost at half anyway, That's right? That's why it's so, a little right. skewed. So, yeah. It's a little skewed, but it's also when you're halfway, you're, you're not skewed that, you're not skewed that yeah. much because <laughs> half of you is not skewed. Yeah. Half of you, it is what it is, right? <laughs> but um, so uh, J Judy's got 7,000 votes. The governor's got 8,300 votes. And that, and that gap would be concerning to Speaker Juan Pat. And, and Jim Moylan is getting more votes than Camacho Atta, yeah. right? So clearly, you know, uh, Jim benefits from uh, uh, more than just Republican support. And, you know, Jim's going to be the first to tell you that I didn't get every vote of Camacho of, of Governor Camacho's backing, but he, he probably got most of it, right? Yeah. But he also apparently got some votes from, pe from people that still voted for Governor Lou that didn't vote for Judy, right? And that's why he's got this lead at, at near halftime, right? Are, are, are you saying that uh, maybe uh, uh, Speaker Juan Pat didn't uh, get as many um, uh, votes from uh, the Lou and Josh endorsement as she might have? Well, I mean, you know, we talked the it, coattail effect, which is helping yeah. the Democratic senators go to nine six, including some new names that are, are the new young Democrats uh, clearly have benefited from aligning themselves with Governor Lou. And clearly, Judy did align herself with Governor Lou. They're longtime friends and colleagues. But in the voting, right, the voters of Guam said some voters of Guam, uh, more voters said, I'll vote for Governor Lou, but I might not vote for Judy because I'll vote for Jim. And that's why he has the lead at near halftime. Was there a Talena Nelson effect? Because Talena ran against uh, mm -hmm. Judy, of course, in, in the primary. Was there a Talena Nelson effect? Well, that's the big question. Is where did her 7,000 votes go? And so far, they're trending. Some of them didn't go to Judy. And remember, she ran against Judy. So maybe if I'm a strong Talena supporter, you, you beat my Godzu, I'm going to go for the other one. You hurt or my you field, right? right? Or, or maybe. And we'll see what yeah. turnout is, right? Yeah. But, uh, but that's always the question. Where, where does the, the losing side go in a primary? And, and again, when you look at 2018, Frank Elgin and Alicia Limtiaco almost pulled off a huge upset, and, and, uh, uh, but, you know, didn't. But so uh, I think if, if I'm Speaker Juan Pat, I, I'd be concerned that uh, for whatever, for a number of reasons, and we can talk a little bit about what they might be, mm -hmm. right, it is uh, not everyone that voted for Governor Lou voted for uh, Speaker Juan Pat, and clearly some of them voted for uh, Senator Moylan, which is why he has the lead with 45% of the precincts counted. And and the other thing, we, isn't it nice to know, what is it, almost 2 o'clock and we're at 45% of the precincts. Uh, not that? having that extra ballot that the primary had to run, because yeah. they have to yeah. run that too, right, yeah. uh, is why we're getting the results so much faster. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, you know, we probably, we'll probably know very shortly in the aggregate what yeah. the final results are. You think if we get to about 67, that will pretty be much be definitive or yeah well i, I think so uh, I, I don't and we'll, we'll watch I, I that think it there's I, a lot I, of games so yeah. so right now on the senatorial side there's a lot of game i mean you've yes. got a really tight yeah. race right at the bottom yeah. so this right here is it's shifted a couple of times mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. far mm -hmm. you know, dropped out exactly Senator. so yeah. But she's you know, not that far behind, right? Right now, I would say everything, you know, 14, 15 is, is really where it's, you know, there's still... We're going to watch that all night, 14 movement. through 16. We're going to just kind of watch that's, the That's, the that's going to determine... But, well, I think... Yeah, it, you think it, it's it, it's safe to say it's in the hands of the Democrats? Or? I think it's safe. I, I, uh, the only question is whether it's 9, 6, or 8, 7. And, yeah. and what we're going to watch is, uh, like... Uh, uh, former yeah. Senator uh, Marsh Titano is yep. only 100 votes behind Jesse Lujan at 9-6. Exactly. And, and, and Mana, Mana is right behind her, six votes six behind. Six votes. So yeah. you got two former senators, but one Dem, one Republican. So right. if you're a Republican, you're going, you need Mana to get in to make it 8-7. If you're a Democrat, you're going, well, already at 9-6, and, and number 16 is a Democrat. Right. So I got a really good chance at, at protecting 9-6. Right. And, and so that, that's what we'll be watching uh, to, re to, to see who ends up leading the majority, which is key, because the majority picks the speaker, picks picks the committee chairs, that works with whoever the next governor will be, and that we're going to find out in the next couple of hours, I think, very very shortly. Yeah. Hopefully, so, sooner yeah. than later. Um, we didn't talk a lot about uh, turnout yet. Um, do, do you have any inkling of what the turnout has been or will be? So has been yes. We've, we've gotten we've some feedback. Um, okay. There's a couple of independent uh, polling sites that have told us that they yeah. had up to 68.5 percent okay. in one. Um, okay. I think Asin Maina. 
I think up in Aganya Heights, it was uh, in the upper 60s as well. Okay. So like terrorist territory. A, exactly. Turns out his vote. Exactly. So yeah. you had some that were, yeah. you know, decent. But I think what you're talking about is a continued erosion in how people are turning out. So if you look at the overall numbers of people that have turned out to vote, um, and you go back to the beginning, it was almost 90% when Guam first started to vote for governor back in, in 1970. And then if you Were look you born yet? by, <laughs> I was already. That's not polite. So. Oh, no, I was already at St. Anthony, so don't even yeah. try. She went to school with my um, sister. I did. But by my 1998, um, you, you started to see that shift. So it was in the 80s until, you know, 80% turnout, mm -hmm. high 80s, mm -hmm. until 1998, and then it dropped into the 70s. And then from basically mm -hmm. 2000, through 2016, it was in the 70s in gubernatorial years, mm -hmm. and then in 2018 it dropped to 67 percent. And I would venture to guess, just sort of looking at the numbers and seeing where it's going, I would think we're going to be in the high 60s. What would you say? That, that makes sense because in the since again since 2010 we've averaged uh, 72 percent turnout in the gubernatorials, and and because right. I run with the gubernatorials on the CCU side, I get to see all of these numbers. Mm -hmm. But but Ginger's absolutely correct on the the long term trend. In the last decade, in the last twelve years, we've averaged seventy two percent in gubernatorial years. Mm -hmm. We're hearing sixty eight percent from mm -hmm. internal information. Uh, you, you know, uh, people that are watching. The, the precinct officials for both parties, they know how many people voted in that they precinct. Do. They know the participation rate. Uh, some of them are able, at least for like the governor, they're able to do a quick, uh, uh, you know, uh, who, who's ahead, right? And then, then they call the war room and they go, hey, we, we won 1B, you know, <laughs> or we, we're behind on 3C, right? Yeah. And But if Ginger's getting some information at 68%, that's pretty close to 72%. Maybe we'll end up at 70 or lower because if Dededo can't get to the polls or didn't go to the polls today, then that 68 will, will follow. I, I'm happy that it's not, you know, we were a little nervous at the 40% primary turnout until mm -hmm. I saw the 44% primary turnout in 2014, and yet we still hit 71% or some right. number like that. Right. So again, the, the candidates energize uh, the community. And you've got two, two, two folks that have been governor 12 years, 12 of the last 20 years. And so the people of Guam know them. The very and uh, whoever is governor tomorrow, you know, I think the the people of Guam are saying we're we're pretty comfortable with either one of you, right? We're gonna, we're gonna have to pick one of you, right? But uh, that old saying, you know, better the devil you know. And Ginger brought up a really good analysis during the primary about how her generation, because she's not that young, and my generation, <laughs> and and those a little bit older than us, we're we're voting and we've been voting consistently for the last 20 years and. We, that's why we put in people we know. That's why Camachos and Calvos and Berdallos and Guterreses get elected. And when the Governor Guterres and, and the Berdallo faction stopped fighting and unified, you know, he got, he got his eight years. And Governor Liu is very much uh, uh, picking up on that. Um, you know, the, the, the long relationship between the Guterres and the Berdallo crowds went from, you know, we, we do better if we work together than if we work apart. Mm -hmm. And that's when they've been successful, right? Um, then I was always curious in this election, where, where are Frank Uggen's supporters who uh, were not with Governor Liu and were with Governor Felix, and where, were Mike, would, where would Mike's and Nicholas's supporters go? But it also shows you that, you know, just because I vote for this person in Congress doesn't mean I won't, you know, I, I will necessarily either align with that party or I might still vote for, you know, uh, Mike's and Nicholas and Governor Liu didn't get along. But that didn't mean if I voted for Mike's and Nicholas, I wouldn't vote for Governor Liu. You know, yep. and, that, and that's that, those are the questions we're asking. Like Talena Nelson's vote, where are did where are her seven thousand votes going? They're clearly going to Jim and and Speaker Wanpat, but right now, whatever that split is, it's favoring. It appears to be favoring uh, uh, Jim Moreland, Senator Jim Moreland. And you know, again, lots the games we're barely at halftime, and we need to see dead at all. Uh, but uh, you're you're getting some early indica indications of, and, of the and, trend. And, and and Felix, of course, ran unopposed in the primary, so there was a very low turnout on the Republican side. Some yes. of Republicans may have voted in, in the in, on the Democratic side. But uh, were there? Does this indicate that maybe not enough Republicans came out? The ones that didn't co show up for the primary, they just continued to stay home, or? We need to see turnout. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, if, if Ginger's right, if it's 68 to 70 percent, most of the island showed up. Yeah. The Dems, Republicans, and Independents. Okay. You know, right. we. I think the party f affiliations has also dwindled over time. I think most people consider themselves in more independent. independent. And Guam's so small. 
Right? You know, I, I went around today and, you know, I, I thank the people of Guam for their generosity to allow me to continue to serve. And, and you know, the power bill is terrible. And they, and they said, you know, I voted for you. Can you help lower that power bill? You know, versus, you know, you're a bum, you know, and get, get out of here. Because, and I think Dr. Underwood alluded to it. They, you know, everyone has gone through the oil crisis. When we went to the gas station and it was six bucks a barrel, we're no different than GPA going to Singapore at $120 a barrel. We can relate to the high cost of oil. Uh, Dr. Underwood talked about, you know, we had 100,000 people get vaccinated. So however you felt about get vax, not vax, 100,000 people out of 150,000 Guamanians went and got vaccinated for their own self-interest. They said, mm -hmm. that, you know, and the Governor Liu was leading that charge despite criticism and you know there was criticism around the globe about whether to get vaxxed or not but the overwhelming majority of the people of Guam went and got vaccinated that doesn't mean they love Governor Liu or don't love Governor Liu or Felix but they clearly went through because they they could relate to no one's making this up no one's making up COVID it's affecting my life so when somebody says it's been a tough time because of COVID they can understand that when I say it's a tough time with the power bill because the price of oil is high People understand that because when they go to the gas station, they're going, man, we're still paying more for gas today than we did a year ago. Yeah. So we, we can relate, you know, it's, it's, no, it's not spin. It's not spin that oil is making the power bill and your gas bill higher. It's not spin that there was COVID, right? It, it's what happened. And when people actually go through what candidates are saying they're talking about, yeah. uh, I think Ginger is correct that yeah. Governor Liu is seeing that, hey, we went through it too, we understand it, and right now, 55-45 is saying, you know, okay. we're, we're behind government. We're going to take a short break. I'd ask you guys to hang out here for a little while. we got a lot more to talk about. Uh, we're going to take a short break, and then we're going to go to um, Saipan and check with uh, Tomas uh, Manglonia about, maybe I think they have some results there. Um, wow. So stick around. A lot more to talk about. We're going to take a short break and be back with Tomas Manglonia in Saipan. Hello, I'm Gunnery Sergeant Ruben Tan from Marine Corps Base Camp Blas. Personally asking you to join me in supporting the Marine Corps Toys for Tots program by collecting new and unwrapped toys for children this year. The Toys for Tots program, now in its 13th year on island, has partnered with the Chamber of Commerce, Madsen Navigation Company, Catholic Social Services, and the Salvation Army to make this holiday season a time to remember for kids and teens throughout Guam. You may drop off your new and unwrapped toys between now and December 10th in any of our boxes throughout Guam or at the KOAM studio. We ask that when purchasing this year, please also remember gifts for older children and young teenagers. On behalf of the U.S. Marine Corps and the KUAM Care Force, we thank you for coming together and sharing the spirit of this holiday season.
All right, well, it's been a minute since you've heard from us here on Saipan because uh, there aren't any official results yet out online, and, but we're here to hear uh, directly from the source, uh, from the Commonwealth Election Commission Executive Director, Kayla Igatol. Kayla, can you set the scene, what's happening right now? Well, right now, um, they're tabulating uh, early voting um, ballots from Saipan. And then next, they'll move on to um, Precinct 6, Tinian, and then Rota after. And then the, the board plans to um, run both machines when we tabulate uh, election day ballots. All right, and uh, about the pace of this, uh, you know, we, we're getting lots of questions from viewers about um, the current pace. Uh, what's your comment on that? Well, we want to make sure we're doing it right, you know. So we're taking our time. The board has to review all those ballots that are being spit out of the machine because of unclear marks. So that's kind of what's holding the process as well. And in terms of uh, ballots uh, casted, you have all the early votes and you have all of the election day ballots on hand? Yes, correct. And I also have absentee as well. And so what's happening right now? And uh, can you just right describe? Now, right now, the staff are, um, op um, the board already had opened all the absentees as in, you know, we didn't tabulate anything. We just opened it to take out, retrieve the affidavits. And then the staff are pulling out the absentee requests and attaching them. Have tabulations actually started at all in terms of counting votes? Uh, right now, we're well, we're tabulating it right now, but we haven't got any results yet. And uh, the public wants to know. I, I know you. Uh, th this is all a matter of process. Uh, but when can we get the first? When when can uh, the public expect to get the first official results? Um, hopefully soon. Right. Okay, yeah. thank you so much. Thank I know you. you're busy. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And so, uh, Nestor, there you heard it from uh, the Commonwealth Election Commission. Uh, just a brief update, uh, Kayla uh, Igato, the Commonwealth Election uh, Commission uh, Executive Director, uh, really busy, so we're grateful for uh, the, the minute or two that she spared with us uh, for that update. And uh, we'll continue to bring you live coverage throughout the night and uh, bring you those results. Again, you can follow us on KUAM CNMI Instagram. Uh, we're posting updates throughout the night. and. Uh, we're, we're, we're still waiting. So, uh, Nestor, we're going to throw it back to you at the studio, and we'll check in with you later once results are finalized. All right, thanks, Tomas. Uh, we are back in the studio, of course, uh, with uh, Simon Sanchez and uh, Ginger Cruz talking numbers here. Um, so it's uh, we've got 30 uh, precincts that have reported um, almost halfway, but still much too early to make any um, it is. projections, right? It yep. is. Yep. Okay. But people have to remember, the election's already over. The, the votes are in the box. They're not changing while we're commentating, you know, and what we're watching is the counting. And so I always chuckle that, you know, he surges ahead, she falls behind. Well, no, the, the, the number is in the boxes already. It's the counting that's surging <laughs> that's and falling, right, right. Uh, the people have spoken, right, and we're, it's just the humans that are counting it. And, and God bless the election commission. The numbers yeah. are coming out so much faster. Yeah. And, you know, always remember this, that one, having one ballot, because that scanner is able to see both sides all at once, yeah. run it through. In the primary, she had to run, I forget, why do you, we have that extra ballot but we had an extra ballot for some reason and now you're running 40,000 of those right yeah. uh, and that just takes till 8 in the morning instead of till 3 in the morning yeah. but now that scanner is doing both sides and, and the good thing about Guam elections unlike national elections is we haven't really gone to 100% electronic voting where you know everybody's going what's going on in there right is, is this real vote uh, Guam can audit all of this you got the ballots themselves the mm -hmm. scanner you can run it a, a hundred times and, and and it should produce the same if it doesn't produce the same results and you then that's one and then you can hand count it if you wanted to because I, I, I forget the number but there was some some people have there's an electronic vote I actually don't know what that is I, I still voted on a paper ballot and circled in a, a circle well let me see if I can spark a debate um, in the mainland um, it's it, election reform is is one of the things that Republicans are pushing and the Democrats are saying it's an election prevention. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, we don't have that problem here, do well, we? Well, we're lucky because we're small. So you can you can do 40,000 votes in a scanning machine and be done by 6 in the morning. If you're in New York and you got to count 2 million ballots, uh, you know, you need to be more electronic, right? Yeah. And and then, of course, that's when the fight breaks out. You know, what what's really going on between the ones and the zeros when ginger pulls down the, the, the switch and again i don't even know how you do that kind of voting in the mainland you you do i guess well and it's not picking up so they're not actually going to electronic voting precisely because it is not secure mm -hmm. they are not able to guarantee that nobody's going to hack into the systems mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. because of the tension that you have going on right mm -hmm. now which you know and this is the interesting thing really nestor i mean i think the thing that is most depressing as we sit here right now 
is my fear about what's going to happen on the mainland. Because the election on the mainland, the election on Guam, I mean, bless everybody's hearts. We fight our good fight. Everybody, like, throws the daggers. But at the end of the day, we all know that the Guam Election Commission, it's people we know. We know they're doing a good job. We know it's fair. We know that the precincts got Republicans and Democrats. Everybody's looking at it. We trust the system because we know the people that are involved Mm -hmm. in the system. And so we still have that fundamental faith in our elections in Guam. You don't have that back in the mainland in so many areas. And so one of the things that I found interesting and a little bit disturbing was the crossover that you're seeing as the national Republican and Democratic parties are engaged in these national themes. When I see those themes just sort of transplanted on top of Guam, and there were some candidates and there were some discussions that were had among Guam Democrats and Republicans that were in some ways mimicking some of these lines, like, oh, we're gonna have a red wave or this or that. The 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 themes that they were using to do that, which were just kind of you know, oh, okay, crime is the thing that everybody's going against because in the States it was all about defunding the police. Well, nobody's defunding the police in Guam. That's not even a thing. They've, they've doubled the funding for police in Guam. But when they try to use those same themes and they just sort of superimpose it on Guam, and then you take this whole trend where you've got voters that instead of being the really engaged voters, you're starting to get voters that are less engaged that perhaps just sort of surf on social media, they see a couple of things, they'll get a couple of ads that are basically mimicking the ads that are going on in Arizona or California or New York or Texas. And that starts to influence how voters think and how voters vote. Um, And that's a really disturbing trend. And that's something that we really don't want to see happen on. And and I think, uh, I'm not sure it will morph that way, Uh, I mean, Guam to me has never been as partisan in terms of ideology when it comes to Democrat versus Republican. The Democratic Party emerged from a government, a Gov Guam centric uh, population because until 1963, when Kennedy finally allowed private sector to come to Guam without a permit from the Admiral, right? The only jobs to get were Gov Guam jobs. And the, the Democratic Party at its roots uh, comes from a long standing relationship as a, as with the government of Guam. When the private sector started to develop, first off, you know, Governor Joseph Flores, private private businessman, you know, first native-born Chamorro governor, a Republican appointed by Eisenhower, right? He went into business. The Cowboys are in business, right? So if you weren't in the government, you went into business. Now, 40 years ago, you know, it was like a 50-50, maybe 50 years ago, it was like a 50-50 split Gov Guam and private sector. Today, two out of every three people that have a job are in the private, private sector, sector, right? So they're not as dependent on which Gov Zoo wins the governorship per se from a party point of view. Now, I'm sure they, they have their strong feelings about why I'm voting for Governor A versus Governor B, but it's not as it's not as ideological. And as Ginger said, we all know each other. And I remember there's, um, I was told, reminded of a story today, Ping Duenas, a longtime prominent Democrat, was was running, but he had a, he had a, 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 bro, a brother that was a Republican, and he would say, vote 20, and my brother. Right? 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 Because, okay, he's standing in front of, in Dedito, in front of hardcore Bredaiocrats saying, don't vote 21, vote 20 in my one Republican uh, brother. But there's an example of, I'm partisan up to a point, but if it's my my family member, then I'm gonna I'm gonna be less partisan. And and but generally here on Guam, to me, the private sector has leaned more Republican. The public sector has leaned more Democrat. But even that's begun to really change. And, and that's more in line with, with national politics, isn't mm-hmm. it? Um, private sector generally mm-hmm. leans Republican, and, and public right, sector right, generally right. leans Right, right, right. But some of the I think right. Ginger's right about some of the hardcore ideological differences that we see in the national news, and you know, frankly, the social media. Sorry for all those social media ads, by the way, that I ran. But with social media, you're, 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 learning, you're, you're learning way too much. Almost, you know, I, I, I talk with my, my wife, Lou, as it, we're hearing opinions from people. I'm going, why do I even care about this person's opinion? But it's there in social media, right? So, so right. the amount of information that's available, which, you know, makes you angry or not angry or motivated, you know, there's just so much out there, you know, and sometimes half of which I wonder, not even true you know people make stuff up because you can type anything behind a computer right, right. but th- th- that sort of changed the amount of information people see today than they that they didn't see 
you know, 50 years ago, we, we watched Ed Sullivan, Walter Cronkite, and that was the perception of the world, right, uh, when we grew up, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I learned it with social media, you know, I put a lot of money into Google. And so if you went on Google and you like things on Google, that's why you saw my ugly face all over the place, because <laughs> that's where the eyeballs now are. Yeah. They're yeah. on social media. That's yeah. where the ears and eyes, they're on Facebook, well, although we couldn't get into Facebook, but uh, they go to Google, they go to wherever, Wherever they go, I, I, I told the story where um, we have a, a wonderful masseuse. We go to this company, a ch Chinese, and I walk in on Sunday. She goes, I saw your, your <laughs> Google ad, your, your ad on Google. And I'm saying, here's a Chinese masseuse. I don't know what she's watching on YouTube, but somehow my ad pops into it, right? Yeah. That's social media and the way to reach voters in a much different way than when we were a little younger, right? And, well, and, and it's totally changed on the financial side because, so I, I mean, it's incredible. The amount of money, I mean, I was talking about this during the primary election, the amount of money that we raised in the 98 election when I was like working million with bucks. Carl Gutierrez. No, it was $10 million. It was a big number. I it was remember. a huge no number. I know. And, <laughs> well, I mean, and, and it was a lot of, <laughs> it was a lot of energy and it was a lot of time yeah. and money that was put into but that. But it was $10 million bucks. But nowadays, you can actually reach people through social media. So if you look Look at this election, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We actually were very conservative in how many ads we ran. And mm -hmm. part of that is sensitivity to people, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, people are struggling. People don't you know, necessarily have a lot of money mm -hmm. to spend. Yep. And Times they support tougher. their candidates. And you mm -hmm. don't want to go out mm -hmm. and constantly have to ask your supporters mm -hmm. for more and more money to feed the media beast. Yeah. So if you can mm -hmm. do it for cheaper and you can get your message out, you're going to try and do that. And that was a lot of what we did. And so mm -hmm. we were able successfully to use social media to get our position out, to do some comparison ads, to get some of the facts out, mm -hmm. and, and really allow people to compare and to take a look at the platforms. And as you can see from the results with this commanding lead that we've got right now, as far as this goes, which looks like it's solidifying, you know, that was done without a massive amount of advertising. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that just shows you how effective social media can be. In 1998, yeah. I raised $100,000 to run for the legislature, which, which is a lot of money back then, yeah. you know, but a hundred grand this time you don't, you know, now with social media, nowadays the you, average is about 7,000. Is, yes. is it a democratization? Social media has created this democratization. Maybe, maybe, of, of, maybe. For, for better or for voting? worse, it gets more information out there for, okay. for better or for worse. Right. Yeah. Because, okay. But, but it clearly is much more affordable. My cost per vote today versus what it was in 1998 or yeah. 10, you know, Governor Guterres raising 10 million bucks exactly. in the millions, right? Yeah. E even in 2018, if I got the numbers right, Governor Liu raised 1.4 million, but half of it was her own money. So yeah. she only raised 700,000. In 1998, 700,000? Heck, let me, you know, you're not going to be governor, right? You got to yeah. raise three, four, five, ten million bucks. And let, let me cut in because really uh, we we do have some some let's, new results in. So let's let's go fun. quickly uh, uh, to uh, Nick Delgado at uh, Election Central. Nick. Hey guys, yeah, so so far we are seeing 39 of 67 precincts that are in thus far. Leon Guerrero Tenorio now inching even further away from the Camacho Ada team. Leon Guerrero Tenorio with 10,709 votes or 54.90%. Camacho Ada, 8,708 votes or 44.64%. For the delegate race, uh, James, James Moylan with 10,139 votes and Judy Wampad behind him with 8. 1991 again James Moylan 10,139 Judy Wanpat 8,991 in the senatorial race Therese Terlahi 12,794 Daryl Chris Barnett 12,408 Amanda Shelton 10,283 Joe St. Augustine 10,180 Tina Munya Barnes 9,754 Frank Blas Jr. 9,117, Tom Fisher, 8,297, Roy Kanata, 7,914, William Parkinson, 7,874, Chris Duanius, 7,837, Dwayne St. Nicholas, 7,410, Telotai Dugui, 7,259, Sabina Paris, 7,204 votes, Joanne Brown, 7,134, Jesse Lujan, 7,072. Kelly Marsh Titano, 6,810. Mary Ann Silva Tyron, 6,781 votes. 
Sarah Thomas Nettedog, 6,674. 6,441 for John Savarez. Fred Berdalio Jr., 6,330. Jose Terlahi, 6,251. Vincent Borja, 6,177. Michelle Tightsnow, 5,935. Shirley Mabini Young, 5,875. Angela Santos, 5,194. Joaquin Leon Guerrero, 5,151. Sandra Sal, 4,600. Bishra Mendiola, 4,374. David Chrysostomo, 3,983. And Ian Catling, 2,184. Now, for the Attorney General race, we're seeing a um, change up in who's in the lead here after 39 of the 67 precincts coming in here. Now, Doug Moylan uh, le leading with 8,757 votes. Not that far ahead, though. Uh, Head of Levin Camacho, the incumbent AG, 8,723 votes. Again, Doug Mullen, 8,757 or 46.08%. And Levin Camacho, 8,723 votes or 45.90%. And so far for the write ins, they received 1,524 votes. For the Guam Education Board, Mary Okada, 12,239. Peter Alexis Ada, uh, 9,940 9, votes. Angel Sablon, uh, 8,822 votes. Ronald McNich, Ron McNich, 8,761 votes. Marie Gutierrez, 7,860 votes. 16 votes, rather. Lourdes Benaventi, 7,669 votes. Elaine Ujoa, 6,385 votes. Renetti Camacho, uh, 5,874 votes, and Joseph Santos, 5,864 votes. That's for the Guam Education Board race. Over to the Consolidated Commission on Utilities, Simon Sanchez in the lead with 9,542 votes, Michael Limtiaco with 7,618 votes, Francis Santos with 7,001, Melvin Duenas, 6,790, Nonito Blas, 6,581 Ricardo Wampinko, 5,744 votes. Again, this is 39 of the 67 precincts that we've received so far. And the numbers to watch so far we see uh, for the gubernatorial race, uh, Leon Guerrero Tenorio, 10,709 votes, and Camacho out of 8,708 votes. Of course, these are just uh, 39 of the 67 precincts that have uh, been counted thus far. I want to bring in now the GC ex Executive Director, Maria Pangolin. Uh, Maria, it's been a busy time for you. This is the first time we're seeing each other yes. since the votes have been started. The count has started here today. Just a little, about halfway there. Halfway there, but... We've cleared all our precincts. We're sending them home before 2 o'clock. We sent to most of our precinct officials actually before midnight. So th they did really well. Our precinct officials did well. Yeah, and so just seeing the numbers thus far, the, the, how quickly the bo ballot boxes are being stacked up, yes. your, your team going through the, uh, the count here, it looks like no glitches. Knock on wood. Knock on wood, yes. So I've been going back and forth between the main floor with the precinct officials and the tabulators. And in both places, I don't say long enough, but it seems like it's going pretty smoothly. A lot of the uh, camps watching closely for the bigger uh, voting districts, Jigo, Dededo, where are we at in getting those? Because I know those were among the last to be reconciled, correct? Yes. So I, when I was on the floor, I saw that there were a couple of Jigo precincts. Um, I don't rem remember the rest, but uh, they're all now. They're all now ready and waiting to be counted. Yeah. And so tell us a little bit about what we're looking at back here now. I mean, we've been seeing throughout the night, uh, the each machine's Ta, Flynn, Kin, uh, the ballots being ran through there. Is there anything that you can share uh, with our viewers here about what they've been seeing here throughout the night? Okay, so at each tabulator, we have a main tabulator and two assistants. So they pull, th they pull from the set of... Um, ballot boxes mm -hmm. and then they start running them um, after a few precincts they would uh, they would pull down reports from the machines 
go to election wear and give, be able to give give us results for more precincts. Um, what you see closer to us are what we call express votes, and so what tap what uh, ballots are not count are not read by the machine. Our precinct, our, I mean, our commissioners will sit down in teams of two with the legal counsel to duplicate the uh, ballots that are not counted by the machine. Mm -hmm. And so we would then have, uh, then they would, after, the, uh, after our commissioners uh, duplicate those ballots, they get put back in the machine and are run. And so far it's been flawless, effortless for this process? I think so. Um, maybe, you know, you can see sometimes that they'll be, they'll stop, um, they'll stop running the machine and it's probably to examine uh, do, uh, the, to examine a ballot that needs to be duplicated. And we're looking at the amount uh, 39 of 67 percent uh, precincts counted so far. Total voter turnout with those, about half of those counted, 32.74 percent. Uh, what are we thinking about those numbers? I, I don't know. You know, um, about 6 o'clock last night, or six o'clock this past evening, I heard that the traffic was really bad in Okudu, so my heart was bumping. I thought they were all voters going to Okudu. But it seemed like when I called, when someone called, they said at eight o'clock sharp, they closed Okudu, which means there wasn't a line. So, you know, um, here we are uh, at the end of the election. We did what we can to make it, um, to make it as, convenient for our voters and that's what we're looking at. But with that turnout percentage, Maria, does it look like we're seeing less of a turnout than the primary or elections past? Oh no, so this is more than the primary. The primary was at 40 percent. So I, I'm sure we're going to surpass that. Um, something else to think about is that we have more voter registered voters. So yes, so the 60, so it's a bigger it's a bigger pie, so you know if you if we look at the raw numbers, maybe there were more um, voters, but because it's a bigger pie, the percentage would show lower. Yeah, that's some good news, though. Just with that turnout numbers, that, that turnaround and the amount of those that you were able to register, uh, including over at the early voting sites and and at the satellite yes. sites you had over the weekend. What about today on election day? Any hiccups or or any good news you'd like to share? Um. So we were in the office um, from about 5.30, the phones were ringing, but it was more, it was, you know, the standard, what, what we would get in any election. Um, people who are not registered, people who are in the wrong, wrong precinct. So it was pretty standard. Uh, maybe even, maybe we didn't get as many calls mm -hmm. even this time. So we'll see. Um, it, between the primary and the general, our precinct officials, we, we try to get them to come back. So in the general, they have a lot more experience already. So maybe that's why it's running smoother. Yeah, so this is about, I think, our fifth batch that we're seeing here today. We want to remind our viewers, I know they're also watching with the AG race, there's still a uh, declared riding candidate. Those numbers, that process, still have to wait even after the last vote is counted here tonight, correct? Correct. So. Anything with less than 2% difference requires a recount. So we, we made, you know, that's something that we need to look at. Also, on November 23rd, that would be the 10th workday uh, since tonight or since the election day, uh, we will still have um, off-island ballots coming in. So those will be counted. We will go look at all the provisional ballots to uh, for this election, we had over 140. Uh, our estimate is over 140 provisional ballots that we have to look at to see if they could be counted or not. Right. Traditionally, that doesn't cause much of a major change or upset to what the results we see here tonight, though. However, however, in uh, you know, for the primary election, we saw 120 uh, provisional ballots, and of those, 80 something were counted. So, you know, we never know. Uh, timing this all out, it was just after 11 o'clock when we got that first batch of results. We're about halfway through. Could we beat the sunrise? 
<laughs> we'll see. Most, you know, you will see. I, I think so. They're working real hard and they're working steadily. Yeah. They're working steadily. So we want to uh, make sure that we are yes. showing all the voters out there that their vote is taken seriously, that it does matter when it's run through those tabulation machines and sealed back up. Absolutely. And um, our 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 GEC team know that it, every every ballot really counts. And I have to say, you know, there's still smiles on their faces yeah. as they as they know that it's still at least a couple more hours. Maria Pangolina, the executive director of the GEC, still see the smile behind that mask. <laughs> Thank you for your time. We'll be speaking with you toward the end. Thank you. And again, 39 of the 67 precincts in so far with this fifth batch. And uh, as we saw here today, the Leon Guerrero-Tenorio team, 10,709 votes. Camacho Ada, 8,708 votes. For the delegate race, James Moylan leading with 10,139 votes. Judy Womp had 8,991 votes. For the AG race, we saw Doug Moylan taking the lead with 8,757 votes and leaving Camacho 8,723 votes with 1,524 write-in uh, votes here. Uh, once that next batch comes in, that's where past the halfway point now we'll let you know and bring you those results for now back to you we're going to take a short break and when we come back we're going to have a jason salas and a dr ron mcninch break down more numbers please stay with us everybody It's a tradition that began almost 70 years ago. A trusted legacy, a voice, an advocate, a resource for news you need to know. Through the years, the headlines have changed, as many of those who have graced the screens, sat behind and in front of the cameras, and come into your homes every night. But our commitment to keeping you informed, engaged, and to represent the diverse voices in our community has never wavered. We are your news leader on every platform and every device. We've grown with the community to reflect the changing times. We are KUAM News, the voice of the Marianas. Thanksgiving is a special time of year, a time to share a delicious, delectable feast with family and friends, but you can't cook. Leave it to the pros and let Uno go deliver to your door. Check our app or website for Thanksgiving specials from participating restaurant partners, plus party platters, pies, and more. Have a happy Thanksgiving from all of us at Uno Go. Guam on demand. Half a day. I'm Gunnery Sergeant Ribbon Tan from Marine Corps Base Camp Blast. Personally asking you to join me in supporting the Marine Corps Toys for Tots program by collecting new and unwrapped toys for children this year. The Toys for Tots program, now in its eighth year in the CNMI, has partnered with the Saipan Chamber of Commerce, Lady Diane Tours Foundation, and the associated students of NMC to make this holiday season a time to remember for kids and teens throughout the Commonwealth. You may drop off your new and unwrapped toys today through December 10th at any of the 30 businesses who are cur currently participating in our campaign throughout Saipan. The Lady Diane Torres Foundation, Commonwealth Bureau of Military Affairs, and CNMI Women's Affairs offices. We kindly ask that when purchasing this year, to please remember gifts for older children and young teenagers. On behalf of the United States Marine Corps and the KUAM Care Force, we thank you for coming together and sharing the spirit of the season. The Edward M. Calvo Cancer Foundation presents a special screening of Wakanda Forever on Sunday, November 13th at 2.20 p.m. at the Tango Micronesian Mall Stadium Theaters. Tickets are $25 and includes giveaways, raffle prizes, and a souvenir photo. Doors open at 1.30 p.m. for this much-anticipated sequel to Marvel's Black Panther. All proceeds benefit the Edward M. Calvo Cancer Foundation in their efforts to provide financial assistance to cancer patients in Guam and the CNMI. Purchase tickets at the EMC Cancer Foundation office in Helgutnia on weekdays or email emccancerfoundation at gmail.com to arrange your online purchase. Visit our Facebook page to learn how you can pay special tribute to a loved one during the screening. Wakanda Forever, a benefit for the Edward M. Calvo Cancer Foundation, is presented by Payless Supermarkets, Bank of Guam, Cars Plus Guam, 
Calvo Enterprises Inc., ITD, Uno Go Guam, Custom Fitness, Global Food Services, Docomo Pacific, EC Developments, IBD Guam, and the KUAM Care Force. And also brought to you by Steel Athletics and today's realty. Call 472-6223 or visit our Facebook and Instagram pages for more information. All right, everybody, 12 minutes after the hour of two, the witching hour coming up. And how do you top Simon Sanchez, Ginger Cruz, and Nestor Lacanto, each of them legends in their own right um, in public service, in broadcasting, everything. So we bring in Dr. Rob McNinch from the University of Guam, political science professor and our political analyst, to dive inside the numbers, take a look at the, at the way the elections is shaping up. And Rana, you used the word during commercial break. I wish everybody could, could have heard from this. You're looking at your numbers, the notes you've been taking, and you just looked down and you said, interesting. Right. Would you care to explain? Yeah. I mean, uh, the, just the, the way uh, when, when different districts come out, how it's obvious that they, they have their preferences for candidates. Yeah, it's, it's pretty clear. Okay. What I found interesting, if, I'm, if I may, from my own you know, naive observation, um, is that, of course, the UOG exit poll, maybe we can bring up that exit poll, exit poll yeah. graphic if we could in the back, but uh, it actually had, um, you had Dr. Judy Wanpat actually taking, by a very narrow mar margin, mind you, I mean, it, was, it wasn't a, um, you know, a, total, a total blowout, but uh, Judy Wanpat took the congressional delegate seat uh, from Jim Moylan. The real votes have started to come in. Granted, um, we're maybe about a little bit halfway, as Nick Delgado was saying before we went to commercial break. Um, but it seems like uh, Jim Moylan, the Republican senator, has the upper hand at this point. Sure. Uh, to what do you attribute that? Well, uh, for both the AG race and for the delegate race, uh, we, we made pretty clear that it was within the margin. So it could have you know, wobbled, and mm -hmm. that's, I think, what happened. I think that uh, the, the exit poll didn't measure people voting after 3 o'clock, and so this, this obviously shows a lot of worker, working people's votes that uh, affected those races. Okay, and uh, can you break down which, um, which villages and which precincts have not been um, tabulated yet? Because, you know, like in the mainland, they would refer to them as like the swing states, and out here, these are, you know, the neighborhoods, the villages, you know, the very densely populated populated municipalities and everything that can really cause, you know, like if, if you have a, um, a two candidate race, it can really cause them to flip flop several times over the course of the night. Sure. And uh, I know some of the other commentators mentioned this before, but Dedados, 22.7% of the population mm -hmm. or voting population. That's a huge number for one, one concentrated location. Uh, also, Jigo is another, another area that, and there are parts of Dedo and parts of Jigo that haven't been reported yet. Mm -hmm. And so we'll see where those go. Also, um, very influential uh, markets here on Guam, uh, parts of, uh, precincts within Jotnya, parts of uh, Santa Rita Sumai, a lot of those. Um, will, when they come in and everything like that, um, you've said this many, many times over the years, you know, you've got, you know, your top performers and maybe like your top eight kind of like shape out at this point. You know, you've got kind of uh, the ones that are maybe on the bottom uh, third of the bracket, but it's those middle tier players, too. That's where you see like a lot of movement, a lot of activity. Sure, particularly uh, if we talk about the legislature, the bottom five in the legislature are always a jungle. They're always fighting back and forth mm. all the way through to the end. And, and we've even seen years where they have to go and go into recounts and, and we have a, a give and take for the last one or two slots. Mm -hmm. I think that in, in this particular race, I think that there's a, a lot of action and activity. And I think that there's gonna be some, particularly in the legislature, there's gonna be some offices that really are going to hold out probably to the end. Yeah, so so since you mentioned it, the uh, the bottom five, if you will, the ranks 11 through 15 in the senatorial race are Democrat Dwayne St. Nicholas, first-time candidate, wow. incumbent Tello Tidegui, a Republican, incumbent uh, Sabina Perry, she, of course, oversees, uh, among other things, the uh, Oversight Committee on uh, the Environment. She's had a lot on her plate for the last uh, senatorial term, to be sure. Uh, Joanne Brown, who is interestingly enough, you, you just mentioned a runoff election. She was involved in precisely one of those several years ago, and then she wound up taking office because there was like a little uh, right. mathematical accounting discrepancy and everything like that. So I don't want to say she's used to being in this position, but she has been here before. Right, and that uh, particular uh, contentious spot was opposed by uh, former Speaker Ben Pangolinan. Yes. And they went back and forth several times. It was 
took several days mm -hmm. to resolve. I remember that. Okay, so so once again, let's just look at uh, 12 through 17. So Tello Taigui, Sabina Perez, Joanne Brown, Jesse Lujan, Dr. Kelly Marsh Titano, and Mana Silva Tyron. Right? That's eight spots right now, all held by former or current senators. Each one of them talented, each one of them capable, each one of them uh, at some point in their career having earned the public's trust and, and having held a seat downtown at the Hessler place and everything. So if you are a candidate right now, like Ron, I mean, you know, it's easy for us because we sit here and, you know, we can, uh, we can speculate and we can analyze and everything. But if you're a candidate in that middle tier and you, you've got like a lot of movement, and as Simon Sanchez uh, very effectively said, you know, the people have already spoken, the choices have been made. Right now, the, the revelation is just like when the ballots are tabulated. How do you actually stay calm and just say like, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm moving one, one moment, I'm ranked number 11, the next moment, like I'm, I'm 16, I'm on the outside looking in, the next thing I'm, I'm 13 and I'm back in the top 15. Well, blame it on the lunar eclipse and the werewolves that are running around right now. <laughs> I think the werewolves are the only people that are awake right now. Very, yeah, that's very true. Everybody wants to blame everything on, on the pandemic, and I mean, you know, we, we rightfully well should, blame, but you, you want to blame it on the blood moon. Right. Why not? It's 2.17 in the morning. We got we to gotta blame it on something. And everything. All right. Um, anything else stick out as, as noteworthy to you, Ron? Yeah, I, I've got to tell you, it's very hard to run for office, and my hat's off to these, particularly the legislative candidates, mm -hmm. as well as the uh, AG and congressional candidates and the gubernatorial candidates. It's not easy to run for office. If this were easy, everybody would do it, mm -hmm. and it takes heart to run for these offices. Mm. How hard is it maybe even to try and rerun, whether it's pursuing another successive senatorial term or in the case of like someone like a uh, Dr. Sam Abini Young, you know, someone who did serve a decade ago, um, went off and you know, got a doctorate education, you know, worked at, uh, I believe she was a uh, Bank of America for a while and everything like that, very, very successful. And, um, uh, an amazing interview always. And now she wants to get back into public service. How, is, how difficult is it financially, emotionally, you know, commitment-wise and everything like that to get back on that horse? I've talked to many uh, former senators over the years who then want to get back into office, and they always speak about the great unfinished work. That is, if they had another chance to jump back in, how they would do it very differently mm. because they cycled out. Now they want to cycle back in. Well, hindsight is always twenty twenty. Right? Yeah, and it's kind of like uh you know when when you're in high school and you break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend and you want to get back together again it's the <laughs> same emotional feelings that you have when when you know you're you're wanting to run for office again now there's an interesting topic have we ever had any one of those on on again off again senators <laughs> we have we have many times i'm dying to hear this many times we've had mm. many senators uh, come back in, and uh, there are several on this list today mm -hmm. that have went out and came back in and, and have done very well. Okay, well, let's move now to the, um, you know, not much has been made about the, um, uh, the Consolidated Commission on Utilities Racy, you know, given that um, Simon is the front runner in that candidate. Each one of these, these six candidates that we have, um, tremendously accomplished, more than capable of serving on this, only the top three um, of the six make it. If we, if we can maybe bring up that, uh, that graphic about the CCU, because uh, again, Simon Sanchez leading former Senator Michael Limtiaco um, in number two, and then Francis Santos, you know, someone who serves on the, uh, the currently the interim uh, superintendent of education, someone who has been a senator himself, and now they want to solve the problem or at least manage the process of delivering, you know, affordable quality water and power to our people. Right. I think that uh, these are always important positions. And also, uh, it looks like the top two, uh, Sanchez and Limtiaco, are pretty set. The main competition is between uh, Francis Santos and, and Melvin Duenas, and maybe uh, Donito Blas. So th that last position seems to be the one that's mm. kind of variable. And that is Nito Blas, the former mayor of Manila, was it not? I don't know. Or is it, it, I'm not sure. I believe it may, may be him. And his, uh, for, forgive me, uh, former mayor, if I got that. But, but I do believe that the number six candidate right now, uh, Ricardo Ampinko, I believe Rick was the former GM of the Guam Power Authority. Guam Power Authority, absolutely. There you go. And longtime GM, too. Long time. I know yeah, that. So no. hat, hats, off to, hats off to Rick to want to get back into the uh, into utilities game. And a few people know the business as well as Rick does and everything. He, a lot of, uh, I know, universal respect from all former uh, staffers at the Guam Power Authority. I was fortunate enough to do a story about there was a big uh, reunion from former GPA staffers and they said Rick went there, uh, delivered this amazing address, you know, not politicking at all, but just basically saying, 
the job that we did for the community, you know, will stand the test of time. And certainly, you know, these six people that want to do that, you know, are looking to uh, continue on with that legacy. Rick's a very fine gentleman. Okay. Uh, to the AG race now. So much was made about this, and I, I do want to shine light. Uh, I know we're going to bring up that graphic. I don't know if we have it on the graphic, but Nestor actually has me tracking this, right, from an analytics standpoint. Um, we know that Attorney General um, Levin Camacho was at the number one spot. Uh, Doug Moylan, who was the island's first elected Attorney General, of course, uh, he's jumped in by only about, what is that, 24 votes. So this is razor, razor thin, Ron. But the thing that I find interesting is the number of write-in votes, and we're about halfway done with all the tabulations, 1,524 write-in ballots. Um, your exit poll projected, you know, um, you know, fairly proportional to what we're seeing right now on the screen, but there were only 13 writing candidates. Out did, of 500. Did you see this many ballots come no. in? 1,500. No. No, this, in fact, this was what I was afraid of, and I, at the Guam Election Commission, kind of asked the, the election commissioners to look at the law and look at the history because it's very clear that our senators only wanted there to be two candidates on that ballot. Mm -hmm to ensure that there'd be a, a majority. And then, then later through the legislative process, that whole idea kind of got sidetracked. And that's unfortunate. And so it doesn't require a majority anymore, just whoever gets the most votes. Mm -hmm. And it's only 34 votes difference between uh, former A.G. Moylan and Levin Camacho. And oh, well, bless you, because you, your arithmetic is way better than mine, especially at this hour. So <laughs> I, oh, said, well, I, said, I said 24, you nah, said 34, you know. Nah, you know, I trust me, I'm... I have teaching assistants to do the math for me, so I, I <laughs> okay. really don't. And, and again, to, to be fair, you know, the, those 1,524 votes um, that, that the writing candidates have gotten, we won't know for at least a couple of days. The GEC is going to have to sort those out and figure out how many of them actually belong to attorney Pete Santos, who, of course, was running for that. Because, I mean, some of these might right. be, you know, Mickey Mouse or, you know, sure. like stuff like that. And that, that always happens. And it's a moot point anyway. There's absolutely no way... The, uh, the third category, the writing category, mm -hmm. can have any effect on this race other than to pull votes away from one, one legitimate candidate or the other. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing it does. Okay, one other thing that, that I noticed is a kind of the disparity between um, the number of votes that are being cast. Because we can see right now, and of course, because this is a general election, you are able to cross over. Um, Therese Terlahi, of course, the poll sitter for the senatorial race, she's got nearly 13,000 votes. But then when you go and look at uh, Doug Moylan's total, he's got about 8,700. Um, does that indicate that there were just a lot of people who just made the choice not to choose an AG? And, you know, like one of the greatest lyrics in the history of music was by a band I know we both like, Rush, is, you know, even if you, even if you choose not to decide, you've still made a choice. True, but also... I just wanted to quote Rush. You know. <laughs> also, uh, it, it could also be that the AG is one of those impossible positions where you can never make anybody happy. It doesn't matter who mm. the AG is, there's going to be a percentage of the population who don't like any of them because they're AGs. You're either bringing charges against, against someone they know, and so like, you, know, you, get, you get in their doghouse because of that, or you're trying to prosecute someone, and if you wind up not convicting them, then you're the bad guy in that light too. Or you're not doing something in the civil realm correctly or right. haven't done something correctly in, in somebody's view. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems like everybody has a voodoo doll out for somebody in this town, you know, <laughs> and I think that this is what translates. No one's got a voodoo doll out for, out for you. Everybody loves it. We're talking about that. werewolves. Might as well talk about voodoo <laughs> dolls too. Okay. Um, how, um, also, with, the, with this number, the 8,700 for Doug, and again, you know, go back to this, uh, this the slimmest of margin. This is the tightest race, what yeah. we're seeing tonight. What does that also say for? Uh, Levin and Doug, and and for what it's worth, you know, um, you know, Peters, um, they're contemporaries, and you know, they're colleagues. You know, uh, uh, the pra the practice of law is a gentleman and ladies, you know, profession. It's a, it's a, um, you know, th these are men who participated in, you know, as we said earlier, multiple debates, and you know, by by virtue of what they do for a living and everything, you know, like that, this is like a normal day for them. Go up, have a topic, let's argue about it. Right, and. The attorney general is a professional position. It requires advanced education. It's, it's a very uh, uh, technical position, mm -hmm. and it's one that has a lot of scrutiny in this town. So, mm -hmm. so with the, um, Levin had the, uh, had the advantage for the first four or five batches that we had um, of, uh, of updates. 
Doug now uh, with a very, very slim margin again. So it's going to pay attention to this one, ladies and gentlemen, because this one is going to get really, really interesting uh, for the rest of the but night. There's something else here that I think is important. Sure. So in addition to 1,500 write-ins, there's seven, over 760 undervotes. That's people who didn't mark anybody mm. out of that number. They just turned in a completely empty ballot. That's right, for that office. Interesting. Okay, well, there you go. Okay, uh, before I let you go, um, we, gosh, actually, we could be here all night, but, <laughs> but are there any, personally, I'm not, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna disclose check, check which ones, but there are some candidates because in my position as, as a newsman, right, I have interviewed most of the candidates um, for all of these races, like sitting here talking to them about, you know, uh, their familial connections, their platforms, you know, their, their strategies, their plans for the island. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that like later on because uh, we do want to go to the aforementioned uh, Doug Moylan, the island's first elected attorney general who now is in the number one spot again by a very, very slim margin. So Ron and I are going to bring in Doug Moylan who is seeking to, um, to run for attorney general, and he is in a very good spot right now. So let's go live to the field where we bring in Doug Moylan. He is standing by with our Daniel Perez. Hi, Daniel. Hafiday and good morning, everybody. Coming to you live from the Republican camp. And with me is the one pulling ahead in the AG race right now, former AG, Doug Moylan. Hi, Dan. Attorney, Attorney Moylan, you are pulling ahead. How do you feel? I'm cautiously optimistic. You know, Dan, I appreciate the voters, they came out today, and I'm hoping that the message that I am conveying uh, for safety in our community uh, is resonating. You know, um, I was going around talking to vo voters earlier, earlier yesterday, and they voiced a lot of their opinions about how crime is too high and it's too rampant. Um, how would you address this if you were elected? Strong prosecution. I think if I'm elected, the mandate from the people will be very clear that they want the Attorney General to be tough on the criminals, make sure that they're safe, people are safe at their homes at night, that women are able to go to their cars without having to have somebody with them or be looking over their shoulder all the time. So I'll work with all the law enforcement agencies and get the prosecutors that we need in order to have these people put behind bars, punish, send the deterrence message, and um, we'll bring the AG's office back into balance. Back into balance. Attorney Moylan, could you explain more um, about what that could mean? The Attorney General is the Chief Law Enforcement Officer, and right now I'm not seeing the Attorney General do that, both in the criminal and in the civil area. And um, I think that the people that work in the AG's office want to see what the AG's office is supposed to do, which is enforce our laws. All right. And Attorney Moylan, um, you were AG once before. Um, what made you just want to come back into the race and um, serve our people again? I think you just said it. We never had a crime wave when I was there. And uh, I think the people want back to the basics type of law enforcement. And uh, I'm ready for public service. Is there anything you would like to say um, to our island residents who want change and to just lower the crime rate? Well, I, I want to thank all the uh, voters today for coming out and vote. And I want to also assure them that if I get into office, we're going to turn around the, uh, put the criminals in fear and not uh, the law-abiding people. All right. Well, you heard it first from attorney Doug Moylan, AG candidate who is pulling ahead. We'll throw it back to you in the studio. All right. Thanks, Daniel. And thank you, Doug. And, and uh, well done on a very well-run campaign. Uh, Ron, real quick, we're going to go back to Nestor and Ginger and uh, Simon momentarily. But... Um, I want to talk about, you know, like uh, uh, Doug's platform, his vision. You were kind of saying, like, you looked at that and you made another Ron McNeese observation. You said, Doug has unfinished work. Mm -hmm. Would you care to extrapolate? He's older. He's wiser. He was in his mid-30s when mm -hmm. he first became the first elected AG. Now he, he has a whole different view. He um, was younger than Levin was when right. Levin took office, right? Yes. Yeah. And not only that, he established many of the traditions and practices within the Attorney General's office. It's just he only had one term, and so he wasn't able to fully work on you know, all of the, the, the elemental structural dynamics mm -hmm. that I think he probably wanted to. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, to him, at least in my view, in talking to him, he views this as an unfinished work. That mm -hmm. is, he needs to 
uh, you know, help Guam actualize the office of the Attorney General. Okay, and just like uh, Dr. Sam Abini, who we talked about, you know, coming back into public service, how has the role of Guam's elected Attorney General changed in, you know, the decade plus uh, since Doug last sat in that seat? Oh, he, he actually helped to forge a set of traditions and practices that really established that office. It was fledgling. He had none of the traditions uh, to fall back on. And mm -hmm. every other AG since then has simply used Attorney General Moreland's model. Mm -hmm. So he so he set, he set he the bar. Set he set it. He, <laughs> interesting choice of words. He, he set the bar as a member <laughs> of the bar. I totally did not mean to do that. All right. We are going to go about 100 miles north of us now, and we check in with Tomas Manglonia, who is dutifully manning his position up in the CNMI to hopefully see if they have some election results up there for our brothers and sisters in the Commonwealth. So, Tomas, what have you got for us now? All right, now we're live. Uh, there are some breaking developments here uh, at the Commonwealth Election Commission uh, involving uh, one of the boxes in which uh, there is a missing key. Uh, we're now joined with uh, uh, Mr. Kiriguat with the NMI Democratic Party. Can you just uh, bring us up to date with what exactly is transpiring right now and your concern here at the Commonwealth Election Commission? Well, um as we were watching the um, supervision of all the ballot boxes, one particular uh, box that came from the Northern Island uh, supposedly came with a key that closes it earlier. Um, Ashley, who is the uh, legal counsel for uh, the um, uh, um, yeah, the uh, Office of uh, Public Auditor was trying to open the box with the same key that was brought back from the Northern Island, and uh, she couldn't. And uh, they tried to uh, pry open the box with a metal cutter, and I protested that because it raises a question uh, about whether or not that was the uh, lock that was uh, legally agreed to be used uh, before and after the before uh, the voters cast their vote and after the voters cast their vote. And uh, what, what do you have to say to those who might be looking at the situation, saying the votes are the votes? It's the same paper inside. It, it, is it more is it more significant than that to you? Is it more concerning to you? Well, uh, I mean. Y I think uh, people can understand the sensitivity of, of the situation. Uh, this is a gubernatorial election, uh, and, and uh, I am not making any allegation with respect to impropriety. I'm just saying that if uh, the lock that closes the box is the same key that uh, was given to Ashley to open the, bo the box, and apparently it cannot, then you know, it raises some question. Uh, that's the reason why I, I protested the use of the cutter to open it open. And so what's the current resolution? Is there any resolution right now well, after discussing it? We're waiting for the uh, Assistant Attorney General to make a ruling on that. All right, and do you know how many votes are involved in this? I have no idea. <laughs> so, you know, just to be safe. Okay. Thank you, Mr. You're and just uh, for the record, can we have your full name and your party affiliation oh. and position? My name is Daniel Okiroga, uh, member of the Democratic Party, and uh, I'm up server for the Democratic Party. All right, there you heard it, uh, Nestor and uh, our team over on Guam. Apologies for uh, the mobile setup as we uh, just are showing you uh, the live images of uh, what is uh, being, uh, what is currently transpiring here. Uh, as you heard it from Mr. Kiragua himself, uh, they are going to uh, discuss this with those involved and it looks as though that uh, the OPA is currently uh, explaining the situation uh, to the officials here and so we will of course provide you more updates throughout the night and in particular with this situation so back to you in the studio. All right thanks uh, Tomas Mongloni with some breaking news there over in the CNMI it's apparent uh, some discrepancy over a uh, lockbox. Uh, I'm sure we'll have uh, more on that a little bit later in the program as that uh, situation develops. Meanwhile, back in the studio here in Guam, um, <laughs> we've got 39 uh, precincts out of 62. We do. Um, but, but we have some 67. crude maps. Oh, 67, I'm sorry. Yeah. And um, 
Ginger, you have some crude math indicating we're, we're ha gonna have a pretty low turnout. We do, so if you assume that the precincts are roughly the same size, um, and you've got 39 out of 67 reporting, so that is 58% of the precincts that have reported. So if you extrapolate that over the number of ballots that have been cast, which is 19,795, you come out with an estimated voter turnout of around 57%, which I hope is not the case because that would be a whole 10 points down from the 60s. I mean, it would mean that we It'd were- It'd be the lowest ever. In, yeah. in the 80s for like, you know, 20 years, and then we dropped to the 70s for maybe 12 years, and then we dropped to the 60s for literally one cycle, and then we would be down into the 50s. So let's hope that those numbers are not correct, and maybe some of the precincts are larger, but it is really looking like, uh, for a general election, a low turnout. A low turnout, a, a very low turnout, a, a, the lowest ever turnout, I, I, I imagine. If that holds. In, in recent <laughs> if, history, yeah. 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 If yeah. And a lot, of, a lot of Dedito has come in, and Dedito has the largest precincts, right. 1,050 votes, 1,068 votes, 1,100 votes. But Ginger's right, they, they try to approximate. In Chalampago, there's an 860 vote uh, a precinct with 860 votes, but there's an 1,100 uh, precinct vote. So I mean, it's not a perfect match of roughly equivalent, but that's that's what they tried to do with the precinct. That's why it, yeah. one time it dropped to 53 and it's now back to 67. We've been in the 70, 67, 72 spot yeah. since Ginger was at the academy. Well, well let's, let's parse <laughs> through that and, 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 and try to figure out why you think it's so, so low. Um, well, I think, you know, the first thing that you have to look at is you, you really had, um, at, at the governor's race, you had two candidates that everybody knew. Um, and so there was a lot of, I think there might have been an expectation that the base would show up, but I think when there was some indication from the different camps that perhaps uh, on the Leon Guerrero Tenorio side, when, when Carl Gutierrez sat pretty much where I'm sitting and kind of made his comment about, oh, we're 35 points up, you know, there's, there's things like that that might have uh, given people a feeling that, okay, well, our candidate's safe, there's going to be enough votes, and if I really don't have the time, and it's not a day off, and I'm really busy at work, you know, maybe I can't make it to the polls. So I think there's, there's a little bit of that um, that plays into it. And then the other thing that I think, when you're looking at voter turnout, it's just the environment nowadays. People are not feeling like the candidates are speaking to them anymore. They feel like there's this division between government and what people are thinking and feeling and going through on a day-to-day -day basis. And people, for the wrong reasons, are thinking, well, my vote won't count, which is really wrong because, I mean, if you're looking at the, the last person who's going to make it into the mm -hmm. legislature, okay. there's 262 votes that separate, you know, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the bottom two candidates, mm -hmm. somebody who would be a senator and not be a senator. Yeah. So 262 people I mean, is a very small number of people. But I think that there's just an, a growing sense among voters that, well, you know, the politicians really don't understand what I'm going through, and it do doesn't matter do. Is this, the, is this the, young, the younger voters? Yes, a lot of them. Yeah, so Ginger, Ginger, I think, makes a, a very good point, right? Uh, our generation is voting, um, my daughter's generation is voting, right? But uh, there's a disconnect that is emerging, uh, particularly in Guam, and, and frankly, we're spoiled in Guam, because even the United States will go, hey, that's not that's not a bad participation rate, yeah. but it's we, we saw it in the United States. We're starting to see it in Guam, whether where people just for whatever reasons feel that their vote doesn't make as much of an impact, even though we can tell the stories of how uh, Speaker Ben and Joanne Brown had to do a recount and six votes became four votes or something like that, mm -hmm. and that made the difference between Speaker Ben keeping a seat and Senator Brown not keeping her seat, and she did so, and and I lost by 100 votes. So especially at the senatorial level, you know that can make a difference. But then if if you're a voter, you're going, well, there's 15 senators. Does it really matter whose number? Is it eight, seven, nine, six? You know, and sometimes there's the old, a pox in all your houses, right? I'm mad at all of you, right? Right. 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 But um, it, it, it's, a, it's a concern, and, and, and maybe we're just having to realize that uh, human nature being what it is, we, we are trending like um, much of the planet, you know, and, and particularly in the United States, where uh, for a, a 
a whole slew of reasons. That's maybe we need the sociologists to come in and, and talk about it, right? But yeah, they're, they're just not feeling that their vote makes as much and, of an and, impact. And does the motor voter registration skew that as well? Because it those, does. Those are, yeah. It does, yeah. So instead of people actually showing up to register to vote, now yeah. when you get your driver's license, you automatically get registered. So that drives yeah. up the number of right. voters. So kind of artificially. We're right? at we're at sixty, you know, over 60,000. But I think also another thing, and that was a good point that you made, Simon, is the depression quotient. So one of the themes that was put forward during this election was you know, aren't you depressed with the cost of living and aren't you just feeling terrible about having to, you know, go through this, this difficult time because of COVID and, you know, businesses are closed down. And so what's the point? Mm -hmm. And, and it was made as a political point to try and drive voters over to one side. But I think it also may have contributed to people saying, well, you know, if, if I'm upset about things and I'm upset about the cost of living, I'm just not going to show up and vote for anybody. It, it, that's yeah. what's fueling a yeah. little bit of the apathy. Uh, it could. Yeah. I mean, it, it's really hard to say. It would be very interesting to do a focus group after this election, and, and I think it would be worthwhile. I mean, maybe mm -hmm. the Republicans could do one, the Democrats do one, and really find out what was it that drove down the voter turnout. Was it the, the apathy? Was it people not feeling connected to their candidates? And what are the things that we can do to get people more engaged so that they're participating in their democracy? So I, I used to, I, I, yeah. I, I'm like Ginger, I was saying, okay, if you're forced to register because you're going to get a driver's license, first off, you know, some people are saying, hey, I got to have that driver's license. Okay, register me. That doesn't mean I'm going to vote. But I was looking in 2002, we had 61,000 registered voters. In 2006, we had 55,000. In 2018, we had 55,000. Today, we have 60,000. So we have hovered in the 55 to 60,000 uh, range of registered voters, even without the driver's license, you're automatically in whether you like it or not, right? Mm -hmm. But so even between 50 to 60,000, 55 to 60,000, the participation rate is what's falling, right? Yeah. So uh, I used to think about, well, it, it might skew the number because if you, you know, my grandson's about to get his driver's license, he's gonna be registered to vote, right? Yeah. Like, I don't think he voted for me today because he hasn't got his driver's license yet. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and that will make more people registered. But when you look at the numbers, we've had 50 to 60,000 for 20 years. But in 2002, we had a 74% participation rate, uh, and we don't now, based on Ginger's numbers, we're in the, what is it? Okay. 60. Uh, we, we, had, 60 we, had a, uh, we got to cut to a, a live shot over at um, El Young Guerrero Tenorio headquarters because we've got the Lieutenant Governor standing by with Hannah Devonzo. Hannah, take it away. Thanks, Nestor. Joining me is Lieutenant Governor Joshua Tenorio. How are you feeling about the latest batch of numbers? Feeling very good, uh, and I'm excited, waiting for the results for my hometowns of Sinahanya and Talafofo, uh, hoping to pick up even more uh, votes for the, from those villages. All right, and if re-elected, any new plans for the next four years? Well, you know, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we had about two and a half years uh, focusing on a pandemic, and over these last eight months, we've been really trying to rapidly catch up on a lot of work to be done. So you're going to be seeing a whole lot of work through the end of the year and in these next four years, some great things. The best is yet to come. And how would you describe this race against your opponent, Camacho Ada? Well, you know, um, both of them have been friends. Uh, so, of course, it's always awkward when we have a competition um, when you know people uh, pretty good. Uh, and I regret it that, uh, you know, it kind of took a, a sort of a turn into the sewer. You know, that's not what Guam's about, but uh, I'm confident that the people of Guam saw the message from the governor and myself uh, that we're really optimistic uh, in our future. We believe that we're going to improve the quality of life for the people of Guam these next four years. All right. Any message to your supporters who have brought you to this point? Well, I just want to thank everybody out there. Uh, we have an excellent, excellent group of supporters throughout every single village on this island. They've been working so hard and tirelessly and this victory we share with them. And of course, to all the people of Guam, we uh, represent you all. The governor and I represent you all and we will do our best job to make sure that we focus on improving your life, um, keeping our island safe and making sure that we can build prosperous futures for our children. All right, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. We'll go ahead and send it back to you, Nestor. I thought there was a Baba B concert going on. <laughs> there <laughs> is. There is. Baba B was there. Yeah. Oh, I have, it's, it's over. I have all of his 
CDs. I love him. <laughs> <laughs> Getting back to what we were talking about earlier, yeah. the, um, um, the uh, I guess, the redu reduction in um, uh, voter turnout. Is, is demographic play a, a factor in that, too? Maybe more recent um, immigrants to uh, the island who may not be as, um, you know, uh, Keenly involved in, in local politics, um, maybe. will that will that skew it as well? So they don't put out the demographics until after the election. So I was trying to look for that during the primary election mm -hmm. to see if we could tell from the demographics what was going on, um, and they usually do that analysis afterwards. So it'll be very interesting when the Guam Election yeah. Commission does their uh, report, which is very comprehensive, and they sort of break. But that it down. only tells you age; it doesn't tell you ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Right? You, you, it does. How do you know if a registered voter is Filipino or Caucasian or tomorrow? Well, it's not ethnicity necessarily, but there is a so, section. So in terms of the new immigrant, right? right? Yeah. I mean, well, I'm no, but saying. I mean, they have like FSM, they have Filipino, the ones that speak Filipino at home, who voted, who didn't. There's a whole section in the back. It's like, it's a 260-page report. How does the election report. know that? Uh, they when you, when collect you that information when they register. Right, but you don't know whether Simon voted or not. So Simon's ethnicity is... You know, you, you don't know if Simon voted or not. You just know that there's a, I'm in whatever precinct 17B that my ballot is in there. But you know, not, you know nothing about who put in that ballot. That's no, why no, no, they do, they do. How do you? They do. We'll talk about it later because in all the years I'm watching. Because they the gave one, out the list. In fact, Nestor, you just did that story. They give out the list of the names of all the people. Right, 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 right. But, yeah, but that doesn't tell you much about ethnicity, right? You see. I think you, it's name and it's yeah. date of birth. Right, right. so you can, and birth. Yeah, and you, you can do that. But again, Which these days, the if you see a Smith, they yeah. could be from right. Chuke, they can be from the Philippines, they could be from uh, Arkansas, right? Sure. Because of the mix of, of our culture, right? And, and so sure. I've always thought that. Let me put it this way. I think ethnicity is more difficult to discern from the election numbers. Uh, you can make assumptions about da -da -do, you grew up in League One Terrace, Tamuning versus Chalampago versus Umatic, right? You, that you is can, a good you question. Can make, you can make some... Dis, uh, you but know. I can tell you that in the Guam Election Commission reports, those yeah. nice thick reports that they post on yeah, there, yeah. Um, and I, I just spent looking at it a lot of, of time pouring through them, if you go towards the very end mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. they've got the financial disclosures, right immediately before mm -hmm. that, they do this very comprehensive breakdown of... How many Chamorros voted? Origin. It has Chamorros, Filipinos, Micronesians, Palau. In terms I mean, of registered voters, but I don't think you can tell whether a Chamorro, a, a Chamorro putting in the, you can't tell Good from question. the ballot. Good question. Who, whether a Chamorro, it's a Chamorro yeah, ballot, a I, Filipino ballot. I think you're I right in terms I saw of, one. you're right on registration. Oh, you can say, here's the profile <laughs> of, the, of the voters of Guam. Yeah. Uh, what percentage of Chamorro, Howley, uh, uh, you know, Italian, whatever, you know, whatever they <laughs> write for it. But. You, you still don't know when Ginger puts in her ballot, or yeah. Nestor puts in his ballot, or Simon puts in his ballot. Yeah. Was that a Filipino ballot? Was that a Howley ballot? Was it a Samoan ballot? You, you, you don't know. In fact, you don't even know that Simon voted. You just know how many in Precinct 17B voted. Both. And you'll know after the fact, you're right, because yeah. they compare the names, right? Yeah. But even the name, you know, I'm a Sanchez, you're a Crendon Cruz, right? I mean, <laughs> there's a lot, and people don't know I'm yeah. half Samoan, right? Well, True. well okay, and if, if, if the Samoan vote was important to you, you'd want to know that, right? Yeah. So, uh, but, uh, but, but we also know that a large population group lives in, uh, in Dededo, have come from uh, uh, Filipino roots, right? Mm -hmm. But we also know most of us living on Guam have Spanish, Filipino, uh, Chamorro blood in us, yeah. right? And and some other mix, right? Because we're a very friendly people. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, I mean, that's the beauty of living here in the melting pot uh, uh, and the ability to tolerate each other culturally uh, and ethnic ethnically, although we, we see some struggles. You know, uh, as I get older, I, keep, I find myself saying more and more, Humans are funny people, right? And, and it's amazing what we go to war for. It, it's, um, it's amazing what we fight over. Uh, I, I have dear family members involved with rugby. And this weekend, there was a huge fight over, you know, involving parents and children. So, you know, it had nothing to do with ethnicity or village. Yeah. But why were parents... It, it, it seems like it's, more, like it's a more, uh, maybe a generational, <laughs> generational yeah. thing. But, okay, okay. Um, we do have some new numbers. Okay. But Nick is getting ready, so... Um, we just need to stretch. All right. So more. one of the things That's I easy. wanted to do is I kind of <laughs> wanted to go and analyze who's making it into the legislature. 
So we've got some new names, and it's there's a couple I think that we expected. Uh, I think everybody kind of expected that Malafunction was going to do well. Yeah. Um, I think you know anybody who has been in the media who does yeah. investigative reporting with that interesting twist that he has had, uh, has high name recognition, is going yeah, to Chris do has, well. Has a huge has has and had a huge following. Um, exactly. Even back for you know when he was just strictly um, you know. Uh, an entertainer, mm -hmm. yes. and then he. he, he yes. He, well, now he's on the biggest stage, the even bigger stage. Yeah. Because, he is because yeah. now you have to actually produce, and and you know I, uh, and and I like Chris a lot, and I, I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of senator he will be. But I've seen some of his interviews, and he was very direct about. it. He says, "Hey, I don't have all the answers. I don't have the solution. In, you know, I don't have the solution to world peace or full employment or you know crime, right? Mm -hmm. And crime, like in, in his interviews, he, he like many of the candidates said, crime is a big concern for our people." It's easy to list the problem. It's much harder to figure out the solution. And then you got to do it until you get eight votes in the legislature or 10 if the governor doesn't agree with you. You know, it ain't going to happen, right? And, and now, now you're working together with other people who you might agree on this issue, but not agree on that issue. But yeah. hey, I need your vote on this. And, and, and the, the log rolling and the, and the horse yeah. trading, as much as you, you know, don't like to see the sausage making, when you're in the legislature and you're the governor, you're making sausage. Yeah. And sometimes you got to hold your nose. Other surprises on there, though. So you've got Tom Fisher. Um, yeah. And I think. I wasn't surprised. What, thought, what was significant about that, I wasn't really surprised either. Um, you know, Governor Calvo came out, endorsed him early on, and that was, uh, you know, a and he's sort of well a respected. signature. He's been around in Guam a long time. It was a signature time. endorsement, mm -hmm. and he's put a lot of effort. You heard his mm -hmm. campaign ads mm -hmm. come out really mm -hmm. early. He put a lot of money mm -hmm. into it, mm -hmm. so um, he's up there. And Roy Kanata, you know, the youngest member yep. of this legislature, and the one thing that was impressive about him was what a machine he had. I mean, if you saw during the rallies, yeah. He would have his whole team. They all had the matching shirts. They had the the you know the mm -hmm. forms out, and the the trucks were all done with their with their uh, signs. Yeah, I gotta say I didn't know a whole lot about Roy, but you mm -hmm. know I keep hearing a lot more about him now. But mm -hmm. active as a student, mm -hmm. and I think that sort of carried over. Mm -hmm. I mean, he started mm -hmm. out being really active, being very political. Yeah, and he's obviously run a very uh, good campaign because it. he's in the top ten. He yep. is in yep. the top you know, ten. I, I, and we Dwayne need to continue Nicholas. this in, in a moment okay. because um, Nick is ready now up oh, at uh, Election okay. Central. Let's we got. Some new numbers. All right, Nick, take her away. Here at the Election Return Center in the University of Guam. The guy's actually behind me turning up the music to keep the blood flowing as the election results continue to run through the tabulation machines. But let's bring you the results now. 48 of the 67 precincts counted. Thus far, many of them coming from Dededo and Jigo, the villages, and the largest amount of registered voters that uh, many of the camps have been waiting for, many of the parties have been waiting for today. For the gubernatorial race, Leon Guerrero Tenorio, 13,335 votes, that's 55.37 percent. Camacho Adep, 10,632 votes, that's 44 0.15%. Again, Leon Guerrero Tenorio showing still a lead and moving further ahead from the Camacho Ada team with 13,335 votes. Camacho Ada, 10,632 votes. They're grooving nearby me, guys, but stay with me. The delegate race, James Moylan, 12,446 votes. Judy Wampat, 11,182 votes. James Moylan still in the lead by with a 50. 2.36% of the votes and 47.04% for Judy Wampat. In the senatorial race, we have Speaker Teresa Lahi still in the lead, 15,900. Daryl Chris Barnett, 15,373. Amanda Shelton, 12,812. Joseph Augustine, 12,690. Tina Munoz Barnes, 12,127. Frank Blas Jr., 11,256. Tom Fisher, 10,182 votes. William Parkinson, 9,864. Roy Kanata, 9,812 votes. Chris Duanius, 9,675 votes. Dwayne St. Nicholas, 9,169 votes. Tello Taitagui, 8,960. Sabina Perez, 8,934. Joanne Brown, 8,838 votes. 8,794 for Jesse Lujan. Kelly Marsh-Titesno, 8,443. 
8,332 for Marianne Silva Tyron, John Savarez with 8,298, Sarah Thomas Nenadog, 8,291, 7,883 for Jose Terlahi, Fred Berdalio Jr., 7,878, 7,617 for Vince Borja, 7,400 for Shirley Mabini Young, Michelle Hope Tights Snow, 7,343. 6,493 votes for Angela Santos, Joaquin Leon Guerrero with 6,344 votes, Sandra Sow, 5,611, Bisher Mendiola with 5,433 votes, uh, David Chrysostomo with 4,928 votes, and Ian Catling with 2,711 votes, and of course the GEC counting also 423 riding candidates under the legislative race. Now over to the AG race, where it looks still pretty close, neck and neck for both candidates here. Doug Mullen still in the lead though, with 10,982 votes. That's 46.78% of the votes for that race. Leaving Camacho, 10,684 votes, 45.51%. Again, Doug Moylan, 10,982. Leaving Camacho, 10,684 votes. For the write-ins for that race, 1,808 votes thus far. The Guam Education Board, from top to bottom, Mary Okada, 15,067. Peter Alexis added 12,405. Angel Sablon, 11,046. 10,070 for Raman Ninch, Maria Gutierrez, 9,908. Lourdes Benaventi, 9,699 votes. Elaine Ujoa, 8,007. Joseph Santos, 7,339 votes. Renati Camacho, 7,309 votes. For the Consolidated Commission on Utilities race, Simon Sanchez topping it off with 11,878 votes. Mike Limtiaco with 9,472 votes. Francis Santos, 8,616 votes. Melvin Duenas, 8,534 votes. 8,140 for Nonito Blas. And for Ricardo Ampinko, 7,027 votes. Again, this is 48 of the 67 precincts. So uh, if my math is correct, guys, help me out here. About 19 more precincts to go. And again, many of them still in the large districts that have yet to be counted. But uh, again, a lot of the results that have been coming in, we've seen thus far showing similar trends throughout most of the races, especially for the legislative race, the top goat getters that we saw, at least for the top 10 uh, candidates there. But of the 60,462 registered voters, this amount that was um, that did show up to cast their ballots and of those that were counted so far 24,451 ballots cast total voter turnout so far that has been counted 40.44 percent and of course the GEC is still pretty excited about those numbers even though it does still seem pretty low as you've been discussing there on the show but again this is 48 of 67 precincts counted and recap for governor and lieutenant governor race Bianca Guerrero Sonorio, 13,335 votes, and Camacho Adep, 10,632. We're almost there with just 19 more precincts to go. We'll let you know and cut back in when we have those results. For now, we'll send it back to you. All right, Nick, thank you very much. Uh, let me just, uh, we've got some uh, graphics that we can throw up there just to help you visualize the results that Nick just went through, and we'll go through them uh, one more time, and then we'll have uh, Ginger and Simon uh, talk a little bit about that if you can just throw up the first graphic there and this is the uh, gubernatorial race uh, uh, 13,335 to 10,632 um, this is 48 of 67 precincts reporting in the gubernatorial race moving on to the um, House of Representatives non-voting delegate uh, Jim Moylan 12,446 to Speaker Juan Pat's 11,182. Next race, Attorney General, this is another close one, 10,684 for incumbent Levin Camacho, 10,982 for uh, Doug Moylan, the former um, AG, and I wanted to point out that there are write-in votes, um, I think it was 1,808, 7.7%. We cannot say, of course, because we don't know for sure who those writing votes are for, but there is a writing candidate, Peter Santos, Attorney Peter Santos, 
So you can assume um, that the bulk of that is for him. Uh, next uh, race is for uh, senatorial. Um, Speaker Therese Rulahi has uh, maintained uh, her lead, as has uh, Chris Burnett. Uh, the top two spots, Amanda Shelton, Joseph and Augustine, Tina Rose, Munya Barnes, the top five. That's been consistent all night, as has uh, Frank Bloss Jr. and Tom Fisher in the sixth and seventh slots. They are Republicans, followed by um, two newcomers, two Democrat newcomers, Will Parkinson and Roy Kinata. And rounding out the top 10 is Minority Leader Chris Duenas. So the top 10, seven Democrats, uh, three Republicans. Next page. Dwayne St. Nicholas uh, making a good showing. He's a newcomer as well, 9,169. In the 12th slot is Republican Tello Taidegui. Um, incumbent Democrat Sabina Perez is inched up uh, at 13. Uh, incumbent Republican uh, Joanne Brown at 14. And uh, at number 15 is Jesse Lujan. I think that's 9-6 right now, if, they, if it stayed the way it is uh, right now. Um, in the 16th slot is uh, former Senator uh, Dr. Kelly March Titano. Uh, 17 is another um, former Senator, Mana Silva Tyrone. She's a Republican. 18, Jonathan Savaris. 19, Sarah Thomas Nedadok. And coming in the 20th spot is incumbent Jose Pito Turlahi, which right now looks like um, he's in grave danger of uh, losing his spot. Um, on the next page, uh, 21, uh, Fred Bredaglio, former police chief, Vince Borja, former Senator uh, Sam Mabini Young, uh, Michelle Hope Titano, a Republican, Angela Santos, a Democrat, and uh, the last five are all Republicans Ken Leon Guerrero, Sandra Sayo, um, Bistra Mendiola, David Chrysostomo and Ian Catling. So that's your senatorial race as it stands right now. The top 15 would be breakout to uh, nine Democrats and uh, six Republicans. You guys, let's go through some of the, the, the close races. Um, uh, let's start with uh, the non-voting non -voting delegate uh, where James Moylan has 52.3 uh, uh, to a 47.0 percent lead over uh, former Speaker Judith Wanpat, 12,446 to 11,182. What do you guys think of that, Ginger? So it's interesting. Um, Jim Moylan has 1,264 more votes than Judy Wanpat. Um, I think that there is more going on there, obviously, than the coattails on the Camacho Atta team, even though they did uh, run together in a sense. You, you constantly saw them campaigning and, and mutually reinforcing the, uh, the campaigns. One of the interesting things I noted is if you look at the total number of votes now for Camacho Atta, it's at 10,632. If you compare that, Jim Moylan has 12,446 votes. And then another interesting comparison is the top Republican vote getter is Frank Bloss Jr., who has 11,259 votes, which is also more than the Camacho Atta team had. So you, you actually have the top Republican senatorial and the um, Republican. But the uh, difference there is you have 15 votes in the senatorial race, right? True. So yeah. versus true. a governor, you have one or the one. other. Yep. But so, you know, I, I but um, thinking with what, uh, and basically agreeing with what Ginger's talking about, I, I looked at. Uh, Again, Governor Leon Guerrero and, and Lieutenant Governor Tenorio have 13,300 votes. Uh, Judy Wanpat has 11,000 votes. So from her point of view, she's going to go, wow, who are those 2,000 people that voted for Lou that didn't vote for me? Mm -hmm. And uh, Jim Moylan has got more votes than Camacho Atta. So clearly he must have had some of Lou and Josh's votes in addition to Camacho Atta votes. And, and, in the, and in the, I think the hard part, I think, for Ginger and me and all of us is, the in, you know independence right and, yeah. uh, and I would say today when we grew up party affiliation was much stronger right and you were a Democrat or Republican today it's it's much less uh, of, of, uh, of uh, the reason you, you vote yeah. mm -hmm. I think most it's people more, in Guam more are issue related voting but I wanted to wanted you know Ginger mentioned coattails um, Moylan aligned himself very closely with with Mike San Nicholas he did and I'm wondering if maybe some of that mm -hmm. vote uh, went to him in, in this race I, th I think you're right and then and then ginger brought up a good point you know the uh, the perception of speaker one Pat's position on the military buildup uh, on self-determination right that uh, she may be suffering from a perception that she is not 
pro-American, even though she's a very patriotic uh, American wo woman, right? But th th that perception, I think, haunts her uh, when you're running for a seat, when you're going to the United States Congress. Uh, you've taken positions with the UN that s seem, appear to some to be anti uh, American, right? Uh, and I think she's sort of paying that price of who do you think will best get along with the United States of America in Congress, because that's what you, you got to do in Congress. You got to get along to get things done, right? It, and it's in some ways it's a little unfair because the, you know, from Ben Blas, who I got involved with, from, from Mr. Wanpat to Ben Blas, you know, the ambassadors in Congress from Guam. Uh, Mr. Underwood, uh, Madeline, and now Jim and Judy are, are battling out. You know, they, they really can go and speak for Guam, but it's always been pretty much, even with Congressman Underwood, who yeah. clearly has very strong positions on self-determination, he still was able to navigate within the Congress, right, uh, what he had to do to be successful, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I think uh, Jim maybe has been, uh, Senator Moreland has been able to better articulate that he would better navigate through the halls of Congress because he's pro build up. Right, uh, I think he, he is not for the Chamorro only vote, right? And you can see in our community, it, uh, the Chamorro only vote is very galvanizing to a, a I would say a smaller, uh, but very vocal and articulate population, but to the, to the group. I was the last uh, self-determination commission executive director in 1988. Right. We did That's the right. last plebiscites. We haven't had a vote despite yeah. every governor saying Chamorro self-determination and political status is important. We haven't had a vote since 1987, which is a long 35 years ago, because it's because you get into the fight about who gets to vote, well, and, and nobody wants to get into the fight. And the, the fight. interesting thing is, the longer that we wait, the demographics has dramatically changed. Yeah. So if you looked at the demographics which came out with the latest 2020 census, you're now seeing the number of Filipinos creeping up to the point to where they're only a few points away from the number of Chamorros on islands. But I think it's but uh, my theory, right? And I'm a sociologist. Uh, mm -hmm. Think about July 21st, 1944, right? That, and how far Guam has come. But after that, there was a huge out migration of Chamorros, right? Right. And they went to San Diego, Washington D.C. federal jobs, right? But think about this. Uh, and I've had this conversation with, with Judge Klitsky. You know, if, if you, if there's, a, there's reasons why you say being a colony is a bad thing. It's the, pejoratively, it's, it's a negative, right? We mm -hmm. should be self-governing. But at the end of the day, the people of Guam are quite comfortable being Americans, even if they're a colony. Right. And even if they're mad at their country, because even Americans are, get, can get mad at their country, right? But they right. stay American. Nobody's burning passports. So the issue has survived because of a very articulate and vocal group. But I think when you say you vote with your, your pocketbook, the people of Guam, for better or for worse, have said, we like being American. And, and whether I move to Oxnard or stay in Sinahanya, I'm keeping my blue passport, and, I think and it's not a big issue to me. Diaspora that's may have expanded into states that might be equal in population, but but hold that thought because I want to continue this conversation. But we do have uh, Tomas Maglonia standing by in Saipan with the latest on that uh, discrepancy <laughs> or that uh, dis dispute earlier. Uh, Tomas, uh, what what's the latest? Yes, Nestor, we just heard from the Deputy Attorney General Lillian uh, Tenorio about that uh, contested box. Uh, apparently it holds 139 votes from the Northern Islands. Those are early votes. And just for context, according to the CEC website, there's 184 voters in the Northern Islands. So uh, this uh, vast majority of those votes, of course, of concern. Uh, the Democratic Observer, uh, Danny Kitagua, brought that up uh, as a concern. Um, and I I'm not sure if we have the video up uh, uh, in production, but uh, we they did, in fact, cut open the box. Uh, we observed them counting those ballots. And uh, we just learned from the CEC executive director and the deputy AG that there's 139 in those. It seemed the, the, the situation seems to have reached a resolution, at least based on that conversation that we heard just moments ago between uh, the Democratic observers and uh, the uh, conversation with uh, the executive director and with the AG's office. Uh, I should also mention we spoke with a source uh, who's familiar with the matter, who also um, spoke to uh, the unique serial uh, labels that are on there, uh, basically a, a unique identifier uh, that is still on the box that is separate from the actual lock. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, the, the key just didn't work. It, um, no one is using the word uh, lost uh, to describe um, 
where this key might be or why the key doesn't work. Uh, one of the board members telling us that it might be a manufacturer issue. Uh, at the end of the day, the Democratic Observer saying that it's about upholding the integrity of the election, and uh, it seems as though a resolution has been met, and they are going to match those 139 votes because they know how many came in from the Northern Islands uh, to see if that uh, also matches up as an extra security measures. But again, uh, one of the points that was stressed to me uh, was that uh, even outside of the locks, there are serial codes on those box boxes uh, that um, can further con confirm uh, that there was no tampering in it. And so uh, the Democratic Observer seemed to give uh, the uh, AG, uh, Deputy AG a thumbs up, and uh, the voting process here continues. Uh, but Nestor, still no official results. Uh, they're, we were told that they're using one machine and they're um, counting votes uh, with that one machine from Saipan. They'll go to um, apparently at the Northern Islands now, uh, Tinian, then Rota, then they'll activate the second machine to uh, start counting the uh, election day votes. And uh, you heard that earlier from uh, uh, the executive director, Igatol herself. So again, uh, the issue around uh, that box, uh, they had to decide to cut it open, and now they're doing that cross verification to ensure the integrity of the election. Nestor, and I uh, will continue to bring you the latest news here, and we're still waiting for the results. Yeah, Tomas, thank you very much. And I imagine a chain of custody might also play a factor in that. And, and uh, I'm sorry to hear that uh, the voting has not uh, been released yet. Uh, the count, the tally rather, has not been released yet. But uh, hang in there, my friend. Um, uh, are, are they I'm able sure to tell how many? Uh, the size of that precinct and how many ballots uh, were cast in there. I mean, that's usually what they have to do is inventory. So many ballots get given per precinct because that's how many registered voters there are. And then you count who actually voted, right? And we were using the analogy if it's a precinct of 500 people and there's 1,000 ballots in there, then you I, get concerned, right? I think they're going to do that tally now. Is, yeah, that, is that correct, uh, Tomas? They're going to they're right, kind of yes, match uh, up. Uh, the yes, vote we, number do. Voters we, with that. we yeah. did see and them uh, hang counting it, and they confirmed that number to the Democratic Observer, uh, to the Democratic Observers, plural. And uh, again, uh, they're they're moving forward with the process and uh, hoping that no other boxes need to be cut open. Yeah, and, and we don't we don't want to uh, imply anything at this point. No, uh, it no. was it's just, yeah. it was just a question that was raised because right. of the key situation, right. and uh, you know it could and, perfectly. And they know how many be, voted because yeah. yeah. you sign in, so they can count. Okay, yeah. so many yeah. people from this precinct signed in to vote, so there needs to be that many ballots in that precinct box, and there should be so many blank ballots yes. because right. people didn't vote, and you add it together, and it should equal the precinct size. So yeah. yes, I, I'm sure they know uh, how to do yeah, it. And th that's exactly key, and that's why the serial numbers, which are those orange tags you might see in our B-roll or over my shoulder here, that's separate from the lock in which they can identify what was delivered and when it's a think of it as its own barcode so to speak and so uh, it has its unique identity so um, hopefully uh, the election will move forward and we'll get you results before the sun rises all right thanks a lot uh, Tomas appreciate it and uh, let us know when you got anything new okay so they haven't run right. any any right. numbers for the Saipan election yet? The no, no, election. no numbers from Saipan yet. No, no from Saipan. Okay. okay. All right. Well, let's, let's get back to our race. Okay. Let's All get right. back to our race and so, our discussion. I mean, I, so one of the things that I think was was interesting, um, and w when you look, I mean, there were, there were tracking polls that were being done. So there was a bit of an indication of trends. You know, they're not perfectly accurate, of course, but you at least get a trend. Is somebody doing better? Are messages working? Are messages not working? And one of the things that we saw towards the end of the congressional race was this pickup in the negative messaging in which Jim Moylan was putting a lot of ads out that were framing what he wanted people to believe about Judy Wompat. He, he was pushing these issues of, you know, the, the, uh, the pay raise issue, which of mm -hmm. course was something that affected uh, the senatorial candidates when, when that occurred uh, several years ago. And then the second thing was sort of trying to create this sense that somehow Judy Wampat was against uh, the military buildup or yeah. against the military, which is ironic because she was one of the people who created one Guam. She was one mm -hmm. of the people who actually yeah. tried to bring an integration to but military. I would say that Speaker Juan Pat has been very consistent over her her career mm -hmm. about her her thoughts on self determined political uh, more self determination uh, political status who should and vote. and you know right. and, and I, I I appreciated the way she framed it right she right. she 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 loves her country but she wants to make sure her country treats Guam well and that's sort of the kind of her messaging but I don't think it's just Jim Moylan reminding people in the last three months because 
uh, people know Judy and have known the speaker for many, many years, and, they, and she's been very consistent about her position. I think the cha her challenge was when she chose to run for Washington's seat, our seat in Washington, she, people remember not just what Jim Moylan is saying in the last 90 days, they, they remember her whole, her whole career, right? And, and maybe, and where I agree with you, well, I agree with you a lot, but may, maybe the pay raise was, okay, that's, that's, that's a negative hit on your opponent, right? But the, the perception of who will communicate, work better with Washington when yeah. you're the Washington and, delegate, and, and I, 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 think I think her career yeah, and I think has been a bigger is, challenge. Timing is everything too, right? Because the importance of the military, in particular because of now. this military buildup, right. is pouring billions of dollars into our economy that we wouldn't otherwise be in bad shape if we didn't get, played a role in this too, probably, because yeah. but, um, but there's that, a, that so, nobody wants to ruffle the, the military yeah. feathers. Right, so, so you're point. right, and that was a key issue, but the thing that I'm sort of noticing underneath both of those points, which are were absolutely correct, is this sort of insidious third piece, which is the effectiveness of a negative message. And you had one candidate who absolutely old-fashioned said, I am sticking to the high road. I am not going to defend myself. I'm not going to you know, aggressively try and correct a misperception. Because I think there was a broad brush, I think, that was painted, or that, that Jim Moyland mm -hmm. uh, tried to paint with his ads, which was making it sound like Judy Wompat was anti-American, mm -hmm. in a sense, which absolutely she's not. I mean, of course she's not. She's, she's been working on these issues. She has positions, and she's very careful how she articulates those positions, and she's very intelligent in how she does them. But because they're so layered, sometimes that's lost. And so when you come up with a message that then just oversimplifies it and accuses your competitor of saying, oh, well, you know, yes, Nestor, you're anti-American. And if I put out a hundred ads and I say you're anti-American, and you say, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the high road. Of course, I'm not anti-American. That's mm -hmm. not who I am. I am a person who's gonna make sure that we're gonna, you know, get the right thing for Guam in the military buildup. But does the high road work in a post-Trump world? Now we're getting to what I'm what I'm getting mm -hmm. at. Okay, so I would suggest that Donald Trump and perhaps not the person, but perhaps it's just sort of this point in time, has changed the dynamic of how people are or are not relating to candidates when they're trying to listen to the messages. And that these blunted messages, which are shorter and which are more targeted, are perhaps hitting. And perhaps candidates who thought that taking a high road or having a noble cause or explaining something mm -hmm. more carefully are getting swept away in a Twitter world where if you can effectively land a punch, voters are going to listen to that, they're not going to pay attention to the, all the dialogue, and they're just going to go with the message. I, I just think, though, in the case of uh, Speaker Juan Pat, you know, a tiger can't change their stripes, right? And just because you take the high road or, you know, that doesn't mean you're still not a tiger, right? The, I, I believe in this case, because it's a Washington seat, I think the speaker is suffering from a perception, right or wrong, and not just because Jim Moylan ran some ads in the last three months. Mm -hmm. She has been very consistent about her position on self-determination, tomorrow self-determination, and she's made some strong comments, whether it's at the UN or, or on Guam, mm -hmm. uh, which is perceived, right or wrong, uh, by some voters, apparently, that she would not be the best uh, person to articulate Guam's desires in Washington. Mm -hmm. And and Jim, uh, Senator Moylan, is appearing tonight, or today, yesterday, uh, to be uh, more, uh, uh, or he reflects more of what apparently mo most voters uh, on Guam, when they think about that seat, mm -hmm. uh, they, they are more comfortable sending someone who is perceived to be friendlier to America, I guess, if that's the right phrase, uh, than, than well, sending someone who's less friendly. Right, so, I mean, that's yeah. right but I'm just saying the speaker has, has been very consistent, consistent about her position. You know, uh, I mean, I've been, you know, you, you've got to travel the world and do some really cool things, but, you know, I've, I've watched these elections every two and four years, and clearly when, when you think about Speaker Wanpat, uh, you think of her in this way, right? Mm -hmm. 
many positive things, but if you have a negative in this case, uh, it's, it might be her thinking on self-determination, her positions with America, with the military buildup. I mean, even she had to reframe, reframe her, let's make sure the military buildup works for us. So she went from being against the buildup to, I like the buildup if it work, works for us. But where she's had to temper, I'm not, I'm not for the buildup. Mm -hmm. But you still can't change the perception that a tiger is a tiger and not a lion. Mm -hmm. And those yeah. are her stripes that mm -hmm. she's earned, for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. And it worked when she was running for the legislature, uh, except when she had the challenge with the pay raise, which had nothing to do with political status, had everything to do with the pay raise. But okay. I would just say I don't oh, think Jim, Jim so much uh, brought in something new about Speaker yeah. Ron Pat. Uh, she just chose to run for a seat that brings those questions, those, those issues to the fore, and she's been perceived right or wrong uh, in one way when it comes to Washington issues, and Senator Jim took advantage of that in the advertising, mm -hmm. but I still think, you know, uh, uh, the speaker's been very consistent, yeah. uh, to, her, to her credit. I yeah. mean, she stands by her guns, okay. but uh, it's perceived the way it's perceived, and you're seeing that when it comes to Washington in 2022, they're leaning towards Senator Moreland because they perceive, right okay. or wrong, yeah. that he's point, going to be more point, successful in Washington. Point, point well taken. Uh, let's move on to another Moreland. Uh, this is uh, Doug Moreland uh, again in the There's AG race the against Levin Camacho, which is an even closer race. We've got 10,982 votes for Doug Moreland, 46.78%. To leave in Camacho's 10,684 votes, 45.5 percent, pretty much what I would consider a dead heat. Yeah. But we also have 1,808 write-in votes. So tell Spoiler. me about that and, and the implications of the. Let me share some numbers because yeah. Ginger was in here in 2018, and I, I've, this is the third time they've battled each other, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, these guys go at it. Talk about you know Fraser Ali. So in the 28 general election. Levin got 24,000 votes to 11,000 votes for Doug Moreland, right? Mm -hmm. In the 2022 primary, Doug Moreland still got 11,000 votes. So he's got 11,200 people there with him for AG, right? But Levin dropped from 24,000 to 11,500, 13,000 votes. Now, some of that is, uh, is a turnout, right? Mm -hmm. If they didn't show up, some of his votes, some of his voters may not have turned out. But, you know, mathematically and politically, that's a huge drop to go from 24,000 down to 11. And, and we're seeing now that it's, it's neck and neck. What was a blowout in 2018 is a nail biter. This is the one we'll watch all night, plus whether 9-6 holds. Mm -hmm. you know, we, so, as Ginger and I were talking about, so, the, the So it's a referendum on Levin's four-year tenure as AG? It, it, it appears to be. Now, he, stay, he still may win, and, and Doug's got his base, but uh, so... When I lost my seat in the legislature, I went from second to 16th, right? I angered my base, right? And I lost my seat. Uh, for whatever reasons, Lima's not getting 24,000 votes that he got in 2018. He's only at 11, and we're at 70% of the, the count, right? And you can say that mathematically, lower turnout will reduce his 24, but it shouldn't reduce his 24,000 by 13,000 votes. So it is, in many ways, a, a referendum. On, on how the people of Guam perceive that office and what they expect from the elected AG. I think that's uh, that's also so, a smarter um, assignment to what the voters are going to do. I, I don't think that many voters sat there and went through Levin's record and said, oh, we're not like super happy with what he's doing. I think it's more just a sort of a gut reaction to crime. Yeah, crime point. is something that is being grappled with all across the nation and it, it kind it's a cyclical thing you know I, I don't like it when you know the public just broadly accuses politicians of somehow mm -hmm. oh crime is rising it's your fault mm -hmm. okay yep. obviously not yep. you know the the politicians are not the one who are responsible their job is to control it so when crime starts to rise then the public tends to get a more hard edge. Mm -hmm. They want to throw the book at people. They want to put them in jail for a much longer time. They want it to be, you know, three strikes and you're out. They're, they're a lot harder edged. When crime is more under control, people want their family members taken care of. They want rehabilitation. They want their uncle back. He, mm -hmm. he did his time. Mm -hmm. He needs to come back to his family. You know, and he's, mm -hmm. he's served what he needed to do. So I think that there is just a natural cycle to, to crime and COVID contributed to it. Um, mm -hmm. The economy obviously contributed to it. I mean, this is something beyond our control, the cost of living, all of these things have put people in a situation where they're more desperate, it might drive them to use drugs, and it just generally mm -hmm. contributes to an atmosphere, an environment where people want something more done. They're more mm -hmm. aggressive. 
Um, and I think that in this case, you saw that Doug Moylan spoke to that because he was very, very mm -hmm. aggressive. And Levin Camacho was talking about a much more policy structured approach, which, I mean, if you talk to the judges in, in the Superior Court, I mean, they agree with it. There is a lot to be said for a more comprehensive approach of dealing with the issue rather than Crime just simply drug. throwing the book and having a bigger yeah. prison. Yeah. But so I, people so don't want to hear it. that I, right I, I, now. Did, did Peter Santos? Uh, oh, Kansas spoiler, make, make, 100%. Make difference here? Well, Huge. I, I mean, it, it was it was close even before Peter ran. I mean, he, he took votes away from both of them, I think, right? Really? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I could be wrong, right? mm -hmm. but uh, I, I think Ginger uh, is more accurate. I totally agree with Ginger that for whatever reasons, the issue of crime is being uh, looked at in the AG's race much. Uh, people are reacting to that. I mean, you know, people were criticizing both governors about their stance on crime and, all, and, and senators do something about crime, but you're not seeing them being the target of a vote in the same way that Ginger, I think, has articulated very well that th this is more, the people of Guam are concerned about crime and they're trying to find out who at the AG's office. They, they're personifying that that office in particular, mm -hmm. less so than the governor or a senator, ha has a more yeah. right. direct impact on crime. And, you know, the irony is, the legislature makes the laws that are enforced by the AG. So you, right. you would think logically, hey, you better yell at some senators because it's their laws that the AG's prosecuting and, and winning or not winning, right? right. But I, I think Gin, Ginger's right in this case that crime is, is huge concern, but it's not, it's not uh, translating so much into the gubernatorial or legislative races, as, but it's definitely playing a role in the AG. Yeah, and I'll give you a, an extreme example of how much crime plays in, into electorates. Um, Rodrigo Duterte, you know, oh, he came yes. to power yeah. because the Philippines was experiencing this, you know, uh, this ice crisis, and he said, "I'm going to come in. I'm going to kill him, kill people." They, yeah. And they said, "Okay, okay, <laughs> come on in." Unbelievable, you know, and, yeah. and he and he You're became president out of, right. out, of, out of nowhere. He he, yeah. he became the, right. the president yeah. of the Philippines. Yeah. So, yeah. You know. but in that case, the, that was a get tough at the at the executive presidential level. Um, I'm not seeing the, the same correlation to the governor's race or the, in, the, we have the new folks joining the legislature and you have a lot of incumbents st staying. So still, the incumbents in the legislature are not being blamed for cr high crime on Guam, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they're, because most of them are going to get back in, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think the battle between Governor Liu and Governor Felix, when it comes to crime, I think both peop people are saying, Okay, you're sort of equal. I'm gonna vote. I'm gonna vote for other reasons for you, or not for you, mm -hmm. for other reasons. But it, it's not as much as crime. I'm sure crime is it influences everyone's vote. Mm -hmm. But I, I think Ginger's but that right. Is, when that she, number changed when she looks at the AG right. race. I yeah. think that that's exactly what this is. This that is when change. people say, "I want to vote on crime." It's the AG race that is reflecting their view of it, right? Okay. Uh, and who would be most effective, more so than the gubernatorial race or the legislative race, because there's also a perception, legislators write the law, the governor tries to implement the law, but when a crime is committed, after the police arrest you, it's up to the AG to figure out right. what happens to you, you right. know, to that alleged uh, criminal. Okay, we have seven, 71% of the vote in, 48 of 67 precinct in the gubernatorial race. Yes. Um, Leon Guerrero Chinorio, 13,335. Yes. which is 55.37%. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Camacho Ad at 10,632, 44.15%. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Is that big, a big enough sample to make any kind of uh, so proclamation? The, the gov Governor Lou got 55% of the vote in the primary, and she's getting 55% of the vote in the general election. And we had low turnout in the primary, and it's appearing we're having low turnout in the general, lower than, than usual. And uh, I always suspected that low turnout helps Governor Lou more because she's got her 12,000 and, and a base. Governor Felix had to craft together the, the Republican primary, the San Nicolas vote. I think there's a, th in there is an Ugin vote as well, mm -hmm. right? The, the ones that are for the governor, not for the governor. Mm -hmm. So the ones that are for the governor, the 12,000, they, they're clearly showing up. And it was, she, she won 55%. If you take uh, Mike San Nicolas and Governor Felix together, they got about 10,000. She mm -hmm. got 12,000, that's 55, 45. That seems to be holding, especially with lower turnout. If there was a higher turnout, that actually benefit would have benefited Governor Felix more because he has more people that didn't show up in the primary yeah. to attract and, and to move, right? But th uh, they're not showing up. The base and the Governor Lou is delivering her base. I think Governor Felix is delivering his base, but 
there's only there's fewer people even fewer people showing up yeah. in the general so uh, low turnout helped governor yeah. lou and i think as that I was the pre- i think you and i talked about yeah, it at the pre- golf course yeah, pre-vote, yeah, pre-vote, yeah. Uh, it, it turnout would that would, governor would felix needs a high factor. turnout yeah. and uh, because there's a lot of confidence that governor lou is going to deliver her twelve thousand, you know and and then it's what do the independents do and and again whether uh, 21,000 people, more people show up, that's 72% turnout. At 50%, 58% turnout, that's only like maybe 15,000 more people. Mm-hmm. Well, 6,000 people not voting makes a difference when in, in any race, right? Mm-hmm. And so uh, this is um, this trend, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. You're now approaching the fourth quarter of, yeah. a, fo- of a football game. Yeah. And we were talking off, offline about is it too early to, to call, but clearly the trend is pretty well established for Governor Liu. Um, and I think for Jim Moylan, you know, not that I'm calling anything, right? You still want to count them all. The 9-6 in the, in the legislature, the 16th person is a Democrat and the 17th person is a Republican. So again, the Dems, even if um, Kelly Marsh Titano moves in, she, she's, she's already in the 9-6 no, group, the, right? Yeah, no, uh, and, and the 15th is a Republican. So if Kelly Marsh moves in, then it's 10-5. If uh, Mana moves in and knocks out Jesse uh, Lujan, then it's still a Republican. So the 9-6 is appearing to also uh, be where it's going to be. But we're still going to watch uh, what happens between uh, uh, Senator, former Senator Lujan and former Senator Titano. Mm-hmm. That, was the, uh, that was the other thing I noticed. Three former senators, well, two former senators, uh, Kelly Marsh Titano and Mana Silva, mm-hmm. are just there on the bubble trying mm-hmm. to get in. Right, and uh, Pedo dropped. Pedo dropped, but you could tell from the primary, I, I, I think uh, it was a perception that he was going to have a trouble. So you've got one incumbent definitely, definitely out, probably out, you know, uh, with all due respect. You've got two former incumbents right there on the bubble, and then you've got one former incumbent at number 15 15. being the sixth Republican. And then you've got three new people, and they're all Democrats, right? So the Dems have done a good job, whether, and it could be Governor Lou's coattails, it could could be a number of things, and they work their butts off. They campaign uh, very hard. And that's what it takes to get into. But I think you also see some youth uh, going on here. I mean, you've got change. Yeah, I mean, the people who are doing well, who are rising up, are are younger uh, senatorial candidates. I Mm -hmm. mean, uh, Mm -hmm. Will Parkinson is younger. Roy Kanata is younger. Uh, Chris Barnett. Mm-hmm, so, I mean, you've mm-hmm. got a couple that are mm-hmm. coming in and, and people are looking to maybe get some, some new blood, some fresh mm-hmm. blood. Yeah. And what could be really good about this is maybe with younger members in the legislature, they will help to connect the legislature with voters who can see people their age or people yeah. who have their concerns. And, and that might help, yeah. And that might help turn out. Although, out although it's not bringing the turnout Hopefully. today, I think yeah. long term. I, I, I mean, there's always this, the changing of the guard, right? That yeah. eventually happens where you, you've run one time too many. This you, seems right, to have been a you know. much slower transition, I think. Uh, right? well, I mean, I, well, again, as Ginger pointed out in the primary, mm-hmm. a lot of the same people are still voting. Yeah. So you're still voting for people you know, right? Yeah. That's why incumbents do well, right? right? But maybe, as Ginger is also observing, that you're starting to see a trend. And, you know, the Republican Party, when I talk amongst the, that leadership and uh, – you know the legacy candidates of Camacho, Moylan, Calvo. You know, uh, you know that the next generation they're they're not they're not appearing to be candidates. Maybe they will later as the, as that generation ages. Mm-hmm. And so the real challenge of the Republican Party is okay. Now that Governor Felix has 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 run again, um, un- unless Governor Eddie runs again, the part that party needs to start looking for these young. They need to do what the young. Democrats are yeah, doing. Who, who the, would be the heir apparent uh, to to run for Adelou uh, should Felix not be successful? Who's who's waiting in the wings for the Republicans? I, I think that's the biggest challenge for the Republican Party. I mean, they've got some. We've got some great incumbents. Uh, you know, uh, former Senator. I mean, current Senator Frank Bloss, right? He, he he's been there, but you know, he's not a spring chicken either, right? Mm-hmm. And and uh, but he, although he's much younger than me, right? Uh, that just means I'm old, right? Yeah. But I, I think the party, the Republican Party, has a challenge in trying to figure out how do we get younger, how do we attract more folks and uh, it actually to me uh, and, and politics can always surprise you uh, uh, Phil Flores put it well the Democratic bench is much deeper than the Republican yeah. bench, I heard him say that right yeah and and I think we're, we're seeing that and now their bench the Democratic bench got even deeper because it looks like we're gonna have three new uh, senators and they are uh, four new senators and they're all 
Democrats. Democrats, and they're young. Yeah. And, and they're, and they're, and they're yeah. and, They have and, different perspectives. But the, the challenge that the Democrats have to overcome at the same time, I mean, we do have an amazing slate. I, I've been saying that. I mean, all the ones that we're running are amazing. But one of the challenges that we have to watch is keeping the party together because it is very much a big tent. And you do have factions of the Democratic Party. I mean, just remember 2018. I mean, yep. the fights <laughs> internally in the Democratic Party oh, yeah. are the one thing that have to be overcome because if they're able to overcome it and yes. they go as a group, unstoppable. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I was going to say that um, while the Democrats do have a, a, that young bench, um, yep. and in 26, um, mm -hmm. we're looking at two potential uh, young, relatively young men who would probably be the next candidates for the Democrats in right. 26, in Josh Genorio. Absolutely. And, and, and Michael Ginger Sinegal, Cruz. Right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah correct, Cruz, correct. Cruz, and but we, yeah, I mean, correct, that, correct. And, that, and that has yeah. always been, and we've said this multiple times mm -hmm. on, on these, um, you know, mm -hmm. discussion programs, that, you know, the Democrats can often be their worst enemies because when the Democrats split the party, right. the Republicans take advantage yeah. of it and... And, right. and, you know, there's examples of it in the last two yeah. Republican governors. And the other thing I noticed, okay, of course, now, with all of this said, it looks great for the Democratic Party. Now, they're, now they become the new target. They're, they're running the place, right? right? And in two or four years, if people are unhappy about crime and this and that, they go, hey, you know, what have you done for me lately? Now I'm mad at the Democrats. And, right. and that's sort of the cyclical nature of the party system, particularly on Guam. And the Republicans, maybe they'll start to grow some some new stars as as well. But yeah, it, it looks like if these trends are holding for the next two to four years, you're mostly yelling at the Democratic leadership of the community. That's that's going to be the governor and and be in the legislature. And in two and four years, if crime isn't any better and life isn't any better, then they get yelled at, and all of a sudden the Republicans start to look more attractive. And and so uh, interesting is that Governor Felix, when he won his first term. He won by almost 5,000 votes over mm -hmm. Bob Underwood and mm -hmm. Tom Ad, I think. But in his second term, he only won by like yeah, a he thousand dropped votes. Five he points. dropped. So again, he, 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 he was he was the God's he was the governor. Exactly. Yeah. And, and but we, we, that's they loved not him in 02, but when so he if after you looked at Felix, term, right? So Felix won mm -hmm. by 55 when he first made it mm -hmm. in. And when he ran for re-election, mm -hmm. it was 50-48. So he won right. by 50. Right. So he because dropped tart. five points. Right. But when Calvo won, he won by 50. And right. then when he ran again, he won by 64. Right, right. So now, is it that the candidate necessarily succeeded at what they were doing, you, but you can't completely assign it to the mm -hmm. candidates and, and the administration mm -hmm. because there is the environment that you're running in. Mm -hmm. There are mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. these external factors, right? Lou and Josh could have never in their wildest <laughs> dreams, if you would have paid them a million dollars to come up with the craziest thing ever, thought that there would be a pandemic that would <laughs> shut down the world and put an end to tourism for two years. I mean, you, you, you yeah. never expected that. Although and so, there, there was a pandemic plan developed by under Obama started thinking about it. And, I mean, there's and a then, pandemic well, plan, but whoever thought it was right, going to turn out they like that, they have to right? Implement it, right? But now here's the thing that's interesting. It. So here's the thing that we're looking at, though. And, and right, Nestor, we've looked at the numbers on this one, and this is what's going to be fascinating. Now that the pandemic is handled... We are looking at the largest military buildup in Guam's history, pretty mm -hmm. much. We are looking at the rapid return of tourism, which is already exceeding mm -hmm. numbers. Not so rapid, it's going to come. It's going to come back. It's, it's a little bit back. faster than we thought yeah, it was yeah. going to. So it's it's the numbers are good. Yeah. We're still dealing. I get the currency. And, and when it comes back, it's going to add but to the buildup. But it's coming. Up. But so right? there's a huge expansion of and the economy. And then you have the federal funds for the infrastructure that yep. have been given out. Yeah, and so you've got Biden in there for two more years, mm -hmm. and they really are about getting that money out to help with renewable energy and help with infrastructure. And so if they are able to now that, you know, they were paused for two years, take those plans that they had, they have a once in a lifetime opportunity really to take all of these inputs and really turn something around in four yeah. years. And if they successfully do that, then Josh is going to be unstoppable they, in They'll four be years. like Eddie Calvo is winning such a strong yeah. second term. But, but the thing about Biden, I, you know, if, if the Republicans flip the House and even flip the Senate, um, He's not going to be able to get anything done in his last two years. I mean, I mean, Mitch McConnell and McCarthy have both said that that you know their intent is to you know actually reverse a lot of the things that that he's done. But that's not going to change the build-up money coming to Guam. In fact, it, right. if anything else, it may enhance yeah. it. So I, I think it's a point well made that that the military build-up is holding us 
federal spending, the federal funds, thank you for the federal funds, right, between the COVID money and the military spending, that's what's propped up the economy. That's why you have a, actually a growth in the GDP, as small as it is, it's still a growth during COVID, right? Mm -hmm. that's, what's, that's what's propping it up. When tourism returns over the next 6, 12, 18, 24 months, right, that's on top of all of this decade of federal spending. Yeah, right. And that's where I think the potential of the economic expansion of Guam and, and what, does, what, do the, what does the leadership of Guam, the governors and the senators and the Congress uh, persons uh, of, of Guam do with this additional monies of federal spending plus the re rebound of tourism, actually it makes, to me, it makes you very optimistic that the next decade on Guam could see a could huge really expansion, amazing. right? Absolutely. And especially if tourism rebounds on top of the federal spending, because those are still the two ways we eat on this island yeah. since No day matter one. how much we say diversification, yeah. there's no nothing that has much. When I was young, I said diversification, but as I'm older, I'm realizing, hey, you know, if you're, Michael Jordan tried to be a baseball player. Yeah. Uh, that didn't work out very well. We're good at tourism, CSAN, and we're good at strategic location for the United States government, yeah. right? And we might and as well ride these stallions as long as we well, can. Well, that's right? what we're good at. Yeah. Don't, let's not try to be a, a baseball I mean, player. I wouldn't be that pessimistic. There's a couple of things. I mean, you've got technologies that just as they've made solar affordable, which it wasn't 10 years ago, and just as solar has become affordable and become a real issue for renewable energy, I think agriculture and aquaculture is something that is a tangible product that Guam can get I into. I worry about economies of scale. But mm -hmm. the technologies have improved. It, it's a, I, and I saw that. There was a and great so this whole idea of doing it the old-fashioned way and trying mm -hmm. to you know, deal with the mm -hmm. weather and the mm -hmm. climate, if you start to do mm -hmm. like Taiwan does with mm -hmm. these vertical farms and you start to mm -hmm. use hydroponics and they've got the costs mm -hmm. down, that if Guam decided to be more self-sufficient and do that, there's a lot that can be but, done there. But the difference is this. Self-sufficiency in Guam is feeding mm -hmm. 160,000 people. Self-sufficiency in Taiwan true. is feeding, true. I don't that's know, millions true. of people. That's true. And that's where the economies of scale that's might true. still say, I'm still going to bring it in from Taiwan because right. God bless the farmer in Talafofo, but it's cheaper <laughs> to bring it in from Taiwan <laughs> even with the freight. So, Although you know, nowadays, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, but, it yeah, might be yeah. cheaper to get it here. Right, right. But there's yeah. also transshipment. There's also 3D printing. But we're already doing transshipment. We transship to all of everything that we goes do, to Micronesia. But we can grow that. Guam. We can grow that. Well, the only if those economies and expanding. Grow. Only, well, true, right. True. You know why the port's growing and expanding? Because mm. of the federal spend. Yes. And, and the military. Yeah, we're trying to move this huge generator from I the know. port, and God I bless uh, Rory Respicio for debating whether he should <laughs> charge us GPA a fee. Yeah. But yeah, the, that military spending, right? That, that's what we do well. Yeah. Right. That's when we're Michael Jordan, the yeah. basketball player. We're, we're still we're still looking for that third, we third leg enough? of the third leg of the. <laughs> so, stool. do you want me to call it? Yeah. Uh, w would you call um, forty-eight of sixty-seven precincts seventy-one percent with that lead? Thirteen three 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 over I will. ten six. I will call the winner of the gubernatorial race for the general election of twenty twenty-two mm -hmm. to. Governor Lulian Guerrero and Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio. Okay, that's the unofficial declaration mm -hmm. from yeah. uh, the senior advisor and, and, to. And if, and if you're in the Camacho camp, you know, you, your worry is that most of Dededo has come in and that was the only village the governor lost. So if you were in 2018, Governor Lou lost. So if you were hoping, all right, Dededo, uh, don't vote for Governor Lou again and come over to Governor Felix, right? Most of Dededo has spoken, and it's still roughly the same numbers, right? 55, 45. Not as dramatic as 60, 40, and not definitely not a 35-point spread. But you only need 50% plus one to be governor. So if you look at it that way, you're entering the fourth quarter. Uh, un unless Governor Camacho can pull a Tom Brady out of the remaining precincts, and and when you look at the profile, Tamuning's mostly in, Dededo's mostly in. You know, Tamuning's uh, is uh, yes, it's the hometown of both governors, but it den generally is. Republican. Barragata is Republican. I if think they hold at this number and they're able to get just a little bit more, if the South comes in, it will rank as one of the strong, the strongest. The only one that was stronger was 2014. Other than that, the best that any governor ever did since 1970 was 55%. And right now, they're at 55%. So yeah. that is a solid historical, I mean, you're 11 points up. I mean, that is a an yeah. absolutely solid win. So, okay. and, and it's been, I mean, it really hasn't changed from the very first results that it came was, out. It's been consistent, yeah. yeah. It's through, been very throughout. consistent. And, and Jim Moylan yeah. and Judy, I think it, yeah. it's the same uh, challenge yeah. for Speaker Juan Pat and the same opportunity for Jim Moylan. He, he looks like he's getting closer and closer to being yeah. the next delegate. Uh, the, the one we're really yeah. watching is the AG, AG. battle. Yeah. And, yeah. and the 9-6. But even the 9-6, I I think yeah. just from all my years of, of doing it, uh, let's put it this way. I've been in winning and losing war rooms. And at this point in the losing war room, you start talking about, okay, uh, if we, if these hold, 
how do you want to handle it candidate, right? You're talking about concession? Yeah. 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 So that maybe, is maybe my question. One, one do you, more, do you think more? Governor Felix Camacho would be giving a concession speech tonight? I, I don't know. You know, I'm not down there. Uh, I mean, as you and I said off, off camera, he's a good man, mm -hmm. right? And, and uh, he was trying to do something no one else had ever done, a third yeah. term, right? And the people of Guam... I don't know. You could argue Carl tried to do that a couple of times. Right, but okay. they never gave it to him, right? <laughs> this is but, true. but they me, gave incumbents, yeah. they've given incumbents two terms since okay. Joe Atta. All right. And this trend seems we gotta, to be We got to cut away because we've got a live shot down at uh, Leon Guerrero Genario headquarters with the governor herself. Uh, go, take it away, Hannah. Thanks, Nestor. I'm here with the governor and the lieutenant governor. Governor, what a great birthday gift. Thank you very much. And thank you to the people of Guam again for uh, uh, voicing and voting and for your vote of confidence in uh, this next four years in our leadership and your belief in our leadership. And we will uh, again move, down, move on forward with the challenges that uh, our island will face. And Governor, I know precincts are still being counted, but the numbers, it's quite obvious what's going to happen tonight. Mm -hmm. Any message to your supporters? Well, I guess I'll take you to the Yeah, I just want to thank all of them. Uh, you know, a lot of people sacrifice their time, uh, a lot of resources to work hard for this win. Uh, and this win is for the people of Guam. Uh, we are pledging to improve their quality of life. That's what our campaign and our administration has been about. And uh, it's just with a lot of humility, uh, humility uh, and uh, feeling of lots of gratefulness to, to be in this situation. And any message to Camacho Ada? Um, just that I think uh, the campaign has ended and we hope to uh, unite and uh, um, again be one uh, one unity for our island for the good of our people and what do you envision for the next four years well we envision a lot of things for the next four years um, our economy is strong we're going to see a lot of uh, military activities and of course that means uh, more revenues uh, for us we're going to create more jobs for our people uh, good paying jobs we're going to uh, shift the skills and talents of our people through um, boot camps, apprenticeship programs, the University of Guam, vocational and trades academy, uh, so that they can move into a career with a, a better paying job, which is, you know, that's how you lift people's quality of life. Uh, of course, we are going to, in this next four years, build the new hospital. We are also going to make sure that Simon Sanchez is built. It's almost at the point now of being RFP'd out for construction. Uh, we're going to continue to improve our roads so that our people can be safe when they're traveling. And we will also work at making sure that our people's, um, <clears throat> people's um, education is uh, address. We are going to be out there aggressively fixing our educational facilities so that our uh, students can continue learning in a conducive uh, learning environment. All right, and anything you'd like to add, Lieutenant Governor? Uh, just that uh, we congratulate everybody that will win, uh, and we look forward to working with anybody and everybody, no matter your political party uh, or your persuasion. There's a lot of things we can agree on, and let's work together. Thank Congratulations you. to you all. We'll send it back to you, Nestor. You heard there from uh, your bosses. Uh, what do you think? Uh, you know, it, it's something that uh, we did expect. Uh, we were very confident going into this. Uh, we felt that the message had been uh, given in as good a fashion as we could. We felt that the governor and lieutenant governor had made the case to get another four years, um, and, and we felt that our team had demonstrated that they took care of the island through some of its most difficult times, and they were asking for four more years to be able to continue mm -hmm. to do the work that they were doing. And, and I think it's really, um, I was saying the other, the other day that it really is, when you run for election, and you would know this, it's an affirmation that all of the sacrifice that you put into it as a public servant is coming back to you. I mean, to be the governor and to be the lieutenant governor, they have the most horrifically long days and weeks. I mean, they don't get a day off. They're constantly working. They're constantly, I mean, from 4 o'clock in the morning until late at night, every manner of thing that comes up, they work for the people of Guam. 
And in election time, sometimes it can get a little nasty and people can, you know, as you were saying, there's this, this negative campaigning sometimes that comes out. But really, at the end of the day, when people run for public office, they're doing it because they're really committed to the island. They are sacrificing their time and their energy. And so when you have something like this, when you have a night where we've got an 11 point spread, we've got a resounding mandate from the people of Guam to say, we trust you, you took us through the hard times, we want you to do it for four more years. I mean, that is, is satisfying in a way that only somebody who runs for office can really appreciate. And you know, I, I got to make it real quick because we're, we're going to go to uh, Mangilao, and I think there's some some more numbers. But real, real well, quick just that I heard more uh, Lieutenant Governor Josh talking about we're going to work together, we're going to work with everybody, and I was just reminded that every two-term governor at this time when they've won their second term. They do talk about the healing part. They said, we're in this together. we got to work together. It doesn't anybody, everybody. And that's where the people of Guam are very forgiving. Uh, Governor Felix has nothing to be to apologize for. He, he ran the best campaign he could. He, he's a good man. He's a, he's a great public servant. Uh, today, the people of Guam decided to go with Gov Governor Liu, two very dedicated people that love their island and are willing to make these sacrifices. So, you know, if you're a Republican and you're disappointed, we understand that. But now we all come back together because this is Guam. This is Guam. This is our home. And we're so much better when, when we unite. Carl Gutierrez said it when he won a second term. Joe Adda said it when he won a second term. Felix and Eddie said it when they won their second term. And now Josh is saying, today is a new day in the sense of let's come back together. We, we made our decision in a, in a free democracy mm -hmm. and participated. Whether we're happy with or not, participation rates, we don't care. We've, the people have spoken. And they said, let's keep making Guam a better place. Yeah, and that's, and part, of, that's part of democracy. It's a peaceful transfer of power. In this case, exactly. not a transfer of power, but for it, accepting. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm Except, a Republican. That, that's a different story. Yeah, that was a different it's story. Accepting, he's accepting a different guy. Um, the results of the election, the yeah. will of the yeah, electorate. The we need people. to go to uh, Mangilao, uh, the University of Guam, where Nick's standing by with the latest numbers. Nick, take it away. Hey guys, yeah, the final results commissioner is right now behind me meeting, but the 67 of 67 precincts now in the results, unofficial results, now in with 33,659 total votes counted. That's 55.67% of voter turnout. This general election with the winners being the on Tenorio, 18,381 votes. That's 55.45% of the votes. Camacho at it, falling behind with 14,620 votes, 44.10%. Again, Leon Guerrero, Tenorio, the incumbents, taking the lead here with another four more years with a win of 18,381 votes. For the delegate race, it looks like Senator Jim Moylan will be the next delegate for Guam with 17,075 votes. That's 15.19% of the votes. It's former Speaker Judy Wampad getting 15,427 votes, 47.15%. But again, the winner in that race for the next non-delegate, uh, the next non-voting delegate uh, representing Guam and the U.S. House of Representatives will be uh, Senator James Moylan, again, with 17,075 votes. Over in the Attorney General race, uh, the nonpartisan race, it looks like our next AG will be, and it's a pretty close one still, but with the most votes, Doug Moylan. He got 14,952 votes, or 46.26%, leaving Camacho, the incumbent, getting 14,875 votes, or 46.02%. They had 2,495 votes write-ins, but again, Douglas Moylan getting most majority of the votes here at 14,952. For the senatorial race, the top uh, winners for the legislative race, we have uh, Speaker Therese Terlahi, 21,868 votes, Daryl Chris Barnett, 21,278 votes, and third, Amanda Shelton, 17,707 votes. Fourth, Joe St. Augustine, 17,374 votes. Fifth, Tina Rose Munoz Barnes at 16,689 votes. Uh, 
Sixth is Frank Boz Jr., 15,413 votes. Seventh is Tom Fisher, 14,069 votes. Roy Kanata, newcomer, 13,749 votes. Will Parkinson, 13,563 votes. Chris Duanius, 13,271 votes. Uh, Dwayne Sinicholas, 12,777 votes. Telos Heidegui, 12,370 votes. Sabina Perez at 12,178 votes. Joanne Brown, 12,102 votes. Jesse Lujan, 11,995 votes. Kelly Marsh Titano, 11,620 votes. Marianne Silva Tyron, 11,452 votes. Sarah Thomas Nederdog, 11,428 votes. Jonathan Savars, 11,346 votes. Jose Terlahi, 10,881 votes. Fred Berdalio Jr., 10,866 votes. Vincent Borja, 10,427 votes. Michelle Titano, 10,151 votes. Uh, Shirley Mabini Young, 9,925 votes. Angela Santos, 8,992 votes. Joaquin Leon Guerrero, 8,702. 7,757 for Sandra Sow. Bistro Mandiello, 7,442 votes. David Chrysostomo, 6,888. Uh, and Ian Catling. Uh, rounding it off at 3,645 votes. For the Guam Education Board race, it's Mary Okada, 20,631 votes. Peter Alexis at 17,036. Angel Sablon, 15,285. Ron McNinch, 14,682. Maria Gutierrez, 13,587. Lourdes Benaventi, 13,208. Elaine Ujoa, 10,941. Joseph Santos, 10,185. Renati Camacho rounding it off again at 10,159. For the Consolidated Commission on Utilities, Simon Sanchez, 16,259 votes. Michael Limtiaco, 13,081 votes. Francis Santos, 11,854 votes. Melvin Duenas, 11,728 votes. Nodi Blas, 11,174 votes. And Ricardo Mpinko, 9,657 votes. So again, after those 33,659 votes were counted here today, it looks like the winner for the next four years will be the next governor and lieutenant governor of Guam with these unofficial results again. Leon Guerrero Tenorio, 18,381 votes. Getting the most votes for the delegate race is Senator Jim, Jim Whelan with 17,075 votes. And for the AG race, looks like Former AG Doug Moylan getting the most votes at 14,952 votes. You see behind me here the commissioners uh, meeting briefly to say that these are, of course, the unofficial results. We heard earlier from the GEC Executive Director, Maria Pangolinan, saying that they'll still have to uh, count those provisional ballots and that those ballots that uh, were from off-island as well to include into it but she doesn't expect it to make any drastic change to the numbers and the results that we're seeing here the unofficial results that we saw from these 67 precincts counted thus far but commissioners have now at least the next 10 days or so before they come back and meet again and then they can then certify and make these results official we will bring it back to you in the studio for now i'm nick delgado all right, Nick, thanks so much. Appreciate it. All right, as Nick said, 67 of 67 precincts now reporting. Uh, let's go through the numbers real quick, and then we'll get you guys' reaction. All right, in the gubernatorial race, uh, Lou Leon Guerrero, Josh Tenorio, 18,331, 55.45% of the votes. Uh, Camacho Ada, 14,620, that's 44.10%. Um, so that's... Uh, a win there for uh, the Democrats, uh, four more years for the Lou and Josh team. In the congressional race, uh, Senator Jim Moylan, 17,075 votes, 52.19%. Uh, uh, Speaker Judy Wontbat, 15,427, 47.15% of the vote. Um, unofficially, the next uh, congressional delegate for Guam, Senator James C. Moylan. Uh, all right, uh, next uh, race is the Attorney General of Guam, uh, Douglas Moylan, 14,952, 46.26% of the vote. 
uh, leaving Camacho the incumbent 14,875. A very, very slim margin, 46.02%. Right in totals, um, 2,495. We're assuming that's for attorney uh, Peter Santos. And Ginger points out to me the uh, Doug Moylan beats leaving Camacho by 77 votes as the next uh, elected attorney general of Guam. And we have some other, and I don't know if we have it in graphics, but with the Guam Education Board, we have, um, uh, let me go to senatorial, I'm sorry. Yep. All right, um, so far um, it looks like it's going to be nine to six for the Democrats, so the Democrats pick up an additional seat. Uh, Therese Terlahi and Chris Barnett, Amanda Shelton, Joseph Augustine, and Tina Rose Munya Barnes, the top five that's been consistent all night long, as has been um, the two top Republicans. That would be Frank Bloss Jr. and uh, Tom Fisher. Roy Kinata, uh, a newcomer, and Will Parkinson, a newcomer, both Democrats, slip in at 8 and 9, and Minority Leader Chris Duenas comes in at uh, 10. Next page. Number 11. Uh, Dwayne Sinicholas, another newcomer, another Democrat, 12,777 votes. Uh, Republican incumbent Tello Tidegui, 12,370. Uh, 13th place, Sabina Perez, a Democratic incumbent, 12,178. Republican incumbent Joanne Brown in the 14th slot, 12,102. And rounding out the top 15, the next legislature, I think it's the 37th, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's Jesse Lujan, a former senator and a Republican, 11,995 uh, votes. And there you have it, 9 to 6. Uh, Democratic, uh, re Democrats retain the majority and add uh, one seat. Um, let me go quickly through the, um, let's see, I've got, uh, maybe I don't have it. I thought I had it. We have the... I'll find it somewhere. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, the Guam Education Board, um, Mario, I got, I got it, Jason. Mario Cotta, Peter Alexis Ada, Angel Sablon, and Ron McNinch, Marie Gutierrez, yeah. Lourdes Beneventi, Elena Joa, Joe Santos, Renate Camacho. Um, for the Consolidated Commission on Utilities, Simon Sanchez, <laughs> Mike Limtiaco, Francis Santos, followed by Melvin Duenas, Nonito Blas. Uh, Ricardo Umpinko, and that rounds out the Consolidated Commission on Utilities. Congratulations, Simon. All right, uh, let's go through this real quick. Um, Ginger, let me first of all get your reaction. Um, Lou and Josh are returned for another four years. Uh, pretty um, uh, significant. Um, resounding victory. I mean, victory, 11 yeah. points is resounding. Yeah. Uh, literally, there has only been one race since 1970 that really was higher than 55%. I mean, yep. for all yep. of the governors that have been either first-timers or brought back into office, a resounding win on Guam is 11%. So that, I think, is a mandate that they are going to have to serve for four more years. Uh, I think it is a um, something that they've, they've worked really hard for. And it's interesting because in all of this chaos and in all of this environment in which so many people really did suffer, I mean, it really was tough for people, uh, for the incumbents to be able to have everyone understand that they did all the right things to try and help people and keep Guam moving forward through all of these challenges. I think that was clearly made apparent in the vote and I think people uh, basically said that they approved of the way that the island handled the COVID pandemic in general and they approved how we made it through and they want them to have four more years to carry their program forward. So that's amazing. Um, the thing that really strikes me the most, though, is that the voter turnout is 55.67%. The only voter turnout that was lower than this in the history of Guam's general elections was last election, which was 2020, where the voter turnout was 53%, and that was in the middle of COVID. And a non-gubernatorial. So you yeah. had a situation a where yeah. it was 2020, it was COVID, people were told stay home, stay mm -hmm. away, everybody was really worried, they didn't want to gather in places, so it was already disrupted. And the number, which had kind of held steady at 72, um, mm -hmm. yes, dropped sir. down to 67, and then all of a sudden, because of COVID, dropped to 53. 
So everybody expected it to go back mm -hmm. up into the 60s, mm -hmm. and it didn't. At least, yeah. It yeah. didn't. I don't yeah. know if this is a permanent change in Guam's elections, and I surely hope it's not, but 55.67 is low. And to Ginger's point, in the gubernatorials, the average since 2010 was 72%, and yet we only had 55% today. I did the math. That's 10,000 voters that used to come out to vote in the gubernatorials that didn't come out to vote yeah. this time. And, okay. and so that's a disturbing trend we, you know, we have to think about. Yeah. And, Re and Real quickly, um, Jim Moylan and uh, Judy Wanpat, um, any surprises there? I was surprised. I mean, it, basically the, the trends and all of the, the tracking polls had showed that she would do better. Um, so this is going to be something interesting to sort of do an after action report on to sort of mm -hmm. see, uh, you know, yeah, focus groups wrong. trying to understand from the party perspective um, how that happened, uh, but clearly the voters have spoken, and uh, it looks like we're going to have uh, a split on the party. But you know what's going to be interesting about that is we will now have a Republican who will be mm -hmm. representing Guam in Congress. For the first time in a while. And uh, in the next 24 Since hours. Since Ben Blas. Yeah. Ben Blas. Yeah. Only the second Republican. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And in the next 24 hours, it's looking very much like the House is going to go Republican. Okay. And really quickly, uh, Doug Moylan and, um, and uh, Levin Camacho. I think you both put it well. Crime is a major issue, and crime was focused on the AG's race. And okay, we, we got to do. We're going to cut to a concession speech okay. at Re Republican well, uh, headquarters. Let's go to that right now. Also, Congressman Mike Sinicholas and um, his running mate Sabrina Salas Matinani, the Republican, uh, Democrat, and Independent voters who united uh, with us for a new season. And while the outcome of the election isn't what would one that uh, we had expected or hoped for, uh, the work is not done. Uh, we believe that this movement began, that began with this campaign must continue, and um, we encourage the people of Guam to continue to, to take a stand against corruption, against greed, intimidation, and because we believe that change is, it all begins with us, and we can make the change together. So it's been a, um, a very interesting campaign for us all, and uh, just so very, very happy about um, all the people that we had met the, from the many walks of life. It, um, I'd have to say that I'm at peace um, in, with my life right now and, and whatever the situation and the outcome. So uh, there's a lot of work ahead for this administration and all that they have created. And um, I think all the issues that we saw forthcoming and the challenges that, uh, and the changes that would have to happen now fall on their lap. And uh, I wish them well. And uh, I also pray for the people of Guam because uh, this is what you asked for. I believe it's unfortunate that the many people that didn't come out to vote are also going to be recipients of the leadership that they will be dealing with over the next four years. But it is what it is, and um, I wish the administration all the best. Senator? Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Uh, to my partner, Dominic <laughs> Camacho, First Lady Joanne, to my wife, Annette, my children, the governor's children. Thank you. The people have spoken and we accept their decision. I truly hope that the promises of good things to come will become a reality for our people and our island. As Governor Camacho has said, there are many challenges that are ahead that this administration will be looking forward to. So, you know, everything that they set out and put out in the campaign we look forward to seeing that come to reality. I am grateful for the support Felix and I received. We are grateful for the votes, for the thousands of hours of work our campaign team has put in, and for their belief that the Camacho Ada team was the right team for Guam. Not, vic not being victorious is painful, but the goal of a new season for Guam was well worth the work they put in. Thank you so very much. And regardless of who they voted for, we want to thank all who voted. Thank you for exercising that important right. 
We didn't prevail, but our desire to serve Guam and its people will not be diminished. Private citizens Felix Camacho and Tony Ada will continue to serve Guam in our private capacities. Thank you all so very much for being here. Thank you for the long, long day and the long morning today. And God bless you all, and God bless our island. You know, on behalf of the Republican Party, I really want to thank Governor Felix Camacho and Tony Ada for revitalizing the party, to bring this new young blood into our system, to show unity by bringing, you know, the Frank Ogden family, the Mike St. Nicholas family, all together and united in a common will. This is the way that the Grand Ole Party, the Big Ten Party, the Republican Party is here. And Rifts that have been gone through generations have been healed. The parties united, we're moving forward. You have given us the first victory since 1993 of a congressional member in Jimmy Moylan. That is an amazing and incredible task that could not have happened if it wasn't for your run and your support for everybody and our senators that ran with us. And with that, I would like to give the word to our minority leader to come here and Tell us his thoughts. Chris Duenas. I have to collect myself. You know, Governor Felix Camacho, Senator Tony Anna. First of all, this is my primo. And uh, I've always admired him. I admired his father as our first governor, and I've admired the leadership that Tony Etta has exuded throughout his career as a senator. Honorable people, honorable people. I am so glad that we have a congressman in Jim Moylan. And I know that Felix Camacho and all of us understand the value of those and the depth of that leadership that the family and all of the Republicans have exuded throughout. This morning is tough. And I can tell that most of you know that I'm speaking from an emotional perspective because I believe in these people. But to the people who want, I want to tell you, I believe in you. And this Republican minority will continue to believe in you. And we will continue to challenge anyone who will put themselves above you. We will continue to do the work of the people because that's what we're here for. I'm disappointed, and that's probably why I'm more emotional than anything else, that I believe, and I don't know why, and we'll have to do this over the coming weeks and months and over the year as we go to inauguration, why more people didn't come out? Because we want you to express yourself. We respect you. We don't know why. Whether it was fear, whether it was apathy, whether it was whatever else it is. But you know what? When I look at my primo, Governor Felix Camacho, when I look at this gentleman, Tony Ada who I have been so honored to serve with. And when I look at... All, all right, uh, some very emotional um, mm -hmm. speech there from uh, Minority Leader uh, Chris Duenas and also a very gracious uh, concession mm -hmm. speech yeah. from former Governor um, Felix Camacho and Senator Tony Atta as they concede the race yeah. to uh, Lou and Josh. Yeah. Go, go, and, go, um, Governor Camacho and Tony Atta, I mean, they are patriots. They, they love their island and they accept the decision of the voters. 
and uh, as you said, very, very, very gracious. Very gracious. And, yeah, and you know, today we we take the results, we get some rest. There's a lot of work to do, but then we come back and unite as a community. And and one, I want to. This has been a thoroughly enjoyable way to do election coverage. Uh, and then I, I just want to thank my family and the people of Guam for a chance to serve on the CC yeah. again. It's my and sixth term. And, and I want to thank you, Cy, for, for sitting in for all this and, and the brilliant um, commentary as well as, as Ginger always. Great to, to work with you and we've thank been working you. together for a long time. We have. Um, so that'll pretty much wrap it up for us here on this desk, but we're going to continue um, over there with Jason and Ron and in Saipan with uh, Tomas Monglonia. Uh, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, please continue to watch because we're not done yet, but we are done here at this uh, news desk. And we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back with Jason Salas. Don't go away, anybody. God bless Guam. Viva Good Guam. Night. Viva. Half a day. I'm Gunnery Sergeant Ribbon Tan from Marine Corps Base Camp Blas, personally asking you to join me in supporting the Marine Corps Toys for Tots program by collecting new and unwrapped toys for children this year. The Toys for Tots program, now in its eighth year in the CNMI, has partnered with the Saipan Chamber of Commerce, Lady Diane Tours Foundation, and the associated students of NMC to make this holiday season a time to remember for kids and teens throughout the Commonwealth. You may drop off your new and unwrapped toys today through December 10th at any of the 30 businesses who are cur currently participating in our campaign throughout Saipan, the Lady Diane Tours Foundation, Commonwealth Bureau of Military Affairs, and CNMI Women's Affairs offices. We kindly ask that when purchasing this year, to please remember gifts for older children and young teenagers. On behalf of the United States Marine Corps and the KUAM Care Force, we thank you for coming together and sharing the spirit of the season. The Edward M. Calvo Cancer Foundation presents a special screening of Wakanda Forever on Sunday, November 13th at 2.20 p.m. at the Tango Micronesia Mall Stadium Theaters. Tickets are $25 and includes giveaways, raffle prizes, and a souvenir photo. Doors open at 1.30 p.m. for this much-anticipated sequel to Marvel's Black Panther. All proceeds benefit the Edward M. Calvo Cancer Foundation in their efforts to provide financial assistance to cancer patients in Guam and the CNMI. Purchase tickets at the EMC Cancer Foundation office in Hagatnya on weekdays or email emccancerfoundation at gmail.com to arrange your online purchase. Visit our Facebook page to learn how you can pay special tribute to a loved one during the screening. Wakanda Forever, a benefit for the Edward M. Calvo Cancer Foundation, is presented by Payless Supermarkets, Bank of Guam, Cars Plus Guam, Calvo Enterprises Inc., ITD, Uno Go Guam, Custom Fitness, Global Food Services, Docomo Pacific, EC Developments, IBD Guam, and the KUAM Care Force. And also brought to you by Steel Athletics and today's realty. Call 472-6223 or visit our Facebook and Instagram pages for more information. We are winding down a very long night of coverage, but certainly one that has been thoroughly enjoyable for all of us here at the KUM team. From the broadcast studios in Harmon, going all the way up to the CNMI, Tomas Mangolin, we're going to take you there momentarily for some final thoughts as he continues to cover uh, the goings-on in um, the CNMI. But uh, the elected... The board, me board member elect Ron McNinch there. Um, some, maybe some, fi some final thoughts before we go to the CNMI just about um, what not only your race, uh, but some of the other races have, have been and the, what's transpired. Sure, I was very pleased for the school board. Thank you everyone for your votes. Uh, I was also pleased to see all the neat races in this election. We have five new faces in the legislature. We have mm -hmm. a a returning attorney general who had a hard fought race in that attorney general's race. A third of the, the senators elect are going to be freshmen. Right. Five out of the 15 are, are brand new. Uh, we've got, uh, a, we have uh, certainly a, a Senator Moylan, who's going to be our next congressman. Uh, the governor's going to be back for four more years. She's going to finally be able to have the mandate she probably should have had four years ago, but because of all the turbulence. And now she's got four years to show uh, the island exactly what her vision is and, and without COVID and I think that that's going to uh, benefit everyone. All these neat 
things that went on the, tonight with the elections. It's absolutely wonderful. Mm, so hopefully uh, brighter days are ahead. But um, we are going to take you, um, as we continue our cleanup crew duties here, we're going to take you up to the CNMI where our Tomas Manglonia still continues to be dutifully positioned there reporting on what is going on with the tabulation of votes up for the Commonwealth. So Tomas, what's the latest? Yes, Jason. Well, about six hours ago, we started our show with the questions, what will the voter turnout be and will there be a runoff? And six hours later, we still don't have an answer. If you're at least a resident in the NMI, you've been probably refreshing the page of the CEC and seeing this message uh, saying the election results will be available soon. Please check back later. Uh, I know I've been refreshing this page a thousand times uh, and uh, there hasn't been any results as of yet, but uh, while the show is ending uh, here in the region, uh, the, our coverage still continues online at KUAM CNMI and KUAM.com. And who knows, maybe we'll be interviewing the candidates at breakfast or lunch uh, because uh, we're, still in the, uh, we're still in the stage of um, tabulating uh, early votes, and, or at least that's the last indication of what we've uh, heard from uh, officially from CEC. Uh, in terms of the pace of this. And uh, we actually did ask the uh, executive director, uh, Kayla Igatola, about the pace of this. And her response uh, to those who might be concerned about the space was, the pace rather, is that uh, they want to get it right. And I think at the end of the day, everyone wants to get this count right. And so no matter how long it takes, we'll be dutifully stationed here to bring you those results online, Jason. So uh, we'll be here and uh, we'll give you an update in just a few hours. All right, thanks so much, Tomas. And great, great job, I got to say. And Ron, we have known Tomas. I mean, th this kid, we met him when he was still in college. You know, he went off to Stanford, got, got his graduate degree in journalism. Yeah, I mean, he has the true reporter's passion. And, you know, he's, he's back in his, you know, the place of his birth. He's from Rhoda and everything like that. This is a labor of love to him and everything. But I, I think at the same time, it shows, you know, his commitment when he's out there. Um, it doesn't matter the scale or scope of, you know, your community and everything like that. You know, the process matters. Tomas was a Truman Scholar, one of the top 60 uh, young people in the country yes. his, his year, his junior year in college. And yeah. a lot of people don't know that. Wonderful, wonderful, great guy. Hey, I, I wanted to say one other thing. There were a lot of people who ran who didn't make it tonight. Uh, my heart's out to you. It takes a lot of courage to run for office. And, and I have, you have my full respect and absolute respect. And I encourage everyone who tried tonight who didn't make it, try again. Our community needs you, community service, civic service needs you. Okay, so um, with that, he is Dr. Ron McNinch of the University of Guam. I am Jason Salas, a, just a single cog in this huge machine that we call uh, KUM, bringing to you our election coverage as we do every two years. This is something we really put a lot of thought into that we really take a lot of pride in doing, and we thank each and every one of you. Uh, for those of you who are just waking up after a very long night and trying to check in with the results, we've got them on KUM.com, all of our social media platforms. For those of you who have been with us since the very beginning and have not left, uh, we hope you've enjoyed the journey because we've certainly enjoyed bringing it to you. So for Dr. Ron McNinch, everybody in the back, the entire KUM cast and crew, I'm Jason Salas. Thank you, Sidious Masi, for letting us bring you this wonderful information about a new era of leadership in our community. Have a wonderful Wednesday, everybody. Good morning. Thank Decision 2022 coverage. Special thanks to...